Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our 10 a.m. session of the May 7th, 2019 special meeting of the City Council. I would ask our clerk to now please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Crone is currently absent. Glover? Here. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews is currently absent. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our presentation. So today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and is streaming on our city's website at thecityofsantacruz.com. Lynn Dutton is our technician for today, and I wanna thank you, Lynn, for your work and for being here with us today. So the purpose of today's meeting is to hear from eight of our departments in our city ahead of tomorrow's budget hearing for the 2020 fiscal year. So representatives from each department will provide their presentation and that will be followed by uh, questions from council. Um, after public comment, we'll return to council for more questions and any discussion. So we have eight um, department presentations and are anticipating no longer than an hour per presentation, ideally. So we will start with uh, the following order. We'll begin with finance, and we have Marcus here and a team to kick us off. And then information technology, we'll move to fire department, human resources, the city manager's office, Santa Cruz City Libraries, the police department, and the department of water. I believe around um, 12 o'clock is when we will take our break and have uh, lunch, and then that will um, come after our city manager department presentation, and then we'll return at one o'clock for our library department presentation and so on. Are there any questions from the council at this time? Okay, any additional information from the city manager's office? No, okay. So that said, we'll go ahead and jump right in, and I'll um, go ahead and turn it right over to Marcus. Good morning, hello. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Sure, uh, we'll keep it short and sweet. I'm gonna start, I struggled a little bit, and just to let you know, I want these presentations to be meaningful and remindful. Our department's a nuanced department that lives behind the scenes. Uh, we generically call the finance department, but we do a lot more beyond that. So if, what I'm gonna start with is a story, a story of people. So we've, we're really proud of the culture of our department. We're really proud of the commitment and the people we've stolen from other agencies to come here. And we're most proud of the people we've grown and developed and introduced to local government. So I'm gonna start with a few stories. Do you mind spacing me through the first oh, yeah. one? Kim Wigley. Uh, Kim came to the city from an outside audit firm and was an accountant when I came here in 2012. Shortly thereafter, in 2012, RDAs became a target and ultimately were dissolved. So big, poor, one of the most dynamic parts of our funding source for housing and economic development was gone overnight. <clears throat> Kim was asked, but then volunteered with a smile to go help our economic development department navigate through this space. Uh, something she didn't have a lot of experience in. She's smart, talented, uh, committed, and works really hard. So she went over there and helped economic development for a long time through it. And ultimately, a position came open in economic development and we were proud of her when she took that job. We didn't regret losing her, although we did, but we were proud that she took that job and now we stole her back. So she's an example of somebody that came from the outside, introduced to local government, we saw how dynamic she was, jumped in to help another department and did it with a smile the whole time. That's Kim Wigley. The next one, one more. Ralph Reeder. Uh, Ralph, also an accountant, came from an outside audit firm, but has a different background. Ralph carves with a chainsaw, wooden bears. Ralph was a professional bowler. That's Ralph. Uh, Ralph, similarly to Kim, also volunteered to go to ED to help them, and then volunteered to start our robust TOT audit program. He volunteered with a smile, and was nervous at first, then got into it, and what's great about Ralph is he develops a relationship with all of our auditees. So when somebody gets a letter that they're gonna be audited, their stress levels go off the charts, just like any of you might. But we've purposely not wanted to have an RRS audit feel. Ralph brings human, humanity and community connections to every audit. He's smiling, he's helpful, he's... We have people telling me at the end of the audit, they've enjoyed the audit. I never in my life thought that would be possible, but that's Ralph. Ralph was just compassionate, 
uh, dedicated, works his tail off, and has done a lot of things. Everything we've asked Ralph, he's done. Outside of an accountant's world, he's done. Maya was hard to find a picture. I realize Maya is very dynamic personality, but hides from cameras. So we found this picture, and, and so it's not necessarily professional, but I'm running with it. Uh, Maya was a cashier in our department years ago when I first came here. Just a very committed, thoughtful, big thinker as a cashier. Asked a lot of great questions, showed up on time, but more than that, just provided a really great smile and cared about people coming in. Maya then, we lost her to the library. She worked, worked for the library and then had kids. She's got three daughters, uh, Serena, Sophie, and Charlie, uh, nine, four, and three. So she's an active mom. Came back to us, because she's looking to get back in the rhythm of things. She had her kids. Came back to us as a entry in our revenue department and is now our accounting technician and has stepped in to be a supervisor of our revenue operations. Mm -hmm. She's grown and evolved and is a dynamic, value-add, amazing personality for our team. Those are just three people, examples of amazing people on our team, and you'll hear a few more about our internships. Um, I've probably taken all of my a lot of time, so I'm gonna stop talking and just power through the rest of the slides, because <laughs> now we'll get into some technical stuff. Uh, too much information, but this is what we do. Look at it later. Um, I, I tried to, we were talking about how to make it connected, so you got you know, a Seinfeld reference. Accounting, we do the same thing, so there's a GIF in there, the guy just doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. If you're in accounting, that's what it feels like. Uh, payroll, everything is now, we're bringing employees, there's no time, you can't wait till later. It's now, it's now, it's now, high pressure, high deadlines. A lot of our work is high pressure, high deadlines. We can't move our deadlines in finance. And then there's another one that sometime we'll show you, risk management, we brought on risks a couple years ago, we used contracted out, we brought it into the city. And that's an image of a basketball player passing it to his coach, who then passes it back to the, to the floor to be an active play. That's what risk management is. We help an active situation get better. We're participants and partners in that. So there's a lot there that we do. Um, Cheryl Five, Assistant uh, City Finance Director. Um, first of all, I'd like to go over our awards. Uh, this is our latest and greatest. This is the California Society of Municipal Finance Officers, CSMFO, Innovation 2018, 20, 2018 uh, Innovation Award. And this was selected by this uh, agency, which is, I think there's over 2,500 members involved in that. And one of the reasons that they chose, uh, oh, let me say that they, it was for our action labs that we did. Uh, uh, one of the reasons that they chose the action lab as an innovation that uh, deserved the award was it supported uh, leadership and uh, development of finance staff and it, Develop, it also, out of it came 67, um, 67 workable ideas for a sustainable budget. So that's our, that's our latest and greatest award. We also have uh, Cal uh, the, the CAPR award, which is from the Government Finance Officers Association. And this is for excellence in financial reporting. Um, uh, it usually takes about four to five months to develop our finance, uh, our annual finance report. And uh, we submit it to the Government Finance Officers Association and we receive this award and uh, we're really proud of that. And we also have the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award and that's also from the Government Finance Officers Association. And we received this for the first time about three or four years ago. And uh, it's, there's quite a, large criteria for making this award. Good morning, Tracy Cole, Principal Management Analyst. Um, among these awards, uh, we've also been working towards our fiscal year 2023 fis uh, sustainability plan. Um, everybody has heard about this, everybody has seen this wonderful uh, spreadsheet that we have about it. We've been working on this since the fiscal year 15-16 when we saw deficits in our forecast and we will continue working on this through fiscal year 2023. And then also coming up, um, we have OpenGov. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of OpenGov. It's an uh, online platform um, that we're going to be uh, bringing out in July, hopefully this summer. And it's just a, it's just a transparency tool so that um, anybody can internally or externally get online and see how the city is doing. I'll just speak to this one because I think I want to make up some time. So long story short, when my first experience walking into the finance department was hallways of cabinets and dark. 
it, we walked in the door and it was cabinets, oh, hallway cabinets and dark, just dark, 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 all the windows covered, sort of. We've got rid of about all of our finance cabinets for finance department paper people. We have no paper. Um, we've done a lot of things. It's not just scanning, it's we don't print reports anymore. We save them. We, we went to budget and capital reports and now they're digital. So we just trying to avoid creating paper. Um, so we've done a lot of stuff of, of just making it more streamlined for our own cost, but it's also better all around. So we've tried to embrace going green wherever we can. Drawing tomorrow's uh, government leaders, I don't know, there's so many interviews that I do where uh, someone comes for the interview and they go, I don't know what it is, I've gotten my degree and no one hires me. Um, so one of the things that they lack is the experience. And so the de finance department has started a, a, a few years ago, started a, a internship program and we have quite a few successes. Uh, one, of the, one of the ones I'd like to mention is Ashley Borba. She, um, she is now a senior auditor for Deloitte, the number one CPA firm in the world. But she came to us, worked in our um, TOT revenue, uh, revenue audits, and then she uh, worked in the accounting uh, group and uh, learned a lot of skills so she was able to be hired at the CPA firm. And we hope that she comes back someday to, to our, our department. And currently I'm working with Ramon. Um, he's a teacher um, out in, uh, I believe it's Watsonville. Um, and he is just looking for something different. Um, he wants to serve his community. Um, he's a full-time teacher, but um, he wants to learn more about the government service. And so he's come and he's working with us. He helped put together these wonderful budget documents that you have. Um, he was really instrumental in getting a lot of information. So um, I just wanted to recognize him. We have two employee, two names there, Nick and Joseph, who came to us as interns, and now they're they're still with us. They've taken on permanent roles. We're really proud of that. Not only that we kept them, but we've kept them local. We've kept them around. We've kept them interested in government, so we're excited about that. Um, this is our finance department. How it's broken up into the funds. Uh, how we have a four point four million that's general fund supported. Uh, we also have the risk department, which is liability. And that's uh, an internal service fund, and that's 4.5 billion. We also started an equipment lease program to where uh, we're self uh, leasing the uh, equipment to other departments and other funds. And in the process, we're building a reserve. So if something happens, uh, it's not it doesn't we have the money to uh, full, you know to replace the equipment. Um, Finance uh, is 4% of the uh, 2020 general fund, and uh, it, uh, it's 2020 position in the SEIU and other, there's 16 SEIU members and 18 other members, which would be management and executive. And I just want to mention that, you know, we, we are a small but mighty department. We support all of the general fund and enterprise operations. It's a $262.6 million budget that we help to oversee and uh, I think we do an amazing job at it. So we have a lot of things coming up next, uh, obviously a balanced budget. Um, we eager about moving towards a strategic plan that we can then build performance measures to support the strategic plan. We've got a lot of recruitments. You see a half of our department picture with um, mystery positions we've got to fill. We've got to bring some bodies on board. We're a little shorthanded right now. And as Tracy mentioned, we're uh, also simultaneously doing other things such as trying to go live with a new OpenGov financial transparency platform that the public would have access to and all council members certainly. Uh, we want to get there. We're really, really close. We're the closest we've ever been. So I think I want to finish there. I know we're just about out of time from our presentation, went a little bit long. There was a quiz I wanted to do, maybe another time. <laughs> Left you some post-its. Uh, but we had questions of how many accountants do you think we, we might have? And if you think of all the, the city's parts, if you think of a $50 million business, a water department, how many accountants might they have, a wastewater, parks and rec, how many accountants might those independent businesses have? And if you do the math, we've got four. And if you do the math, you might say, well, there's probably, it should be 20. Um, so we do a lot with just a few, few, few bodies. And in addition to contracting out libraries, we provide admin services to the entire library administrative system. So that ends our presentation, available for questions.
Great, thank you. It's lovely to hear about the folks that are working in your department, about your accomplishments and awards and about the work you did. So thank you very much for your presentation. I'm wondering if there's any member of the community who's interested in addressing the council on our finance department's presentation. Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back for questions and uh, comments. Uh, Councilmember Brown. Thank you for the presentation and overview and a brief amount of time. I do want to get the answers to the quiz, though. If <laughs> you want, should we do it? Like we get prizes, the answers. you know, uh, you'll all get a I prize. <laughs> because I was frantically trying to find the, and I found different 34, 32 total staff. But um, uh, can yeah. we, what's Eden and how? So Eden is our financial system. That's what I thought. Um, so most software systems you think about, you know, three, five, seven years old. That's a lifespan. Twenty. It turns twenty this year. And some of you might have been around when we brought Eden on board in 2003. Um, and that was created in 99. And actually, if you think about it, it was designed with 1997 thinking. So go back in 1997 and think of internets, web, government <laughs> transparency, long range forecasting. None of that was happening. And that's the system we're using. Okay. Question? Comment? Just one. Um, could you give an update on the short term vacation rental? and yeah. permit process and how many permits are left and um, what your thoughts are, what, what feedback you've heard. Well, I, I believe we're close to the number of permits and planning department closely watches that number right now. I don't have that number, but we're close to our total issue. We're still actively finding and identifying. We find a lot of people who are operating without a permit and we're notifying them and ceasing operations. We're collecting back an arrears TOT and interest in payment, transit occupancy tax, interest and in penalties. So we're still very active in that space. Um, I think the abuse is shrinking, but it's probably still out there. Amen. I just want to thank you. You always convey the people and the pride in your department, which I love. I'm impressed. <laughs> and if we could get your hard copy of the. Sure. Mayor Cummings. I said one question. First, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering what are some of the struggles you've been having to fill the positions that are vacant in your department? Struggle is not the right word. It's success. We've had a very successful succession development plan. We've re re reorganized our, we used to be very top heavy and very single track heavy. You know, we, we wanted to give anybody who came into finance, if they want my job, let's give them a path to get there. And so we're having success. People are promoting up, people are learning, people are adapting, people are getting promoted to other agencies. I talk fast, sorry. But it's the success that we're struggling with now is we've got nearly eight or nine vacancies. And I can't remember the exact number right now. For a department our size, that's, you know, we're at 30% of our department, and that's big. That's a big deal with budget negotiations, systems we're trying to bring online, and other things we're doing. So it's a struggle of finding people. We, we noticed years ago, we put out flyers for jobs, and we get very, very few interest because there's a lot of great jobs over the hill, meaning not great jobs. These are great jobs. But the pay <laughs> is attractive to a lot of people. So professional industries, uh, your engineers, your accountants, your technicians, your electricians, those professional places are having a hard time. We're having a hard time competing with the low employment market. Member Myers and then Councilman McGlynn. Um, I was just curious, how, how does your uh, department work with, uh, for example, state legislation? So for example, sales tax yes. recapture. So are you helping to assess those uh, bills mm -hmm. or how, how are we, how are you interacting with that, those kinds of changes that obviously would, would affect our budget? Multiple speaking. layers. A lot of us stay active in other associations. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's a clone, Marcus Pemintil, who's on the League Revenue and Finance Committee. Okay. Uh, there's also a clone who's, who's working on another uh, statewide society on political activism. Finance activism, sorry. 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 <laughs> That's your other job. So th those other clones are active in that space. Uh -huh. um, and we have staff who try to do it. We've got some city man some staff in the city manager's office who's dynamic. Economic development does a good job of alerting us to things. So it's kind of a team approach. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Council member. Hey, Marcus. Great energy as usual. Um, always great to hear your presentations. Uh, just curious with the information that you just shared about the Eden program or the system. Is there a reason why we're running a system that was designed in 1997 to manage our finances? Cost, $3 million is not a priority right now to spend on a system and resources. We don't have the in-house resources to put everything on the shelf for five months because it's a citywide. Mm -hmm. Systems are now integrated with everything else. Mm -hmm. A system will be building permits. A system will be class registration. So to get that on board, it's resources, staff, strategic commitment, and funding. 
So just, um, you were saying that to replace Eden would cost three million and five months of shelving. I, those are just raw guesses. It's been six or seven years since I've been in this market. Ironically, when I first came here, that was the first thing people told me is replace Eden. Uh, and we've, we've looked at how to get value out of Eden and support it with other ways to keep it limping along. And has there been, um, I mean, I, just like you were saying, but they were kind of loose numbers. So has there been a concerted effort to identify alternative financial systems that could be implemented in Santa Cruz and the benefits associated with that? We are active in that space of looking at it. The cities around us have gone to systems. I'm interested in regional approaches. Um, I've got some ideas that we might be able to share costs and regionally have a single system instead of everybody buying the same system in different agencies. So well, I've got some ideas. I'd love to learn more about that. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, and um, have a wonderful day. Thanks for the presentation. So at this time, we'll go ahead and invite up our Information uh, Technology Department presentation, and we have Laura Schmidt, who will be presenting for us. Thank you. Uh, unexpected, I think, is the word for this. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm Laura Schmidt, the IT director for the city, and um, it'll take more than five months to implement a replacement for Eden. <laughs> You're welcome. I just didn't want that number of months to stick in your head <laughs> as we move forward in the next few years. So I will be giving you an overview of our information technology <coughs> department. I'll give you um, some idea of what we do as a, a department over the last two to three years, a, a few of our banner accomplishments, and then what's next for next fiscal year. So our department, we are a department of 20 full-time equivalents and we are divided into four divisions. And two of our resources are funded by the Wastewater Treatment Facility Enterprise Fund and the Water Treatment Enterprise Fund. So what do we do in technology, the value that we deliver? If you start from the, what is this, right side of this chart on the bottom yellow part, when you plug in your device or you, your computer is plugged into the network and you turn it on, you expect it to hook up to files. You expect to be able to enter your time card in Kronos. When you pick up the phone, you expect a dial tone. So this is the electricity of IT. You plug something in and you expect it to work and there are resources behind the scenes. So that is our infrastructure services group. And then you have all of these devices that are consuming that infrastructure. And these devices could be your smartphone, it could be your desktop, your laptop, your phone, all of those things. These are productivity enhancing devices that our main target audience there is the employees. So we want our employees to be productive using technology on a day in and day, day out basis. So that's our client services and systems administration. And then those employees use the devices to hook up to applications or systems. Marcus talked about Eden, our financial and human resources system. So whenever you are using an application, either delivering a service to another department in the city or delivering services directly to our community, those applications are supported by our process and application solutions group. And then overall behind the scenes, you expect us to have some sort of strategic plan and a roadmap for information technology, how it benefits the city and the community as well as our employee departments being able to deliver services out to our community. That and the overhead of hiring personnel in our budget is in our strategic and administrative services group. So those are our four divisions. So those four divisions manage and administer a lot of stuff. That could be voice over internet protocol phones, all the conference rooms across the city we manage, 600 plus PCs, a bunch of laptops, other mobile devices. We manage thousands of licenses, whether that's for a large system like our enterprise resource planning system that has finance, human resources, purchasing and payroll on it, 
are the Microsoft license that sits on your desktop. We manage those licenses. We manage about almost 100 applications across the city, and those could be specific to a department or shared across the city. We manage uh, almost 100 switches and routers in our network data closets across the city, about 90 uninterruptible power supplies. So if the Enter, uh, if pg and &E goes down here, our data center has to stay up. So we have a giant UPS in the basement. We have smaller ones of those scattered throughout the city. We also have all these servers and they store data and they store applications. And um, virtual servers are always an interesting concept. So to make the virtual server a little bit more real, Part of our servers on, in the virtual environment are dedicated to storing files. So right now, we, just in files, not email, just in public when you connect to your P drive and you have a file there, we have about nine terabytes of data stored on file shares in our virtual environment. Finance takes up 75% of those. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, if you look at that nine terabytes of data, if you stack and were to print out two-sided pieces of paper, that would stack would be 90 miles high. So you can travel on our file shares from here to San Rafael, here to Tres de Los Banos. And it's equivalent to about 4,500 hours of movies, and that's just the file shares in our virtual environment. Let's talk a little bit about applications and make them real. So your utility bill comes out of a system that the IT department supports and administers. A parking violation comes out of our AIMS ticketing system. If you have a permit or a business license need, that goes into our land management system. And then if you buy a Bill Mayer ticket out of the Civic, that comes out of a ticketing system that we support with Parks and Rec. So just trying to give you a little bit more of a, of a true flavor of what this mysterious technology stuff it is that our department does. Let's talk about some of our accomplishments over the last couple of years. In 2016, we brought the help desk back. Before, believe it or not, you, there was not a centralized phone number for you to call to get help. So all of those devices that we support and anything that you needed with the system, you kind of like went and hunted down technology people to do that. So we reopened the help desk in 2016 and we average about 6,000 to 7,000 tickets a year. So over the years, it has increased. The small number on the other side, that is our average days to close. So a little bit under 2.7 days to close. And then out of those six to 7,000 tickets, we're servicing anywhere from mid 500 to 600 unique customers in those tickets any given fiscal year. Another thing that we do is anytime an employee starts or a temporary lifeguard or an intern, or somebody leaves, whether it's a temporary person or a permanent person retires, or somebody needs to move desks, that is all represented in what we do on a day in, day out basis. So this is more of our operational stuff. So it's, um, you can see over a given fiscal year that we do several hundred of these types of moods, ads, and changes. In 2017, we redesigned the internet and we went from a fairly unmodern and a city departmental driven view of our work here at the city out to the public. And we went in through a Google's analytic process and we highlighted the most hit items, put them in the forefront of our website and redesigned it according to how somebody in the public might try to navigate the website. And we did that with actual surveys and we actually had some people, um, we analyzed behavior of, of them trying to find things on our website. We have an ongoing security program. We have a past end of life system in multiple places throughout the city. And this is a laundry list of things that we've either changed and upgraded and replaced the aging out of, out of date infrastructure or we might be adding new things. This is an example of new infrastructure that we put by the SoCal front garage to give you an idea of the clarity of the system that we've put in place. So these are just some quick shots of the camera views around the garage and Fraser Lewis Lane.
we launched a community request for service portal. So scattered throughout our website, we had 16 to 17 different ways to go about requesting service from the city. We went after the most used locations within the website and consolidated them into this community rest for, re request for service portal. And the evolution of this is ongoing. If your request doesn't fit into any one of these, you can find the more specific one located within our subpages, or you can enter in a general request, and then we will route that. And this system integrates with three of our existing systems. So this integrates with a graffiti vendor, it integrates with a work order system, and it also integrates with our land management system. So that's pretty good. And those actually start within those systems, the internal processes to create something in workflow. Where, and so that is also helping on the efficiency on the city staff side of being able to get these items and move them through the process to resolution. Every year we do PC replacements. So this will give you an idea of the number of replacements we do. PC replacements are not, we don't do them because we want to do them, we do them because we have to do them. So we are looking at the age of the PC as well as the age of the software and the operating system that is on the device. So right now, we have a mix of Windows 10 and Windows 7 out there. Windows 7 is end of life -ing. We need to replace all of those by the date that Microsoft will no longer support that operating system. So that'll give you an idea of what drives the PC replacement numbers. Uh, water, we piloted with about 500 customers, a water smart application where you can go, go into that. And the application will give you ideas of, you can save $239 a year if you were to look at planting these water saving plants. So it's very direct to the consumer and trying to relate to them that if you do this, you can save this. Any given month in a, in a year, our email filtering program and our network and systems administrator, they work really hard to make sure that what comes into the city is safe to open. Some stuff still gets through, and so for those of you that forward those to the help desk for us to look at, I really appreciate that. And know that only about 25 to 30% of our incoming email is valid at any given point. And it's our filtering system that is catching those other ones and um, trying to stop the phishing attempts and the viruses and the hackers from getting into our network. What's next? So our fiscal year 20 budget, very similar to some other departments that you've seen, we're 60% on the personnel side and 40% in service and supplies and others. And the service and supplies and, and others, things, think of things like hardware maintenance, software maintenance, professional services, um, computer equipment, non-capital. Those are the types of things that are housed in that 40% of our budget. How do we decide in IT what we're going to work on in any given fiscal year? Every two years we update a strategic plan, which I haven't included in this because of the limited time frame we've got, but just know behind the scenes that we do make a market conscious effort of how we make decisions and recommendations of what we work on and what we replace in any given fiscal year. So we have sustainability measures behind the scenes where we look at the age of equipment, whether that's hardware, or the age and viability of software. And we are going after those areas on any given fiscal year based upon a red, yellow, green. Red means past end of life. Yellow, it's approaching end of life. Green means replaced and new. And I haven't brought those because they're quite busy, but we, we do go about that. So we know that Eden is a red system, but it's working. We're able to operate with it, and we have other systems that are end of life that the vendor's no longer going to support, but Tyler Technologies is supporting Eden for now. So it's a balancing act on any given fiscal year how we go about approaching applications and the hardware stuff on the infrastructure side. We also work very closely with our departments. So every two to three months, somebody in information technology will meet in a relationship building information gathering mode with the departments. So we have a program where project managers and IT managers are assigned to a given department and they meet with them every two to three months and see how things are going. And they, that conversation runs a gamut of production support issues, enhancements and programs and projects that are bigger. 
We also do an annual information gathering from all the departments and we have an IT steering committee here at the city and we meet with them every two months as well. Fiscal year 20, this is just an example of some of the projects that we have in the pipeline. I'm not gonna go over the long list because we're, um, I've got some limited time with you. If you have any questions, just let me know. And then when I think of the future items beyond fiscal year 20, these are some of the things that I worry about on um, when I look into the future. So we have an ongoing security program pro pro project. We have an ongoing parking garage pro project. We're in a constant state of being compliant with the payment card industry standards. So that's us taking credit cards here at the city and um, our land management system needs upgrading and possible replacement. And there's a lot of revenue going through that system, so it's quite important. And our agenda and document management system, our existing software was acquired, and that product that was acquired is no longer be going to be supported by the vendor because they have a competitive product. So those are one of those things when we look at the red, green, yellow, it's a red one, and it, the timeline is not something that we necessarily set versus the vendor. Office 365, um, you may use Office 365 at home. We currently are managing our Microsoft licensing individually because it is much more financially sustainable for us, but at some point we will need to go up to Microsoft's cloud. We will also need to do an email upgrade and possibly move that to the cloud. Um, the departments are clamoring for a collaboration tool. So whether that is a Microsoft, whatever product, think of being able to easily share documents with one another and you don't have to be inside of our network walls because our shared drives are great to share with one another, but the moment you have an external party present, then that's difficult. So the, the departments want something, not just for internal collaboration, but external collaboration, and they also want something that's more, instead of being operationally department focused, program and project focused. So a project comes up, boom, and we can put something out there related to the project, take it down, move on. Enterprise resource planning, application replacement, that's Eden. So that's a big ticket item and it's just going to be a citywide project because hooked up to Eden is time cards. Every employee touches a time card as well as it's got the finance accounting systems, the human resources systems, and then all of our purchasing and um, our utility billing system is actually in Eden as well. Data analytics is a huge thing. We have all of these transactional systems with all of this great information. How do we get that information into a place to help business decision support and being able to actually make that information powerful and used for operational decisions and strategic planning? And then of course, cybersecurity is a huge thing. We do not wanna be in the papers. We want to be able to keep our city resources and our data safe. And we're in a constant battle of keeping up with the evolution of technology out there and how we safeguard our, our city's technology assets. What questions do you have? <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Welcome. Maybe before we do that, we'll go ahead and see if there's any members of the public who'd like to address the council. Okay, and I don't think so. So we'll go ahead and return back for questions. And I wanna thank you for the brief presentation. I know you do and your team does a lot for our city. Um, I also know that city manager uh, Martin Bernal uh, sent out an email to the council for us to set up individual times to reach out to directly. So I encourage those who want to dive deeper um, to do so, because uh, I think you touched on a lot of really great big topics. I'll go ahead and see if there's any questions amongst the council. Councilmember Brown, Matthews. Crone, Myers, and then Glover, I think. I wanna say thank you for the presentation and all of the work you do. I have to say um, a big shout out to your client services uh, staff. They are amazing, I, so competent, uh, and, and so quick to turn around requests. I mean, even when there isn't somebody right there at the desk and they see me, somebody sees me panicking and the wandering about <laughs> in your section of, of the offices, somebody helps and it's amazing. I mean, I've never had such an experience where I, if I have an IT issue, it gets resolved pretty close to almost immediately. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, can't say enough about it. Uh, and then the one question I had was related to, um, you know, requests for 
um, that through, through the portal and looking at it's, it looks like your goal one of the goals is um, new um, categories new service types of com for community requests for service mm -hmm. portal just wondering how you decide what those are is it you track and see what their big um, requests are in the other category emerging mm -hmm. so we have um, a, a, an Excel spreadsheet of the existing 16 um, half of those were converted to the community portal already so we have uh, the next ones in the queue as far as what the demand signal from the the user community the community was as far as they're hitting those sub pages so those are in the queue and then also what we're doing is on the general request side what is in there? So we are able to extract the information out of the portal and then crunch the information of what are the high ticket items that are showing up over and over again in that general request bucket. So those will become the foundation for the next phase. You're welcome. And thank you about the compliments to the team. Customer service it has been a huge focus of us. So I appreciate that and I'm sure they do too. Next, you don't want the compliments. <laughs> um, <clears throat> for the fiscal year 20 goals, um, are those represented in the capital improvements and other, I mean, those are already integrated in the details? They're, the they're an amalgamation. Some of them are operational and some of them are capital project oriented and some of them even like the, po the um, parking one that's in uh, the public works parking budget. So it's, Oh, it's these multiple sources to be in yes. the budget. And yep. then on moving over to future, are these things that are not in the coming year budget, but that are um, imminent? The security program, parking garages, um, and agenda and document management are in the budget. Land management is partially funded. And then the other ones are not funded. So around um, Office 365 and land management is only partially funded and Office 365 down is not funded. And is land management, is that uh, basically planning, permitting and all that stuff? Because it's planning, permitting, inspections, business licensing and all of that. I know in their department yeah. they yeah. talk about that. It, it, it is mostly planning and community development, but um, for instance, Parks and Rec uses that application for uh, tree permits. Um, the fire department uses it for some of their permits. So it is really a citywide application, but the majority of the use is from planning and community development. Council for Crew. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, three questions. Um, what I, I didn't see that when you said the items that people um, request most, mm -hmm. what, what were those 10? Did you, did, you ha did you have a list? Did I miss it? The one thing Prezi is hard to do is location on the slide. <laughs> So this is bike, it's hard to read, bike and pedestrian hazard, encampment, graffiti, needle or syringe, property code violation, sewer spill or backup, and then traffic concern, and then the bucket of anything else that doesn't fit there goes into the general request. But so, so this list was developed because of uh, the traffic to the site that were, was interested in these issues. Correct. Oh, thank yep. you. Yep, we did analytics to the sub pages and which ones were the heaviest hitters. And say somebody comes in and, and does a credit card for $100, how much does a credit card company get for that? Uh, I honestly don't know. 3%. <coughs> Thank you, Marcus. And, and so I assume also when you talk about outside uh, folks being able to work with one another on a similar document, the Google Doc thing just isn't secure. It's that, that, that would, but that's the kind of thing we're looking for if it was secure. If we were to go with Google, we would um, obviously do a competitive process as far as pricing, and we would have to go with a Google that is an enterprise version, not a consumer version, because um, when people use the consumer version of any of these given applications for city work, then we don't have any way to administer that or to have any ability to help support it because 
it's a consumer one by one individual license at that point. Is that cost prohibitive right now or have we looked into that? or that's We have looked into it and um, we did not see a market price difference between the major players. They've kind of converged on being... Monopolies? Um, equally pricey. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you Mayor. <laughs> Councilmember Myers and then Council. Uh, I, I, you mentioned that the land management um, system was only partially um, funded in this year's budget. Mm -hmm. what, what, what is the missing amount on that system? If we actually went out for a mini art request for proposal process mm -hmm. on that, and um, the numbers that we got back, back were substantially higher than what we had anticipated. Mm -hmm. So we are in the process of analyzing those numbers and um, diving a little bit deeper into that with the vendors at some point, but we're also mindful of what's going to be happening given the fiscal situation that we're in this fiscal year. So we're kind of doing a wait and see approach at this point of being able to analyze the actual pricing that came back from the vendor, which on a baseline level was higher than what we anticipated, as well as what we're going to have to contribute as far as helping the general fund situation. So we're kind of doing a tightrope balancing act and, and a wait and see as far as the rest of the month of May and how the budget process goes. Okay. and. Um, this, the, the amount that's partially funded, will that give you um, functional capacity for the for certain parts of, this, of the management system? We're, we're actively working with the departments that use the land management system, and we're trying to creatively slice and dice whether or not we can stay on the existing system with certain upgrades, whether or not we can use the rapid application development tool that this um, community request for service portal sits on mm -hmm. to do some creative application development to help with all of the various functional needs that would be most of, of a direct to consumer improvement on our processes and trying to focus on those and can we do something in in-house to be able to help this on this rapid application development platform. So we're, we're looking into all of those aspects right now. Thank you. You're and welcome. I just had one more question, quick question on the data, uh, the police department uh, crime analytics. Mm -hmm. And is that something that is internally developed or is that another product that is? It is, um, that's a, a great question and I didn't touch on it. Um, when it comes to the IT department, you'll notice that we only have two programmer analysts out mm -hmm. of the 20 full-time equivalents. So with that number, we cannot develop a lot of in-house applications. We are probably 90 plus percent vended in the city and vended means we rely upon upon the development of other companies. So we buy commercially off the shelf ready packages and then we support them, configure them to the city needs and then help upgrade them if they're on premise, help work with the vendor if they're in the vendor's cloud. So the crime analytics solution that we would be looking at for police department is a vended application. It's something that we would purchase. Okay, great. But that's not funded for this no. coming year? That's in it, it. It is in the fiscal oh, year right. 20 okay. budget. Yes. yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, and just to add that uh, related to that is uh, one of the things that's not uh, in the city's IT system, but is related is the records management system, mm -hmm. which uh, is operated out of the 911 center. Um, although they do, they do work closely with uh, the IT department in terms of having integration, so that is uh, going to be uh, replaced uh, and. Uh, with a new system, uh, the current system is, there's two systems, one that just includes the cities and a separate one for the county. Uh, neither cities or the county are happy with the current systems that they have, so we've gone out and done an RFP to replace the systems with uh, a system that uh, works for everyone, uh, so it's more cost effective, it's more integrated, uh, and it actually is more functional because the system we currently have has a lot of, uh, challenges with respect to collecting data, doing data analysis and that sort of thing. This system will help with that, but the new records management system will also be a great improvement. Uh, so that is anticipated to uh, be awarded uh, later uh, this fiscal year and uh, we'll, we'll have to budget for our proportionate share on that system. It's about a two to $3 million system, again, shared by the cities and the county with respect to uh, paying for that system over a, a period of time. 
And I just want to add my thanks to your department, um, just all the work you guys do, especially some of the new things that I think our community is uh, great, uh, greatly appreciative of the, the, the way to just get rapid response and things like that. So thanks for all your work. You're welcome. Thank you. Councilmember Glover, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I love technology, so I love your department. It's <laughs> wonderful. And um, just as Councilmember Brown said, uh, a lot of the times where I've needed assistance with my items or IT support. They're right there, they're super friendly and they uh, get the job done. So great, great job there. Um, I was interested by this community request service portal. Um, one of the questions that I had originally of how do these categories get chosen was answered from Councilmember Crone's question. So that's really interesting. Is there um, a way to look at the ratings of the other issues that came up or the other sub pages that have been going on and then where would we be able to find a list of the general requests? So we can um, do a report out of the system for the general requests and um, be able to basically dump the database for that um, for sure. And then the, the other items, we have those in a spreadsheet as far as what the historical trends were for those sub pages. Mm -hmm. And do you find, because um, I noticed that a lot of these have to do with like infrastructure things here and there, are there, um, is it a place where people report other things outside of infrastructure? I guess I would get that through the general request report. So um, that's something, well, I'll just be in touch. That, that, that would probably show up in the general request. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. I just one quick question about the cost associated with the addition of new applications. I was just wondering if you can um, speak to that. Are you talking holistically, like any application or a, a service type within this portal? Mainly around the service type within this portal. Yeah. So this platform is something called a rapid application development platform and that Learning that tool enables our developers to be able to amend it and change it, and then also build new ones. So adding a request type to this existing portal would be done by our two programmer analysts. If we were to need to want to create a brand new application on this platform, if it was something that was similar to this community request for service functionality, they might be able to do it on their own, but if it had a lot of complex new functionality we were trying to build, we might need consulting help from the, the company to be able to learn new ways of developing on it. But the baseline support of this happens now with our existing programmer analysts, and that's one of the reasons why we chose this platform. It's relatively easy to learn. The, learn the, the learning curve is pretty quick as far as turnaround time between learning it and being able to deliver value and with the programming for it. It's, it's simple enough that I could probably learn something and they're back at their desk going, no! <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Laura. Really quickly, um, in terms of, is, it, this is, is this on an app as well? It's an app, so you, and so you're marketing it out to the community, if I remember correctly from yep. the previous presentation, it, okay. You can do it at, as a web link uh -huh. on our uh, www site, and then this is a screenshot, but you can click on the website to download it from the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store, so it Great. can be both. Those that may be interested in getting the app. Okay, thank you very much You're for the welcome. presentation. Our team. Oh, we have I'll just say I use this thing all the time. It's great. Sofa on sidewalk. Yeah. You yeah. know, damaged utility box. Just whatever. Yeah. So the report. That's the general request. Is anything else that needs attention? It's great. Right. Thank you. Service. Thank you. Okay. So we'll go ahead and uh, move right along to our next presentation, which is our fire department presentation. Get 
Thank you. Are you ready? <laughs> All right. Here's missing, but hello, City Council. Uh, Jason Heideck, fire, uh, fire Department Fire Chief. I've got Pat Gallagher here as uh, Division Chief of Operations and Paul Horvat, our OES manager. Uh, we'll be uh, taking uh, some turns presenting some of the information uh, within the packet. Um, So um, just framing some of the things that uh, the fire department does, you know, we're primarily a response-based agency. Um, and so how we engage in some of the city functions uh, is kind of dependent on the situation. Uh, but within the community engagement, our CERT program, which is our com community emergency response team uh, training that we do, our o ROP program that we do with the high schools, City Hall to U, our infrastructure's EOC, which supports uh, disaster management. And Paul will be talking about that in a little bit as far as uh, the FEMA reimbursement. Our economic vitality, uh, marine safety and fire prevention, uh, specifically within there, uh, the boardwalk uh, is a huge economic driver because of tourism, which is what the economic vitality, one of the goals of that. And there, when they've done surveys that uh, public safety is one of their uh, first and foremost uh, concerns. Fire prevention, dealing with new industries coming into the city, uh, specifically cannabis. Uh, that has been a huge lift. Um, you know, it's a new process and um, working with them to develop standards uh, that they can adhere to so that they can function. Uh, financial stability, new revenue sources, whether that's um, from contracts that we've uh, signed with uh, outside agencies to funding mechanisms uh, to get reimbursement for some of our responses uh, within the state. The community, obviously, uh, disaster preparedness. And then something this year that we've implemented and been working on for a number of years is the U URVI, which is the Unified Response to Violent Incidents. So think of um, terrorist events, uh, active shooter events, um, and having a coordinated approach between law enforcement and the fire department to a Las Vegas incident. Uh, we recently deployed in the entire county, so it's not just us, uh, ballistic helmets invest in all fire engines so that we uh, can provide medical care in areas that previously we did not provide medical care. Um, organizational health, uh, internally we have our pillars that we've been working on and our people are our primary product. They are who do the work. And so supporting them and their ability to do that work is also uh, for the next step. When they get hired as a firefighter, being an engineer, being a captain, and providing that, uh, that support internally, as well as our uh, peer and uh, mental health uh, outreach, uh, keeping them healthy, and also recognizing that some of the things they're exposed to um, has, a, has a cost. And so providing that peer counseling team that we've developed internally, as well as um, having that um, ability to reach outside for more professional care. And then environment and resources, EOC activation and FEMA reimbursement. Um, two years ago during 2017, we had significant rains. We had significant impacts to the city that had uh, you know, road closures. And uh, one of the biggest things that uh, we dealt with was our water supply. Uh, at one point, we had a three-day water supply for the city. And so working uh, with the water department, working with public works, working with FEMA, to identify what those costs are, what need, needs to happen so that we can uh, sustain uh, those resources uh, here in the city. So our budget for fiscal year 2020 um, is nearly 19 million, or a little over $19 million of expenditures uh, across all of our different divisions between administration, operations, prevention, marine safety, and OES. Um, Couple that with what our fiscal year revenue is going to be, which is over $4 million. Uh, and that is a combination of our UCSC service contract, um, our state OES reimbursement, our local service contracts, fee schedule, and Capitola lifeguard contract. And so the UCSC contract, I think, is a pretty straightforward um, equation as far as, you know, we contract for services and uh, we have a fire station up there. Our state OES reimbursement, um, that would be for when we respond out of the county to statewide incidents. So the campfire in paradise, um, you know, or the Thomas fire in Ventura. And that's a, that's a floating number. We get paid a, um, 
our personnel costs are reimbursed completely. And then there's also an administrative fee and a vehicle uh, uh, fee that, we ch uh, that is reimbursed by the state. And so all of our costs associated with that are reimbursed, um, and that's a revenue stream uh, for the services that we pr uh, provide. Local service contracts include response into Paradise Park with CAL FIRE. Um, it's in their jurisdiction. Um, it's outside of city limits, but because we're the closest resource, um, we contract for uh, emergency response for the medical calls, for the initial response for fires. Um, and then our fee schedule that was adopted for um, permits and for plan review. Um, and then the Capitola lifeguard contract, I believe we're going into our eighth year with them, um, and that's uh, nearly $100,000 a year. So if you subtract that out, our fiscal net expenditures um, is a little over $14 million for everything uh, when you take into account the revenue that we're, we're generating, which is unusual for a fire department. We, uh, fire departments generally are not uh, revenue genera generators in the sense that we don't sell a product. Um, we provide a service. So within our budget, um, this just kind of gives you a, a slice of uh, what we have. Um, our administration, our operations, prevention, more marine safety, OES, and then mutual aid reimbursement. These are all on the expenditure side um, of uh, how these are broken up. And as you can see, the line share of what we uh, spend our, our money on and our resources on is within operations. Uh, that is the 911 call when someone calls for help that we have the right set of resources that arrives in a timely manner with the right equipment and the right people to take care of that problem. Um, administration is there to support those functions and prevention is um, on kind of the other side of what the fire department does as far as dealing with building codes and uh, fire investigation. Mutual aid reimbursement, that's a new uh, change to our budget. Um, previously, we were capturing all of those OES reimbursements and strike team deployments within operations, and it, it, it kind of muddied it a little bit. So we're trying to make it very clear where that money is being spent, where it's being reimbursed, so that we can divide it out between what we're spending our money on here in the city for what we're responsible for, for uh, and then recognizing that we're part of a larger mutual aid system within uh, the state of California, and we receive that aid when needed, and we provide it uh, when we can. Um, and then. You don't have to go back, but um, overall, uh, if you take our net expenditures and our gross, um, we are about 16.6% 16 .6 of the overall general fund budget as far as our expenditures. So get, getting into the services that we provide um, within operations, our primary function is we're a fire department. Uh, and so that is structural uh, firefighting as well as wildland firefighting. We also are a ALS and a BLS uh, provider, that's advanced life support and basic life support. And then we also have a tactical medic program where we have uh, firefighters who are cross-trained and they're embedded within uh, the police department for when they have operations to provide care. That is their only job. We also do a large number of technical rescues, uh, confined space for the entire county, technical rope rescue, vehicle extrication, water rescue, hazardous materials. Um, those are all um, subsets of operations that we provide uh, both here in the city and in the county. Our Marine Safety Division is our lifeguard services and our marine rescue uh, services. And that is primarily for the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and then we also contract with the city of Capitola. Our Prevention Division, uh, Inspection and Investigation and Public a Education is part of our community uh, risk reduction uh, program. And then our allied agencies that we work with on a regular basis, um, and that would be our regional fire academy that's ongoing right now. That's all the departments in the county. Uh, we have an academy that's ongoing, and so we share resources for that. And at the end, at the end of the academy, we all get a uh, firefighter uh, who's um, beginning their career. Statewide OES response, and then CAL FIRE mutual aid agreements. So. Within the fire service, no one agency in this county can handle um, a large, significant incident with the resources that you have on standby. We are designed for what we can expect on a day in and day out basis with the potential for a little bit of surge. Um, and so we have mutual aid agreements with all of our partners. Um, as part of that, the statewide OES response is if we have a significant incident here, we can go through our regional um, operations center and um, request resources to come. They do the same for us, and again, that's uh, part of the uh, statewide reimbursement uh, process. And then locally, CAL FIRE, um, 
we have mutual aid agreements for um, wildland. They have access to a lot of resources that as a city, it just doesn't make sense for us to have that capacity every single day of the year um, because that's not our primary function. But having hand crews, having bulldozers, having helicopters, having aircraft, and having access to those when needed, um, that's part of our mutual aid agreement. And it goes back and forth. We respond into the areas that we're much closer than than they are. And in return, we, we get resources when needed. Uh, when we have a fire in De La Viega and we need hand crews for two days to do the overhaul. Uh, when we have uh, a fire in Poganep and we need fixed wing aircraft to drop retardant. We don't have those, those, those kind of uh, resources, but we have access to those resources because of uh, our mutual aid agreements. So also within our services um, is the offices of emergency services. And that's a principal management analyst. That's uh, Paul Horvat, he's the manager for that. We manage our EOC, which is located in NETCOM and also has been the primary liaison for uh, FEMA, which is a very complicated process um, and they change the rules on us on an ongoing basis. Um, and that is millions of dollars of reimbursement with a lot of paperwork and support and coordination between our department as far as what gets uh, submitted and then making sure that the work has actually been done. So the road going to, uh, up to, uh, to De La Viega washed out. Uh, that's a primary artery uh, to that neighborhood. It's a primary artery to where our 911 center is located. Um, so working with uh, the engineers, working uh, with the different project managers to do that. Also, he's the Fire Safe Council president, which uh, in the last couple of years has taken on a much larger role in California with what we've had with wildland incidents, uh, both here in the city, but also within the state. Um, and then our uh, Emergency Management Council city representative does training for the EOC and then grant coordination for vegetation management and as well as fire department um, equipment and EOC equipment. We had a shush gap uh, grant funding that is funding uh, some equipment for the EOC. It's funding um, vehicle and uh, other equipment for the fire department. So kind of managing that whole process and being the liaison between our city and the county and our city and the federal government, um, a lot of different moving parts in there. So next up, I'm gonna call our division chief, Pat Gallagher. He's going to get a little bit more in depth into some of the operational components of what we do for the fire department. And um, yeah. Morning council, Pat Gallagher, division chief, operations. And when we talk about operations, the meat and potato is really running on the calls. That's what, that's what the majority of the work we do is. And we look at 2018, it was certainly a very busy year for the Santa Cruz Fire Department. We saw about a 6% increase in our call volume, which is about 9,000 calls. And when we talk about what a call is, there's a big disparity. Um, it really, 9,000 is just a number, but when we look at one particular incident, it could be one single crew leaving a station and go out and helping somebody on a medical call with a turnaround time of say 30 minutes. Whereas the number two call could be a multi-day multi -day incident, including multi-jurisdictions over a period of three or four days. So a call is not necessarily equitable as far as the, the staffing and the resources needed. Um, so when we look at calls, that's kind of what we're looking at. The majority of our calls are medical um, related. About 75% of our calls are medical emergencies and that's why we provide the ALS service in our city so that we can have the highest available quick response medical system possible to our citizens. We, we do run a lot of other types of calls. For instance, we, we average about 40 structure fires a year and that's not necessarily a response to a structure fire, but that's actually a house or a building that is actually on fire. So three or four of those a month. In the last year, we had two multi-alarm fires in the city. One was at a, um, a hotel and the other was a car dealership. And some of the upticks we've seen as far as operations and the types of calls we're going are um, primarily in the vegetation type fires. Last year, we saw over 70 type, types of vegetation fires in the city. Of those, it included the Poganet fire and the Rincon fire, which were multi-jurisdictional, multi-agency responses although Santa Cruz fire did provide all the initial attack and the incident command structure for both of those fires for the first day and a half. Um, some of the other calls that we're seeing a real uptick in in the past few years is rescues. And we've transitioned, although we are the fire department, our fire numbers over time have gradually gone down due to fire prevention and, and better code enforcement through building but our rescue service has gone up drastically. And we talk about rescue, we're looking at water rescues, cliff rescues, vehicle rescues, and, and any type of uh, rescue where there's some technical side attached to a medical incident. So we've seen quite a few of those. 
And that's where we put a lot of our effort into training is, is trying to increase our capability as far as technical rescues go. Next slide, please. So our operations is uh, really, it's a streamlined operation that we run in the city here. Um, with the exception of when we incorporated UCSC firefighters into our fire department, we haven't seen an increase in daily staffing in, our, in the city in 25 years. So it's, we're getting a lot of bang for a buck for our fire department. We generally, um, we, we, can, we can run the majority of our calls, but we depend on our local jurisdictions daily to assist us on larger type incidents, or oftentimes we just get busy in general on multiple incidents and they'll come in and, and assist. So that goes back and forth, it's reciprocal between the jurisdictions, but overall, the city tends to use more, use more mutual aid than the surrounding agencies. Um, when you look at the slide up there, uh, operationally, we have about 55 personnel assigned to operations. Most of that is your firefighters, the, the folks that are in the fire stations responding to the calls with a small amount of overhead to support that. Each day, there's a minimum of 16 firefighters on duty within the four stations, that's 24 seven. And one of the things we're really proud of when it comes to that is Santa Cruz Fire Department's been a paid professional organization for 125 years this year. And 125 years ago, when they opened the first station over on Church Street, we've never closed our doors. So 24 seven for 125 years is really impressive. We run three shifts to keep, that, keep those stations staffed. So every two days, there's a rotation of crews, people coming and going to keep the stations going. Next slide, please. Uh, looking at our four stations, you can see on the slide that stations one and two are by far the busiest. Uh, they run over 70% of the calls in the city. Um, when we look at um, how busy those stations are, they're not just the busiest in the city, they're the two busiest stations in the county. And even when we drop down to the station three on the west side, which runs only 17% 70, of the calls in the city, it's still one of the busiest stations in the county. So Santa Cruz Fire is a, a fairly busy fire department for our size. The 34% of all calls, um, that's related to all calls in the county. So there's about 30 stations in the county and we have four of those stations and we run 34% of the call volume countywide. Gives you some reference to how busy your stations are. When we look at historic fire events, um, primarily what we're looking at is this last year, California had the worst fire season ever. Um, and we all know that, how, how, how it impacted everybody and including your local fire department. We responded to 15 statewide incidents just from our firefighters alone. Um, some of those with just one engine company, some with multiple engine companies and some with overhead staff included. So it was a really busy season in that respect. We had the Rincon and the Poganet fires, which were both um, affected the city um, ge geographically and with our, uh, with our resources. Okay, next slide please. Uh, going to our facilities, um, starting with station one. This is a really old station built in 1939. Some of the issues we're having with this fire station is it was built for apparatus. It was 80 years old. Smaller, shorter, less staffing. This, and when we look at current standards, the station is completely overwhelmed. What we've done modifications wise to the station is we've widened the doors, we've raised the doors, we've raised the ceiling, we've moved the plumbing, we've extended the station in length, we've lowered the floor, we've done everything we could possibly do to fit our apparatus in the station. And now we're ordering custom apparatus that actually fits in what we have available to us. So we've, and, and the bottom line is we've really tapped out the station. It's been an awesome facility for 80 years, but looking down the road to keep buying modern fire, fire apparatus, we're gonna really have to be looking at a modern fire station to go with it. So out of the station, we have an engine company, which is the pumpers that carry the water, the hose, a three person crew. There's a ladder truck, which is primarily there for rescue. It's also a three person crew and then a battalion chief that supervises the daily operations. On. Going to station two, built in 1947. Uh, this station has not seen very significant upgrades over the years and also we've had issues with the height and length of our apparatus in the station. We have to order, again, we have to order apparatus that fits a certain height restriction that we have, which is gonna be much more problematic as time goes on. And we did remodel it back in 2000, but it was primarily um, earthquake standard modifications and aesthetically very little done to 
get us up to the modern standards we need to, to run a firehouse. Out of that station, you'll see another engine company with three personnel. Moving on to station three, built in 1954. This station is probably our most modern station that we have. It has seen significant upgrades over the years. Um, it still remains within its original footprint, but we were able to build an apparatus bay that can house taller, wider apparatus, although we don't have the ability to store much in the way of reserve apparatus. So we'd like to see a deeper bay on this station at some point so we can house more backup fire engines. Another uh, three-person staffed engine company. And then finally, you'll see the station four, which is on UCSC campus. This was built in 1975 when UCSC opened up its own fire department and has not seen any significant upgrades since then. This station needs to be tore down and rebuilt. And this is a station that we lease from UCSC as part of our contract for service. And out of there, we run one three-person engine company. And finally, on the facilities, we have lifeguard headquarters. This was built in 1960. Next slide, please. This was built in 1960, and my understanding, it was built primarily by the lifeguards and some volunteers that decided they needed a, basically a station to house their equipment and have a lifeguard tower on top, and they, they went out there and built it. Um, since then, we haven't seen any significant upgrades until this last year when council approved some, some uh, funding through the workers' comp fund to do some safety upgrades, which is really beneficial for the employees that are working out there. But ideally, it needs to be rebuilt because it's, I think this uh, building is only about 1,200 square feet and houses about 60 seasonal lifeguards um, every year. So it's, it's definitely overwhelmed. All right, well, hello, Paul Horvat, um, the Emergency Operations Center Manager, OES Coordinator as well for the City of Santa Cruz. Um, I want to talk to you um, briefly about uh, the community engagement and, you know, we talk about fire prevention, Office of Emergency Services, um, operations part, which is kind of the biggest part of our department, but we do a lot of other things as well. Um, one is... Uh, we have a community emergency response team training where we train citizens to respond within their neighborhoods to emergencies. It's a 24-hour class. We offer uh, two classes a year. We do a refresher um, one evening uh, each month uh, out of the library. And uh, it, it's a really great program and uh, something we're very proud of. Um, we also uh, teach CPR classes. Um, we do uh, ROP instruction um, for the high schools. Uh, just to give uh, students an opportunity to see uh, if they would be interested in working for the fire department as a potential career. Um, so we've been doing that for quite a while. Um, we also uh, team up with the police department and uh, a teen academy where we have teenagers um, come to uh, learn about public safety and to, to inform them on what we do and, and how we respond. Um, we do school presentations and tours where we'll have schools uh, come to the fire station, we'll give them tours. Uh, the folks will give them a little talk. Um, it's kind of fun when the kids show up, we'll give them little hats and stickers and um, it's a good pub ed uh, opportunity for us. Um, we also uh, partner with the Parks and Rec Department to manage the Junior Lifeguard Program. Um, and then two other really cool programs that we uh, participate in are the Right Away Program for people with disabilities. We get them out on surfboards and it's just a really awesome program as well as the Wounded Warriors Program where we get people who have disabilities out on the water and have you know, experience of their lifetime. So those are some of the things that we do with our uh, community engagement. Uh, within the fire department that we're very proud of. Um, my area is the Office of Emergency Services. Um, essentially, I'm not gonna go through the, every bullet on the slide, but essentially the Office of Emergency Services is, is, a, is a location where we coordinate at the 911 Dispatch Center where we get city employees together who all have a, a responsibility in responding to large disasters. The reason we activate that operation center is because the resources that we have in the field are inadequate to manage the emergency. So the last f formal time that we activated the, the, the um, EOC was during the 2017 storms where we had um, around a um, little over $3 million in damage um, where we've uh, 
we received back uh, 1.8 million and we still have about another 1.3 million coming. So that's a really um, extensive process. But the way we're broken up within the uh, Office of Emergency Services is we have training, we do disaster exercises, um, we develop plans, um, we have mitigation programs where we mitigate hazards throughout the community. Um, through grant funding mostly, and then we have our response. Our response, um, kind of opposite of the fire department where it's really big, and it's mostly what we do, but within the OC, it's, it's usually pretty small because we tend to respond to catastrophic events. Catastrophic events don't happen every day. So what we do a lot of is we focus on training and conducting disaster exercises so our staff is ready um, you know, when called upon. Um, and we develop plans that uh, allow us to use uh, them as a tool so we can train our folks on what their roles are in a disaster. So this year we'll be embarking upon uh, some training for all citywide staff and we'll be conducting disaster exercises as well. So that's kind of OES in a nutshell. Right, turn it back over to the fire chief. So within the Marine Safety Division, we have full uh, two full-time employees. We have a captain and a Marine Safety Officer. The captain position rotates. Uh, we have about 65 seasonal uh, lifeguards. Um, and a lot of those uh, people go on to uh, other activities, whether they're uh, teachers or uh, they go into the fire service. Um, it's kind of an incubator uh, here in the community as far as getting exposed to uh, not only being safe in the ocean, which is one of the primary functions, but also just that uh, positive physical outlet and kind of some guidance and mentorship uh, during that time period in their lives. We have approximately 900 junior lifeguard participants on an annual basis, which has been going on since the 60s. Um, it is a foundational program, I think, for a lot of people within uh, the city and the county. Um, and again, uh, it's something that we work in collaboration with Parks and Rec. Um, all of the instructors are lifeguards first and foremost, and then they're instructors for uh, Parks and Rec for that program. Uh, we absolutely support it. Lifeguard headquarters, uh, we have two vehicles, four uh, PWCs or personal watercraft. Uh, we have eight lifeguard towers. Um, go to the next one. So on an annual basis, there's over a mil million visitors that come to our beaches. Uh, um, that's, that's a big number. Um, and they interact with the lifeguards on a daily basis. Uh, and it's everything from where's the boardwalk to uh, you know what is a rip current. Um, we had over 200 water rescues, uh, 34 boat rescues within the area, and we had over 300 significant uh, medical calls uh, down there. The other thing that's really um, interesting, and this number has stayed fairly constant, is we had over 200 lost and found persons. We find kids on the beach who've been separated from their family every single day, and we hold on to them sometimes for five minutes, sometimes for five hours, um, but we do get them reunited. If not, we call Santa Cruz police and uh, we will take care of them until they're reunited. And then additionally, a lot of what we do in the Marine Safety Division is that proactive, preventative uh, <laughs> talking with people who don't have a really good ocean awareness, um, what not to do in the ocean. Um, and we'd rather do that than have a rescue. Moving into the Fire Prevention Bureau, uh, we have four full-time personnel and we're really uh, mandated with uh, enforcing the fire code doing fire cause and origin investigation. Uh, we review all the plans uh, for new buildings that are coming in. Um, and then, so that's one sec segment. And then the other component is that community risk reduction. What can we do to prevent an incident from happening in the first place? And this last year, we partnered with My Safe California, which is a nonprofit, um, and canvassed some of the neighborhoods uh, to ensure that they had smoke detectors. Um, and that's something they'll be coming back uh, this, this summer and doing more of the junior lifeguard CPR training, uh, and then we also developed uh, some water safety, public safety announcements that we will be releasing next week um, as part of our Memorial Day kickoff to the summer season. We also formed a first Firewise group in De La Viega. Since then, we've had two other groups, uh, one in, uh, up off of Western and one up off of Highland. Um, and again, this is giving people the tools that they can engage within their house for wildland prevention. Uh, again, prevention uh, is, is much better than response. De La Viega, we've been uh, working on fuel reduction in that area. We are almost completed with that, and we will start moving into other areas of the city. Um, for 2019, the really big things for us uh, is getting and doing the state man ma mandated inspections for the R1s and R2s. Those are primarily um, hotels and motels, whether they're transient or permanent. Um, we also have coded option coming up this year. It's on a three-year cycle. Uh, moving forward with the fuel reduction projects in the city-owned wildland urban interface and then pursuing grants for uh, continued vegetation management. Put this up here is these are the areas within the city that are within our wildland urban uh, interface. 
Um, and the shaded areas are the areas that the city owns. So those are open spaces that have fuel that we need to engage in uh, vegetation management. And we have highlighted uh, the number of linear feet as well as the amount of acreage that's encapsulated within there. And uh, these are projects that on a rolling three to five year um, plan, these are the things that we need to engage in to uh, prevent a significant fire from impacting the city as a whole. So Chief Gallagher touched on this, but you know, as a department, we are response-based. Um, and our goal is to respond and mitigate a problem, whether it's a fire, a medical, a rescue and also try to prevent that from happening. And as he touched on, this year is the 125th year, year anniversary of this department being a paid professional department in this community. And it's continually evolved from horses drawing wagons to engines that we can't fit into our stations. But the basic premise and uh, you know, the mission of our, of our department has not changed. Questions? Thank you so much for the presentation and for all of the services that you provide, um, both as intervention services, but also the educational auxiliary services as well. It's great to hear the story. So thank you so much. Um, are there any members of the community who wanted to address the council at this time? Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and see if there's any questions or comments from our council members. Council Member Glover? Yeah, um, so just um, thanks for the presentation. I was curious about the fuel reduction that's going on up at the De La Viega area, super important to um, deal with fire stuff. What process goes into that fuel reduction? As far as the actual reduction of fuel? Um, well, there's a couple of different, uh, there's a couple of different options we have. Uh, we have uh, hand crews. So by hand, we have mechanical, which would be equipment like a masticator, which is a large rotating drum that just shaves off everything in front of it, or we can uh, do uh, prescribed burns. Um, within De La Viega, we're really limited to uh, using hand crews um, and some mechanical equipment, uh, wood chippers, masticators, those type of things. It's not a good candidate for doing a prescribed burn. Uh, we do have areas that within our open space that we've gone through the process of identifying those. Um, we have a very narrow window for when we can do that safely, and primarily those would be in Arana Gulch and uh, in Poganip. Um, open grassy areas are um, much better for doing burn than uh, steep wooded hillsides. And then with um, that, after the removal of the of fuel that's already dried in there that's ready to burn, what is the kind of mitigation plan to stop more or new growth from coming in and replacing? I just want to make sure that, because the Parks and Rec Department decided to stop using um, herbicides, specifically like glyphosate, so is that something that the um, Fire department uses or? No, we don't use any chemicals. I mean, that's been a city policy for a long time and it's a challenge. So up in our area, like around Loch Lomond, um, we don't have responsibility for uh, fire suppression in that area, even though it's city owned, we would be involved in that process and get notified. Uh, one of the challenges that they found up there with the Scotch broom uh, because of the reseeding and the cycle with that, um, taking that on with mechanical equipment or by hand is uh, incredibly inefficient. Um, and not very effective. And the use of chemicals is more effective, but we're not allowed to do that. So within De La Viega, what we've done is uh, created shaded fuel breaks where we're not clear cutting the forest. Uh, the forest is still there. In a shaded fuel break, um, you have shade, which means the canopy is intact. And what we're trying to do is provide horizontal fuel breaks or separation between those fuels, as well as vertical separation so that a fire that starts on the ground doesn't transition from grass to brush to the tree and to, into the crown. And so a shaded fuel break is thinning out that fuel, uh, minimizing uh, the size of a fire that may start as well, as slowing its uh, spread from um, you know, either the, the, the canopy or from the canopy to the canopy from uh, the ground itself. So we do that with chipping and removal, but we don't use chemicals. And then just uh, I think one more question is, uh, who's doing the labor <clears throat> associated with the physical and manual removal? Is it the fire department staff or Parks and Rec, Public, uh, public Works? Uh, it, it's been a combination. It's been a collaborative effort with Parks and Rec since it's their open spaces. The, the, <clears throat> the primary work has been done uh, through two mechanisms, and that has been through the CCC, the California Conservation Corps, um, and also through CAL FIRE with the use of their inmate hand crews out of Ben Lomond. Um, but they are supervised and we have staff that's on site. Uh, primarily that's been Parks and Rec. It has been some fire department uh, people. And then through uh, the formation of FireWise, when we have Cal Fire hand crews come in, there's a ratio of su uh, supervision that they need. And uh, the closer you get to um, population centers, the higher that ratio is. So when we're out in the middle of the, 
you know, Los Padres National Forest, they don't need uh, the number of what they call sponsors, which is, you know, people who are there, they're not doing the work, they're just there for another set of eyes. Um, and generally that has been with parks and rec personnel um, being on site as those sponsors, but because of the Firewise group uh, going and getting training, we've had volunteers that have been able to take that position and free up that parks and rec person uh, to do something else. Great, thank you. Okay, Council Member Myers and then Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Member Brown. I just got a couple of questions, but mostly just want to compliment your department to start off and thank you guys for coming out today. I know you've been really busy and you also are, are entering into the busy season. So a um, couple of things, um, I'm encouraged to hear that you guys are pursuing, I know the governor designated a lot of funding for exactly what you're just speaking to, so I'm encouraged. Are you able to get, um, working through the Fire Safe Council, are you able to get some of those grants um, out there or is there any issues with not being able to bring some of that funding back to the community? You know, the, the, so the grant funding in the, in the spectrum of wildland and doing vegetation management ahead, um, I think there's a lot more funding opportunities uh, than there were two years ago. Yeah. Um, I think statewide, everyone is awakened that um, responding to an incident is um, not what we wanna do. So one of our challenges for the grant funding is just the administration and the upfront application process, and then also the kind of administrative support and the ability to fulfill all the different components of that grant. It's something that we're looking at, and we've identified areas that we want to apply for, um, and so we are pursuing that, and that's both with grants for doing education uh, and supporting FireWise uh, groups, as well as actually doing hands-on vegetation management. Um, either through uh, personnel costs being reimbursed or actually pursuing equipment uh, that we can use uh, to do that. And do you guys, um, I know the Fire Safe Council is being sort of, um, I know it's a partnership, but I know the Resource <laughs> Conservation District, for example, has services. I mean, are you guys working in a partnership so that, you know, we're kind of keeping track of all those, those funds as they're yeah. being dis distributed by yes, the state? Yes, we're, we're definitely doing that. Um, we just really got our Fire Safe Council up and running. I'm the president of the Fire Safe Council. And um, so we're working closely with um, other areas, mostly in the unincorporated areas throughout the county, um, because we do have a lot of projects going on. We do have a lot of great work that's getting done. We just wanna make sure that we continue to track it and then we support it um, as well. So, you know, we recently at the fire department were awarded uh, some funding to do some uh, vegetation management uh, in the De La Viega area through grant funding. Most of what we're doing um, is getting paid through grant funding. So, uh, you know, so yes, we're definitely doing that. Um, we're working on, um, you know, public education um, to the entire county so that they can, um, you know, be informed um, as well as trying to uh, find 501c3s that will assist um, in accepting uh, state funding to uh, to manage vegetation management projects throughout the county. Okay, great. And then I had a question um, on the lifeguard tower yeah. building. I know that's that's scheduled for hopefully some improvements. Or could you just speak to so that? So what we did this year. So the building itself is absolutely too small. Yeah. Um, it is not. It is just. It's not designed for what it's being used for. It was very much kind of cobbled together. There was not a lot of strategic planning about those. Uh, those buildings and you know, I view uh, lifeguard headquarters or fire stations as being 50 to 75 year investments. Uh, I mean, that's kind of the time frame we're looking at. And w most of our buildings have kind of gotten to that point. So the work that we did this last year was really, um, it was to prevent a workplace injury. It was to fix leaking roofs that were rotting the beams. It was to fix exposed electrical. It, was, it wasn't an upgrade. It was literally just to take care of those holes that we had within the building so that we didn't have it um, for, you know, I mean, we literally had buckets on the floor uh, catching water um, because we had leaks in the roof. So the work that was done uh, this last year um, was an upgrade in the sense that it looks much better than it was, but we didn't change the physical layout. Uh, you know, we didn't expand in size. We didn't change the functionality of it. Um, we still have, uh, you know, one restroom for uh, females, one restroom for males, and uh, we have 65 employees that are coming through there on a, on a you know, regular basis. You know, with the junior lifeguard program and then our on-duty staffing, we're looking at 30 people trying to use one facility at the same time. Um, and so the work that was done was, was literally to patch holes and to fix electrical and plumbing. And just so I'm clear, that's a general fund, that that would be an impact general fund in terms of any kind of improvements to that building, correct? It'd be CIP, yeah, yeah correct. CIP, got it. 
Um, and then lastly, I just uh, want to compliment you. This is probably not um, what a lot of people think of when, but I met with a, a business over, owner on the west side, a solar mm -hmm. company that um, apparently is our first microgrid um, company uh, in California, from what I understand. And uh, they were very complimentary to working with you guys on really kind of permitting the very first sort of type of building like that, which is basically a building that is completely off the grid and uh, it has gigantic um, batteries in its in its uh, place. And just um, working with your staff, I guess, was really um, great for them. So I just want to pass that compliment on. It's not something that I, I know a lot of people know you guys are doing, but um, supporting our local businesses who are actually doing green energy and uh, really cutting edge stuff is, um, so thank you for your work with that and all that you guys do. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I just had a couple questions. One, my first question was just around um, what kind of success have you all seen around the career recruitment efforts at high schools and whether you've seen um, you know, more people coming on to the fire department from those efforts? Yes and no. Um, so the Cabrillo recruitment, uh, that's a joint fire academy. And so that's a way to capture uh, funding uh, streams so that uh, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a dollar amount through the educational system basically per hour. Um, and then having uh, a mechanism to train someone here locally or expose them here locally um, to want to be in the fire service. And so like our junior lifeguard program, our lifeguard program, their seasonal employees, um, and if, they want to, if they're interested in the fire service, uh, I'd love to have them here, but if they get a job somewhere else, I think that's great too. Um, we're, we're struggling right now with recruitment and retention um, here locally because of the cost of living, uh, and we're not unique. Um, but also in the fire service as a whole, um, the recruit, uh, recruitment numbers are down, and I attribute that to a couple different reasons. One, we hire people who have to have a paramedic license. So, you know, 40 years ago, uh, the requirements to apply were less, and now um, we've kind of added those on. And then I think it's just a generational um, impact as far as uh, wanting to go into the fire service and have a singular career for that amount of time. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people that, you know, they want to move jobs, they want to move locations. Um, and we've been around for 125 years um, and we do things at work and we change slowly because um, we want to make sure that what we implement is going to be effective. But recruitment's been a challenge for us. It's something that it's an ongoing uh, problem. Great. And then my second question was um, around the fuel removal. Is, are there any partnerships happening with fire ecologists or um, restoration ecologists around um, one, preventing the, the spread of invasive species through the removal, and then just um, different types of removal processes? Uh, as far as fire ecologists know, we've had some biologists involved. Most of what we're doing is removing invasive species, period. Um, we're not spreading those. Uh, most of what we've done is uh, the larger stuff has been removed, the smaller stuff has been shipped and left on site, which actually retains soil, inhibits weed growth. The reality is, is, is uh, fuel, in our world, fuel, being you know grass, brush, trees, it grows. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't really have a really good mechanism of you know preventing that from happening other than recognizing that we need to go back and do that on a uh, regular uh, maintenance schedule. Um, like I said, probably every three to five years. We're not going to be able to prevent all fires, but what we're really trying to do is prevent a rapid spread or a rapid growth by putting in those fuel breaks while leaving why a lot of us like to live in Santa Cruz. You know, we like our green open spaces. We like our forest, we like that. Um, and so we're not trying to remove it all, but we are trying to put some buffers in around it. Thank you. Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember yeah, Brown. Um, fascinating presentation as always. Um, the breadth of services is remarkable and from immediate to very long-term, very rare. Um, couple of questions. Um, I remember when we did the 2000 upgrades and they really were just kind of basic. Um, what is your, well, let's just say kind of hoped for schedule for replacement of the, they all seem like they're too small these days. And um, that's obviously on the, it, it, are these on the unfunded CIP list? Some are, it, I, I need to start the conversation about that because these are huge ticket items I, yes. and I recognize yeah. that, but they're also very long-term yeah. uh, investments in the community and what we do. Um, you know, for example, the UCSC fire station, uh, it has a single bathroom, a single shower, and we have mixed gender, um, you know, mm -hmm. companies working up there. 
And we don't have the capacity of storing our existing emergency vehicles. Um, we're storing emergency response vehicles in unsecure areas outside and they get broken into. And so just the ability to house our existing equipment um, is one of my priorities, as well as uh, being able to plan forward for the ability to house things that are going to be different shapes. So station three is a perfect example of that. When we replaced the apparatus bay out there in 2000 as part of that remodel, those doors um, are much larger than any of our other uh, stations that we have. Our station two and station one, you know, built in 1939, built in, uh, 47, um, it's concrete. Uh, and so we don't have the ability to adjust those heights very readily. Um, so I put that out there is uh, our day in and day out service that we need to support. That is going to be a conversation, uh, much like IT talked about red, yellow, and green. We are getting toward that red component um, and we haven't had failure yet, but we're approaching it. And uh, and I understand that the lifeguard station, I think when I talked with you, you said that <laughs> That's so bad. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and it's what we have, and I recognize that. And there's a lot of different pressures on the CIP, you know, on, on the budget as a whole. Um, and I put these out there that these are long-term investments that require a lot of upfront um, money. Um, but I need to put it out there that it's something we need to look at and put on the schedule. Um, and this is separate from our operating cost of what we do on a day in and day out basis. Um, and you know. And just quick, I don't want to take up a lot of time, but is is the UCSC station not on their dime to take care of? Yes and no. So we have a contract for services. We have a separate contract for a lease where we actually pay them to lease that building. Um, their process is a little bit different um, time frame than um, what I'm used to dealing with on some issues. Um, but we have put it in there as an identified um, component of their uh, long range development plan. Uh, that that station, uh, we need to identify a place up there and a, a mechanism to pay for it, whether it's uh, with them, with us. If they charge us, we're gonna charge them back a percentage of it. Um, but the location of the station itself um, is challenging and the actual uh, structure itself is challenging. And it is within their long range development plan as one of the identified um, needs. Along with many. Yes. <laughs> and then uh, another, another one just quickly. Um, I recall that there was discussion of uh, renegotiating the medical response contract with AMR, and I know department considered putting in a bid for that, didn't in the end. What, what, what's the status of that now? Okay. Oh, there, um, you don't, do yeah. you not want to answer that? No, I can answer it. So we did not put a bid in because of the parameters, okay. and ultimately I think we would have been okay, but to put the city on the hook for that countywide um, requirement was not financially smart. So we, we withdrew with that. We do have a subcontract that we're about to sign uh, that will give us reimbursement and that is collectively of all the fire departments uh, in the county. And there have been some changes uh, to what we can we call the 201 and 224 rights within the state of California for the ability of a jurisdiction being able to provide transport and not have a county overlay uh, for a exclusive operating area. Um, so we do have a subcontract that we're um, entering into with, a, with the uh, ambulance provider, um, but the ability for us to provide that transport at, for us and the entire county, um, that opportunity, um, we, didn't, we didn't step into. So basically the existing contract was updated and revised. Yes, yes. yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for all of your work. And um, I know it's a busy time and with just making the transition into your current role, um, maybe more than you bargained for. <laughs> so I appreciate all of your efforts and um, uh, good natured uh, responsiveness. So um, uh, just a quick question, you know, I, I mean, I'll say it again. I've said this since I came onto the council, the lifeguard headquarters and the East Side Fire Station, having taken those tours, I mean, if you haven't been in there, it's it's really, I mean, it's understood the minute, you know, the minute you walk in the door, it's really um, understood how critical it is for the, all of the personnel that, that operate through those doors. Um, quick question on the number of fire inspections that I see in the narrative on the budget uh, fluctuates here. And I'm just wondering, is that part of the, the cycle, the three year cycle that you talked about for, I mean, I know that was a different category of inspections, but the number of fire inspections in fiscal 16 was 2,950 and then fiscal year 18, 1165. That's a combination of plans coming through and also staffing. We are finally staffed up 
um, and so we're engaging in that. And that number does fluctuate based on what's being built, what complaints come in. Um, so yeah, there's a radical, uh, you know, uh, change in that number, um, but that's based on outside um, outside things. Thank you for the presentation. Um, just wondering, the mutual aid, can you talk about that a little more um, in terms of, is it a Northern California thing? Is it a regional? Is it a, a statewide? Do we pay anything into being a member of joint uh, operations? No, so to answer, I'll, I'll take the first, we don't pay anything. And then the answer to all your other questions is yes. We have a statewide uh, um, OES um, area that's subdivided up between North and South Ops, and then it's uh, subdivided up into regions. We are in region two South, which uh, is basically the coastal zone that goes all the way up to Del Norte. Um, and within each region, we have an operational uh, coordinator and center that we go through, um, and that gets funneled up to uh, the geographic area coordination uh, points. Um, so it, it's a scalable as much as just here within the county, us calling Central Fire or Aptos Fire and saying, you know, will you help us? Uh, to a larger incident where we will go out through the region and ask for um, help, and that can be under the Master Mutual Aid, which is free for the first 12 hours, and then the state will uh, decide if they're going to assign a number to it and uh, start reimbursement for resources that are coming in. So it, it's, yes, we're broken down into uh, very small areas, and then we're part of the larger whole within the state, and then the state is also tied into the federal system so that we can reach out and this last year, we had resources, uh, you know, from Oregon, from Washington, from Florida, from Alaska, and so um, th that coordination happens uh, at that level. Did we pay for that too? No. No, we we will pay our proportionate for our people, um, but as far as asking for resources, uh, again, that is through reimbursement at the state level yeah. or at the federal level. And could, could you give us an idea? Did we understand we participated in the Paradise Fire? Absolutely. And what what was that like? And how? Who, who went or not people, persons, yeah. but like, well, how many persons in that? So uh, we had a engine up there as part of a strike team, uh, which is five of the same type of pieces of equipment with a strike team leader uh, that were engaged on frontline operations as far as, you know, fire suppression, damage assessment. Uh, Paul Horvat actually went up underneath a different mechanism of mutual aid uh, to work within their EOC. Um, and so when they asked for resources, we always have the right to say no based on what our needs are if we can't support that staffing on an ongoing basis. Um, but uh, what they request is really dependent on what they need. Do they need uh, firefighters to put out fire? Do they need emergency managers to coordinate? Um, and so they put those uh, uh, resource requests out through the, the mutual aid system. Am I missing rescues on here? Is it on here? The, how, how, what was the number of rescues then? For, Are they for, for, I guess, marine rescues. Marine rescues, I think we had a little over 200 water rescues um, uh, over the year, and those are actually swimming out and bringing someone back. Um, and those are, that is within the lifeguard stats, that is, that is what you think of when you think of a lifeguard in a tower, you know, Sandy Beach. That is separate from our water rescues that we perform off of the engine off of Westcliff um, at, you know, one o'clock in the morning or in the middle of winter when we don't have lifeguard services uh, in, in, in motion. And follow up, uh, last question is on, on Vice Mayor Cummings' question about um, uh, hiring and how difficult is it to hire a female firefighter? And you talked about the mixed gender companies. I understand we have one female firefighter now? Captain. Yeah, we have one captain, uh, a female. Um, and we're not unique within the fire service. It's been a struggle. This last application period, we had no females apply. Uh, for our department. Um, and the numbers, it used to be thousands for you know one position. We, we are not seeing those numbers. Um, and I think, again, it has to do with uh, the minimum requirements being raised as far as what you need to have to even apply. Um, and we've found success through our athletic department. Um, and I'll just go back to water polo probably being one of the um, primary places that we can draw females out of uh, that want to uh, do this job and have the, uh, the physicality and the desire to do it. Um, I, I would love to have more, more people apply in that arena. It's something that we do outreach within the junior lifeguard program as they get older into high school, you know, what am I going to do in my life? Um, as well as reaching out to some of the uh, programs here um, in the county and through Cabrillo specifically. So we're doing that? Okay. I mean, 
please, if you know someone who uh, wants to and they meet the requirements, have them apply. We'll be recruiting again well, this summer. It's better if you have, we have an ongoing sort of organized outreach rather than just ad hoc. Yeah, it, it's, all, it's not as organized as I would like. I'll, I'll admit that. Um, it's been a challenge. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Very dynamic work that you do. And um, just want to also thank you for the services that you provide for the education components of the work that you do. And always welcoming students to come to the to the fire station. And I get to see some of the junior lifeguards jump off the fire you know, tower at the end of the year. And um, really just wonderful services that you provide. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Okay. All right. So next up, we have uh, Human Resources and uh, Lisa Murphy coming on up. Just give me a few minutes to give it to us. Oh, really? Oh, off at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It said Cool, you know. That's awesome. I know. She said 12. Oh. Bonnie, can you help me get to the file? The M drive. I have it on the interchange. Hi, should I go ahead and get started? There's three missing still. And we're the most important department, so <laughs> I'd prefer to wait till they decide to rejoin to hear all about us. <laughs> You want to wait? Yeah, one second. I know they'd be disappointed. Of course they would. All right, Lisa, let's okay. go ahead and get started. We'll go ahead and get started. I'm able to decide to join us. Well, <laughs> that's okay. Well, good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. I'm Lisa Murphy, I'm your HR Director, and I see a number of my staff are in the audience and wave. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me tell you about our mission that our staff developed. As a resource and trusted advisor, we strive to cultivate an inspiring and fulfilling work environment that attracts and engages a talented workforce. Because if you think about it, you wouldn't have your police, you wouldn't have your fire if it weren't for the folks that are sitting in this audience. Which there's your team. A little team <laughs> bonding experience that we had out uh, at the bocce courts there. And for us, it's all about the people. So let me tell you a little bit about our budget because we were just a minuscule little piece of the pie. As you can see, we are just 2% of the city's general fund, yet uh, we have such, I would say, a Im tremendous impact on the organization. Our budget has stayed relatively flat uh, over the last year. We've maintained uh, even a slightly lower level this year for the FY20 budget. Uh, again, we are just 2%, $7 million. Uh, of your entire little over $100 million budget. What is that budget? What are we composed of? Well, we have five divisions. We have our volunteer program, which is just 1% of our budget. Our administration is 22%, unemployment insurance, 1%, workers' comp, 45% of our budget, and medical insurance and benefits, so far, 31%. 
A little bit about administration. Nothing we do is more important than hiring and developing people. We are busy. We are extremely busy in our department. We held 122 recruitments last year. We processed over 3,600 applications. Every one of those have to be read, reviewed. Uh, we promoted 37 employees from within, and we had hired 13 temporary employees into our regular permanent positions. We also have a, another piece of uh, our administration, which is our employee relations division. Uh, we strengthen the employer-employee relationship through a number of different ways. Uh, we resolve workplace issues. This is the, the lead for our negotiations, course discipline, investigations, conflict resolution. We also have our Equal Employment Opportunity Committee uh, is out of this particular um, division. I'll tell you a little bit about the EOC committee in the 2018. The purpose is to serve as a communication channel between city employees the community, city manager, city council, and EEO coordinator on equal employment opportunity concerns. And who's on that uh, commission? We have two that are appointed by the council, and they're members of the public. One executive that's appointed by the city manager, three employees that's also appointed by the city manager. There's an SEIU member, and then the two other bargaining units, we have eight in total, but they rotate themselves through um, membership. Uh, in 2019, the goals uh, committed to non-discriminatory and respectful work environment, uh, raise awareness about all types of discrimination and equal opportunity issues in the workplace, and ensure pay equity for all employees. Some recent, recent initiatives that this uh, committee has undertaken is a gender pay gap study. They recently implemented the respectful workplace conduct policy and beginning on a program for the elimination of bias in the hiring process. I'll give you a little bit of a, a breakdown of what our uh, ethnic diversity is in this city for our, our uh, employees. So the first sliding in number here, I'm just trying to play with some of the tools available on the PowerPoint, so bear with me, uh, is the city population of diverse, diversity. So you see 2% African American, with 8% Asian, 75% Caucasian, 19% Latino, uh, Hispanic, and 1% Native American. And then with regards to what our city employees are, uh, the makeup of diversity is 2% are African American, we have 6% Asian, 72% Caucasian, 20% Latino, 4% Native American, and, oops, I put a little bit too soon. So we, we mirror our population quite well, but also layered on top of that, we need to look at our applicant pool and how are we doing there? So the first one I slid in there was our applicant pool. So 4% of our applicants were African American, 9% Asian, 55% Caucasian, 27% Latino, and 1% Native American, and 4% unknown. And that's because this is you self-identify, and some choose not to identify on that. So this is one of our first times looking at the diversity and the makeup of our, our, um, our applicant pool, and there's a lot of work to be done because we're trying to we're learning ourselves about uh, workplace bias, implicit bias in the hiring process, and we're educating ourselves in that process, and how to diversify our, um, our employee pool is really important to the EEOC committee, and our department is charged with uh, oversight of that committee. So now I do the ethnic diversity, but also what's our gender diversity? So the city population, no surprise, 50% male, City employees, 70% um, are male, and then our applicants are just uh, slightly over 60%. So the, the uh, female population, city population, it's 50-50, that's it's statewide too. Amazing how that works. But when you look at our, our category for female uh, employees, it's 30%. And just a, just a surface level dive into that number is because we are heavily dominated industry that are uh, male populated, so our police, our fire, our public works, our landfill, we, sanitation workers, are tend to be male. And then with the, in terms of applicants, just under 40%. So, and, and I, am welcome, I welcome questions at any time. 
Okay, oh, let me. Mm -hmm. Okay, technology doesn't like me. There we go. <laughs> okay, uh, another part of, of what's really important that our department does is which path will you choose? What does that mean? Employee training and development. We have doubled our budget over the past two years to really focus on employee training and development, growing your own. If you already live here, you're more likely to stay here if you already work here. So it's very important for us not only to try to get that grassroots uh, from there, you know, grow your own employees, but also the people that are here, we want to we want to prepare you for the future. We hope that future is here, but if it's not, you're going to come from somewhere that has loved and supported you and, and encouraged your growth. We do have some mandatory training that we uh, oversee, understanding cultural diversity and harassment and discrimination. We also have a leadership development academy. Anybody can attend. It's not restricted to a recommendation type of process. So what's great about that um, leadership academy, if you complete all of the courses that we designate as part of that, then you can gain one year of supervisory experience. That'll go to your credit. So when you're going for a job, if you haven't had that supervisory experience, which a lot of them require, you can get it if you go to our academies. Uh, they can choose from over 65 classes. They're amazing. Just very briefly, under the um, communication, we have unconscious bias, becoming an emotionally intelligent leader. Under the category of openness, cultural equity, powerful thinking, we have customer service, how to plan your time. We have inspiring a shared vision, uh, leading a team. The, the, the selection is amazing. Anything should appeal to just about everybody that we have. And we try to make it so that it can go, anybody can attend and try to diversify the times. We also offer financial management classes and wellness classes. <coughs> With regards to, uh, in the same category, we also oversee organizational development, which has been a, a, a desire of the council as well. There was a strategic initiative several years ago to do an employee engagement survey, which we did and we we're in our second year. so. Uh, the report hasn't come out, but from the first year, we had our survey developed a work plan, and each department had their own work plan that they were to uh, implement for them based on the results of the survey. And pretty soon, I'm going to come back to you with the, the results of the, the one we just recently took to see that we've made some modest improvements. But as a result of the employee engagement program and the desires of what employees wanted to see, we, we did uh, expand our leadership training programs. One of the things we also did was made it re a requirement for executives and managers to attend at least no less than two leadership courses a year. We also, from the employee engagement program, uh, expanded our succession development program where we've created just re recently what's called the stretch assignment policy. And what that does is it allows employees who maybe would like to try, a, they would like to promote into a position in which they do not have any experience in, uh, and they're not able to work out a class in that position because they're not qualified. But so how do you get to be qualified? Well, we'll uh, give you the opportunity to work on special projects and have the opportunity to stretch and learn and grow. Uh, so that you will be prepared and you can then promote into that position. Uh, we also have just implemented an overhire policy, which we're having a lot of retirements, and there has been some turnover as well within the organization. And if we know particularly when somebody's going to leave, if there's a particular retirement, um, that we can hire somebody for a, about two months to overlap and do a transfer of knowledge, and that so the seamless continuity that would occur is is the wealth of knowledge is, could, instead of letting it walk out the door, it can stay internal. So that's a policy. But there's, of course, there's restrictions to that, you know, with budget and so forth. Uh, we also, again, the career development program that we've been implementing, but that's, we have coaching programs, we have mentoring programs that we've implemented, or that have, they've been in for quite a while, but they're getting, there's more participation. Uh, so a lot of opportunities available to develop our own folks here for the future. Another division we have is our benefits. They're the quiet, unsung heroes. You have over 800 employees who want to change their health benefits during open enrollment. Uh, they want medical information, they re retirement information. There's leave of absences. It's amazing how many uh, people we service with day-to-day -day questions on their benefits. So of course, medical, dental, vision, 
uh, life insurance, disability, retirement, leaves of absences, when can I use this sick leave, can I, vacation donations, it's, it's amazing the, the level of customer service that we provide with just a small staff. We also have our workers' compensation division. Of course, we help employees when they're injured on the job. Uh, I, fortunately, I don't have the tracking on the statistics, just a little bit late on that, where we had 98 new claims in 2018, but I can tell you that that is fairly uh, normal. That can be from the injured finger or just even report. You're required to report if an injury, uh, even if you're not gonna file a claim. Um, so I can get you the, the, the trend line, um, but unfortunately, I said I didn't, I didn't prepare that for you. We also oversee the volunteer program. Laurel Keefe is housed in our department. It's a contract service with the Volunteer Center. Uh, CityServe is actually what it's called. They supported over almost 1,400 volunteers last year with a total number of almost, well, 27,000 volunteer hours. So a, a one person shop, she's pretty amazing. Our department priorities. Employee development, professional, personal development. That remains one of our number one uh, goals. It has been in the past year, two years. We've, I want to see the consistency. There's a lot of growth that still can occur in this area, so that's why it may, remains an ongoing uh, project for us. Again, in succession planning, the stretch assignments to overhire the coaching. That is. A, a goal that needs to be nurtured and maintained and ingrained into this organization because people will, as they retire and the, what is it, the silver tsunami, we have to be prepared and we have to have those individuals from, the, from SEIU to supervisor or management, they need to be prepared to move up and step into those roles and it could be the next day, you know, they'll get hit by the bus. We want you ready. And improving organizational culture, again, that was another strategy that the council had identified. Um, that's an ongoing process, and uh, through the Engo Employee Engagement Program, that's, I think, have had those indicators, those markers to, to see where our growth and where, where we need to improve has been uh, very instrumental in implementing some changes that have occurred. And I, I personally think we've seen quite a bit of difference uh, in, in, in the organizational culture of here, with not in our, my own department, but citywide, uh, quite a positive impact. And I thank you for making that one of your goals. Employees should be your number one goal and concern when over 70% of your budget is to, for employees. We are, we are a service organization. We're not selling anything. We are out there for the public. So the investment in your people is extremely important, and I appreciate that. In HR, we serve the people who serve the community, right? Without us, where would you be? That concludes my presentation. I want to take just a moment, because we never hardly get that opportunity to do public recognition, but my staff back here, they're phenomenal. They do an amazing job, and they, I, I thank them and love them. You guys are amazing, so thank you. Thank you, Lisa and staff for the presentation and for the work. And I think you leave us with a really great quote. Um, that's absolutely true. Thank you. So at this time, I'll go ahead and see if there's any member of the community who has a question for us or would like to um, speak to us during public comment. And I'm seeing none. So we'll go ahead and return back to the council, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. I just want to start by thank you all for your hard work. Um, HR is an extremely important department for making sure the workers are protected and happy, and so just want to thank you there. I also want to thank you and commend you for all the work you're doing on addressing diversity within um, the city, in addition to cultural, cultural and ethnic, but also the gender diversity and the gender pay gap, um, and all the work that you're doing around professional development and leadership. I think it's really important that we are producing leaders in our community. Um, I was just curious about the study and the, the graph that you put up there. Was that, that's the, is this the first time this 2018 study has been done, or has this these types of studies been done over longer periods of time? They've always they have always been doing the EOC committee has always had the uh, the statistics, but the opportunity for us to uh, do a, a dive into them and really I'm sorry because 
of all my fun little graphics, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, um, is new for us. And it, you know, it's, do you have the bandwidth to, to really dive in and look into this and see? Uh, it's not always a priority, but I think it has changed and it needs to be more of a priority. We're learning a lot about hiring process and um, you know, one of the things, again, thank you for sending us to outside training, because what we are learning now is about unconscious bias. We're in hiring process. We're learning about how better to reach out to other diverse groups. We're also learning about what to look at in job descriptions, and maybe we should be changing those so that individuals who have more work life experience versus an actual degree in some positions would open the doors for a lot of individuals. So these are all new things that we are starting to dive in and look at and test. Thanks. And I've, I, well, I want to first thank you for you know all the work that you all are doing again. And then um, I think one of the things will be interesting too is seeing how um, these numbers change over time. So for example, the people who are in these positions who may have been hired, who are in more senior positions, and then how um, the hiring trend is changing over time. I think it'd be really great yeah. to look at. And so thank you for pulling these numbers in. Sure, we now have a new system that allows us to access this. And, and we didn't really have that before. So it's, it's technology is great. <laughs> okay, Councilmember Myers, Councilmember Brown, and then Councilmember Glover. Yeah, thank you everyone for everything you do for all the employees of the city. Um, yeah, I just, um, I had a question a little around the city serve program. Um, is there, I mean, that seems to be, you know, one of the stellar programs. I know that's been around for a long, long time. Um, do we have an idea of how many people are actually, use, I mean, are we, you know, recruiting through city serve? Is it? You know, I ha here's what I have to tell you. I don't know very much at all about city serve, and, okay. and I don't know if Joe, you want to have an opportunity to speak to that. If you know anything, you could write up here to the podium. Everyone, I'm Joe McMullen. There is a quarterly report published for, as an FYI to you from oh, okay. City Serve that would tell you the exact number of people. I don't know it in my head either. Okay. So. Okay. I will look that up. Thanks. Um, that was, I think, my main question. I think I'll have maybe some questions tomorrow, but thank you. Sure. Thanks for all your work. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Glover. Uh, thank you, as always, for all the work you do. And thank you for uh, to your staff for being here. Uh, it helps us have an audience in the chambers on a day like this. <laughs> so I hope you're finding it interesting. Um, so just a quick question, or actually it's a follow-up, maybe a comment more uh, related to uh, Vice Mayor Cummings' question uh, in terms of tracking. It, it might also be interesting to, and it, you know, it's a little more complicated tracking, but it, you know, it'd be interesting to, to understand better um, where the ethnic diversity breakout and gender diversity breakout is in terms of uh, wage scales. Um, so where um, workers fall, I know we've talked about the gender pay gap, um, but maybe an ethnic diversity to the, ex to the extent that's possible to, to track, and I think it, it probably is, it sounds like, based on the new systems that you're working with. We're exploring it, so I, yeah. if I could try to figure okay. out if that's available. So yeah. it would just be interesting to see that as just a deeper dive uh, at some point. Mm -hmm. And But thank you for providing this. Okay, Councilman McLeaver. Great presentation, good numbers. Uh, love the intention, especially with the diversification of the city in general. I was curious, um, looking at the numbers that you presented here, where were you getting those um, for specifically the city population? From the EOC committee report that uh, they pull from, I believe it's from the census data, Joe, again, I'm sorry, the data from the census data. Okay, I'm, it's just maybe, uh, I'm just looking at the census website right now, um, and it says that the African American or black population is 1.4%. So I'm just curious why that's presented as 2%. Um, and then along with that, um, uh, it's interesting because I was reviewing the most, at least to my understanding, it's the most recent report from the Equal Opportunity Employment Committee and their analysis of the, of the staffing is a little bit different. Uh, the numbers that they came up with were that there's only 1.2% 
uh, oh no, there we go. Um, it was the Native American population uh, of people that are working for the city. The Equal Opportunity Employment Commission says that there are 0% of Native American men and 0.4% of Native American women. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious how you got 4%. I don't know how I got four. I got it from the report. So maybe I typed in rather than 0.04, I typed in four, four. But the other, the, the African American, that could just be from rounding. Yeah, that, I think so. I can check out. But I pulled it directly from there, so I might have typed it in wrong. Okay, yeah, I just want to make sure that that's known for my colleagues as well. It's not 4%, it's 0.4% uh, with the Native American population. Um, the other thing, too, in the uh, report was that there was very little change in the percentage of ethnic groups. The proportion of white males increased slightly and the white female employees decreased slightly. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a little concerning uh, for, for me personally also with that analysis. And then also um, talking about gender pay equity, there's, um, there was a really rough calculation that was done with regards to um, Transparent California. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, I'm sure you're probably familiar with, with that. Yeah, um, so it just seemed that there was a severe disparity between male and female uh, employees, especially the highest paid employees of the city, where there were look at, you know, we're looking somewhere in the lines of 80 to 90 percent of the people that are paid as some of the top pay receivers of the city are men, um, and usually it's between 10 and 16 percent of them are women. So, do you know what active steps are being taken to address? that severe gender pay uh, disparity? Well, I have to look at it because I think if you just look at it statistic-wise, I have to know exactly what you're looking at because that's, that grand sweeping statement doesn't do justice of being able to give you a good policy discussion to look at it and say, okay, we have 13 uh, department heads and how many females are on there and whether their salary ranges. And if you look at even the, the salary ranges, we, here we have an assistant city manager who's you know a female. At one time when I first came here, the predominant executives were women. Mm -hmm. you know. So I think the, the shift in tide, if I looked at it individually, I could probably give you a, an answer that wasn't off the cuff, right. but was more meaningful. Great, um, well maybe we could connect sometime and get that info. Um, and the last thing was the trainings. So uh, definitely there's a lot of uh, wonderful options for trainings. Okay. Notice that unfortunately some of them are scheduled at times that make it really difficult to attend. Um, I was also wondering, uh, from my experiences of the trainings, they've not been very interactive. Mm. It's a lot of it's been sitting and watching a web <coughs> webinar or something like that. So. What's the feasibility of us getting more interactive? Like, for example, racial bias or implicit bias in that conversation. Um, there's organizations and groups in Santa Cruz that actually facilitate interactive uh, racial bias training as opposed to just watching a webinar. So what's the feasibility of implementing things like that? Actually, we do. I attended our racial bias training that we had just a couple of weeks ago over at the PD. Uh, and the two presenters that we brought in, I can't remember from the, the the organization was very interactive. They had us up and moving around and cross, crossing different areas and up on the board writing. It was extremely interactive. And so unfortunate, it sounds like maybe you attended a class because some are just mm, cut and dry, <laughs> no fun. Can't stand those either. Uh, but I would say many of ours are they're live presenters. And, oh, great. and I try to attend as many as I can so I can give feedback and say, mm, that one's not so great. And these are better. So I would say if you had an experience and I take there's evaluations. If you had an experience that was not good, we, my, my lead trainer, Nico, he will, we're on that. Yeah, Nico's great. Absolutely. He, he's great. But yeah, I'm sorry you might have had that experience, but like the one I attend, the racial bias training uh, with the two, two individuals was phenomenal. Great. It was great. Uh, then the last thing is um, wellness is something that's super important in mm -hmm. employment and HR and just in general in our community. Um, usually it gets overlooked with uh, the workflows that we all have and how much responsibilities we carry. Um, there was a wellness class that was coming up that was talking about the importance of sleep. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, that class was canceled due to a lack of attendance. So I was curious um, if there's an intentional step in prioritizing wellness trainings and making it so that they're more accessible or more readily filled. But that's a really good class. If people don't understand how important sleep is, it's, 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 that was disappointing, I have to say. Uh, in terms of our efforts to try to get more attendance, I'm sure we could do a better 
you know, outreach job. Um, I think the wellness piece is probably put aside for some people as opposed to doing the leadership training classes. It's sort of more of an afterthought and not understanding how important that is. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's why we don't eliminate them. But I really do think we could probably do a better job in making it more convenient. We try to do lunch hours. We try to go to the different sites as well. Uh, PD and fire are really hard for us to get at, so we try to alter our schedules to meet meet them as well. <laughs> but I th anything we could always do a better job on on that particular area. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you, Councilmember Matthews. I just want to acknowledge your real dedication to career development, giving people a path, and um, and then moving forward to that succession planning. Mm -hmm. I know it's thank you. taken a lot of attention, and it, and it shows in the numbers too. So. Yes, we've had a lot of internal promotions, and they just it's improved. Great to see. And um, can we get a copy of your slides too? Yes, you Thank can, you. definitely. Okay, Council Member Crum. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, just a couple follow up. Are, are you familiar with um, SB 179 that was signed by Jerry Brown? Which one is that? You that, have to that, tell that me. That is the um, non binary as a third gender. I'm just yes. wondering. Yes. That, so we have no one who would, uh, well, do we have that on our? employment application, can you check off a box that says non-binary rather than male or female? Oh, is that on, have we updated our applications? I don't think we have updated them yet. So, but we also do, we try to really encourage people to do online. And I believe it, that ability is online, but I, I'll have to follow up on that. It's a huge issue at the university. Yeah. And I, I noticed 27% of the folks at, um, surveyed um, uh, teenagers as non, you know, non-binary. Um, the other thing yeah, is I have to say, you, you don't identify actually that on your application. That's voluntary. Yeah. That's the, the piece that's at the, the tearaway. So that's, I'll have to check on that for you. Thank you. Um, so I, I did, I, and I was hoping maybe to get a little bit from you and um, count because I, I, I did the Transparent California and uh, f you, you identified the five people who are the highest paid employees in the city out of the top 50, f 45 are men and five are women. Out of the 100, 93 are men and seven are women. Out of the top 100 employees, top paid employees in the city of Santa Cruz, out of 100, seven are women. Out of 150, it's 14 are women. And out of 200, 28 are, are women. And out of 250 city employees, 39 are women, 16%. And I just go along with uh, Councilmember Glover, uh, what we're doing to um, promote, you know, uh, and, and, and have a program or uh, organize, you know, like I asked the fire chief as well, if we if we have something active that we're promoting to include more, you know, and, and also you, you mentioned there's programs within the city to get people, you know, up in, you know, different classifications and stuff and, and get them more training so they can take higher positions. How is that working for the females? I mean, is there any data that you could point to that said the X amount of people took this program and were promoted and, you know, on a male, female? No, I actually haven't done that level of analysis, but it definitely would be worthwhile. But when I look around just anecdotally and I think about the, the new um, gal that just took over for the uh, wastewater treatment plant, that's traditionally a male position and now we have a female engineer that uh, has taken over that, that position. Uh, so then, and we also just had in our parks and rec, we just had a, a internal recruitment and uh, promotion of a, a female. So we're not specifically targeting gender we, in terms of how we're looking at um, our promotion and recruitments, minimum qualifications, experience. That's, that's our first level, but it's how, what, what does that level say? What is, what's that piece and is that opening or closing doors? So that's, I think, where we need to really focus on and, and look to see so we can make those opportunities more available. We are, again, more heavily dominated by a male industry. So again, off the top of my head, knowing the same studies that you've looked at and who are those positions. So when you look across the city and say, okay, where are those, those highest paid salaries that you uh, refer to. And uh, I know you were looking at fire when we only have one female. You look at PD where we don't have any females in that upper echelon, which is the deputy chiefs and the lieutenants. So again, that's why it's more male dominated. We have our public works department, which you know there's initiatives through the local schools of getting more females into mathematics and engineering, because so, that's really where it's got to start and rise. So in those upper echelons, you also probably see like our assistant um, 
public works director and public works, you know, again, male dominated industries and how, but opening the doors to females. Of course, when you look at HR, right, typically, you know, female, uh, but y then you have an IT director who is a female, which is typically male dominated. So I think our efforts uh, haven't been pr as necessarily say proactive, uh, but certainly try not to be, you know, uh, biased in, in our abilities. But now I think education for us has taught us how to look at new ways, and that's what we're trying to do. So I don't have the data and the trends for you, but. Um, no worries, I mean, yeah. worry, yeah, but I'm worried as a parent, I have two daughters, and um, and I know one of them's in tech, and it breaks down 70-30, and unless you work for a company that has a, a, a program and is assertive about going out for um, female applicants, it, it makes it more difficult. You're gonna have a lot more men. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last part. You're gonna have a lot more men if you don't actively recruit females and, 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 and see that if you, mm -hmm. I mean, would you say that's a, that, that's a problem? I'm using the 2017 um, uh, Transparent California out of the, I didn't get to 500, I just counted up the 250. The first 250, 84% are male, 16% are women. Of course that's disappointing. I'd love to see a, a, a female fire captain, a female chief, a female, sure. Because we bring a different perspective, right? You're, what you bring to the table, whether you are gay, lesbian, your racial diversity, you're female, male, binary, you bring a completely different perspective to the table. And that's, so you may have your leader there, uh, but also the team around you. It's important to have a diversified team around you. So I see what you're saying, because you, you bring um, something else, a different, different piece to the table. And but, it's, yeah. it's a model too, I mean, yeah. that was, thanks a lot, appreciate mm -hmm. it. Can I just add the, uh, as uh, Lisa mentioned, you know, public safety is really the, the big challenge and it's not unique to Santa Cruz. I mean, virtually every community in the country sort of has a challenge with uh, being able to attract uh, um, women in particular to public safety, fire and police. Uh, with respect to police, I think we have been making some strides there and, you know, the chief will present later. So we do have actually, you know, at least in my history being here, probably more officers, female officers than we've ever had. Um, fire, you know, it's it, that's been probably the more, the more challenging one. Uh, so that's what kind of kind of skews the numbers for particularly for public safety agencies or cities like ours that have large public safety agencies. It's just a, a big challenge overall. Okay, thank you. Thank you, okay, Lisa. Great. Thank you. And I, you know, I'll just add by saying I appreciate your your comment around the CTE and the career technical education starting early and navigating mm -hmm. some of our social kind of constraints and dynamics and uh, really important. Yeah, important to get that uh, seed planted early, That's particularly right. in relation to STEM work for for young women. Um, we'll go ahead and, and uh, break for lunch now. We'll return around 1.30 here. And when we get back from lunch, we'll have our city manager department presentation, library, police, and then end the day with water. Okay. So we'll see you back here at 1.30. Thanks. shift, it, it was a deputy city manager. We have our city clerk administrator, Bonnie, right here, and next to her, Julia, our deputy city clerk administrator. We have a records coordinator, Kelly. We have two admin assistants who really carry the day. That's Rose, Anna, and Sherry. 
And then over to the other side, um, we have a couple of other special divisions, and that is our sustainability and climate action, and that's, of course, Tiffany, whom you hear from quite frequently, and then special events. So you can see that our office has some core administrative functions, but we also do a, couple, a few special things. And then to talk a little bit more about what the department delivers, um, you can see some information here on the slide, and I wanted to provide a little more context for you. So our office, we, we do have quite a large charge for the amount, the 12.5 FTE that we have. We oversee the city's $200 million budget. We oversee the day-to-day -day operations of about 12 departments, and that's split between myself and the City Manager Martin Bernal. We ensure internal coordination. We ensure that council direction is played out across the city. And we focus on the work plan implementation. So you have that two year work plan and it is our charge to make sure that the major categories of housing, public safety, and well-being, those goals are being carried forward. We also help with council support, and that takes the form of consulting with you, taking in your ideas, talking about policy concepts, um, creating agenda reports, correspondence, uh, endless mayor's proclamations, and other certificates of appreciation. So a lot just to, to handle both the ceremonial and the policy function of the city council. We also maintain, we're the official records keeper for the entire city, and I really hands off to across from me here is, you know, Bonnie and her team manage our 150 years of records, which includes everything from preservation of very fragile old uh, minutes books that we have back in the vault to making sure we have all the contemporary action you take available digitally as soon as possible because our community wants to see that. So there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes with Bonnie's team just to maintain the records <laughs> for the public. And they respond to hundreds of Public Records Act per year. Um, we have a very curious community. They have lots of questions for us. So we actually get a lot of those coming in. I'd say far more than the average community of our size. And so we manage that within the deadlines set forth under law. Um, we deal with state filings like the Form 700s. And what's our compliance rate this year? 98%. 98% compliance rate, which is amazing because there's over a thousand of those that come in. All, you know, a lot of staff across the city are advisory bodies. And so Bonnie's managing a 98% compliance rate by the deadline. I mean, that really is tremendous. So thanks so much, Bonnie, for your efforts, your gentle reminders for all of us to get our filings in on time. Um, and then another thing we do are the elections. And that's a, that's a significant thing to manage. There's a lot of legal requirements, documentation, resolutions, all of that. Um, and we've had some complex, very intricate issues. And um, again, the city clerk's team has really handled that so well. Um, another thing we do in our office, special events permitting. So we're very excited to be part of that vibrant part of our community, special events. We have so many, as you know here, races, parades, festival. We do film permits, you know, with the US film that was so huge, that was permitted through our office. And uh, triathlon, so that really is a, a key element to the, what makes Santa Cruz special. We also have the independent police auditor function out of our office. That's a contract with an individual overseen by the, the city manager that works within our police department. He's on site about twice a month. He reviews our internal um, audits and investigations and provides an opinion around that. He also conducts ride-alongs. He goes out with our officers and provides you know, best practices and feedback to our police management pretty continuously. So that's, that's out of our office. Um, we also manage the over $1 million in social services grants that the council um, uh, gives out every year. And to that effect, we are in the third year of the CORE program. So CORE, we shifted from a more of a historical practice of funding that was based on needs as they arose from time to time to a very strategic way of approaching social service funding investment. And that was, I won't go into a lot of depth here, but that was a, about a year long effort effort to work with strategic plans around areas of need, homelessness, um, uh, services for youth, um, um, mental, mental health issues. There are strategic plans around that, and from that we built objectives and tried to get to a system where we have strategy and objectives and evidence-based practices drive social investment. So we're in the third year of that process, and that's something that our office ha um, helped pilot with the County of Santa Cruz, and now is in its first evolution. Lessons learned, how do we improve? And more of that will be coming forward to you in the course of the next 12 months. 
Um, moving forward, we have uh, next on the list, climate action. And I mentioned a bit, Dr. Tiffany Wise West um, does so much for our city of our size. We really are a leader in the state doing um, incredible work on climate resiliency, energy savings, all kinds of planning efforts. You know, she stays very busy. Um, in addition, she's working on flood, flood management work. So there's a lot of coordination with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on our levy as a, as a flood project. And that affects the insurance rates for our community. And so Tiffany is also carrying that body of work now too. And uh, you'll be hearing more from her. Um, another element that our office does is producing your meetings here today. So you spend a lot of time in these meetings, we know that. It also takes a lot of time to produce and manage them. All the work ahead of time, compiling the agenda reports, putting together the packets, getting them out timely, ensuring we're translating uh, community public comment to a place where you can see it and the community can see it, managing the meetings, producing minutes, producing you know live streaming. It, the, uh, the city has done so much, I think, in the past five, six years for public transparency, that you can be sitting at home and really be alongside the council as you're working through policy. So um, huge appreciation to the city clerks for doing that. And um, the main public counter and phones. You know, so right now, um, I believe we have Anna over there. Is it Anna? Yes. Ready for there for anyone who walks into City Hall with any question under the sun. And she will direct that person, she will get them what they need, and we do it so professionally. I just have such appreciation for um, all, everyone who helps out um, as need be. And we are that switchboard for the city. So you, someone walks in and you have to know the answer to basically every question, or at least know where to send someone. And that takes a great deal of skill and dedication. So we have so much appreciation for that. Um, we also do special projects, and our largest special project these days has been homelessness. As you all know, we've been on um, quite a journey this year so far, and our office helps coordinate that effort, and um, we've been very engrossed in that. But we, we, we take up whatever the issue um, at the time that needs that executive leadership or that citywide leadership will take that on. We also do the Cowell Beach Working Group out of our office, um, downtown streets team, you know, is managed out of our office, so a lot of special initiatives. And then two more on this list, there is the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women that is um, staffed out of our office and has been for at least 10, uh, 10 12 years. And then um, finally, we have JPA representation. So the city is a member of several JPAs. We um, are a part of the library, as you know, the 911 board, the animal shelter, we have a regional shelter, and Monterey Bay Community Power. And that takes uh, membership out of our office, usually Martine or I, um, representing the city at those meetings. So we, we definitely stay busy in the city manager's office. And then our budget, here's how our budget roughly breaks down. Um, and I know you have black and white copies, so a way to navigate this is that the 1% at the top, that corresponds with the CPVAW budget. And then as you move clockwise around it, it goes in order of what you see on your legend. So the 1% is CPVAW, the city clerk is 15%, police auditor 1%, city manager 28%. Um, so you can see that of this, um, our total budget, uh, let's see, 28% plus 15, um, 43% is the staffing administration. So the bulk of our budget are other things, usually contracts, um, all of the $1 million in social services grants, the $1 million in social services contracts, which includes our downtown outreach worker, the mental health liaisons, et cetera, are in our budget. So uh, really the majority of our budget is um, these outside contracts and services that we're part of. And uh, finally, um, before I, I sign off, I just wanted to highlight some major goals that we are looking forward in for at fiscal year 2020. And, um, there are many, we do lots of things as I went over very, very quickly, but some of the top ones we're really eyeing for the upcoming fiscal year are first, to facilitate strategic planning. It's time to update the council's two-year work plan that expires at the end of this fiscal year. Again, that was built around the strategic areas of housing, public safety, and community public safety and well-being and infrastructure. So updating that paradigm, we have a new council. So going through that process and council's already pro provided direction and I think we are meeting this month for the first session to get that going. So we're eager to help you in that. Um, second is supporting a couple of, of specific policy work you've directed, the health and all policy subcommittee, as well as the community advisory Committee on Homelessness. So we're getting that up and going too, and that will be a, probably a large amount of work coming out of our office to support those. 
The third one is, of course, and always working on our fiscal sustainability plan and eliminating our deficit. This is one of the most significant and serious issues that we're facing as a city, and this is gonna require a lot of attention out of our office to work on that. The next one is homelessness. So the council has a plan on homelessness, the Homelessness Coordinating Committee recommendations. So continuing to <coughs> advance those and work on year-round shelter, there's no doubt um, this is something that, that needs to happen. So as we're shifting out of um, the encampment into other sheltering, what is the, the long range plan? How do we get there in partnership with the county and other jurisdictions and with state funding as well? Um, the next one is converting the council agenda and records management system. So I believe this was touched on earlier in your discussion, I think in the IT budget, but we need to convert our system which is no longer being supported, it's aging out into a new system. And so that's that will be our public record system, our agenda management system. It's a big changeover for us. It will require, I think, come with a lot of improvements. We're very excited to be able to present an even more dynamic agenda to you, but it will take a lot of work out of our office to manage that transition that touches every department. Um, and then finally, just continuing our climate action and sustainability efforts. This, there is urgency around this. Council has directed that urgency, and um, we have a lot of work to do on it. So that is a very brief um, nutshell. I know you have a lot more presentations um, ahead of you, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the presentation, and excuse my tardiness to returning. I had a phone call. Are, are there any members of the public who wanted to address the council on this presentation at this time? come forward and you'll have up to two minutes how much two two minutes yeah uh, my name is Nicholas Whitehead uh, in in the past I used to investigate allegations against the police and I was I was very fair-minded and I issued reports on that subject so I know what I'm doing in that area I'm very interested in the independent auditor uh, police order what are the um, metrics by which the performance is measured. Is, is there a record of how many uh, citizens needed that service and how many of them were satisfied and how many were dissatisfied? Um, it, are there any metrics on the uh, activities of that particular officer or uh, attorney, whoever he is? I'd be interested to hear that. Thank you. Are there any other members of the community who'd like to address us at this time? Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and return back to the council. Um, we'll have opportunity for questions for uh, council members of staff, and uh, we know you're small and mighty, and we appreciate all the support and work you've been up to for these past several months, so has not gone unnoticed. Um, if you do have the answer to the question that was raised by the community member, we could go ahead and address that at this time. If not, we can maybe get back to that person. I will find uh, Mr. Whitehead, correct? Yeah, I, I will find him afterwards and talk with him okay. about the program, how it operates, and um, our independent police auditor is Robert Aronson, and he's widely available to anyone in the community. He, we have a web page on our website, so anyone can reach out with him directly. So I will pass on the information, because I think he could also hear from Mr. Aronson, and I'm happy to talk to him him about how it works. Great, thank you. Okay, Councilman Burke. As far as I know, the police auditor is going to present to the Public Safety Committee on May 21st at 10 a.m. So you might want to put that in your calendar. May 21st, 10 a.m., I think I'm right. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. But that's not an open session. Well, that's not an open session. That's so Excuse session. me, oh, no, excuse it's me. not, yeah. Strike that. But, um, but Council Member Crone, what we do is the Public Safety Committee issues a report that is presented to the, the, the community with your observations um, at the end of that. So that is a public document. Thank you. All right, are there any questions from council members at this time? Councilmember Brown. Thank you for the presentation and all of your work. I think this is the department that we most directly engage with on a regular basis and just wanna give my appreciation for all of the work you do responding to um, you know, many, many uh, requests for assistance and information that um, makes our jobs easier. Um, just a quick question on the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women budget. I see, and I think I, I just wanna make sure that I recall how this is working. Um, the budget increased as amended, and was that, um, that was the amendment, so it was 30, um, 34,416, um, the adopted budget was the same, 39, 
thousand, approximately thirty nine k, which is the same request as this year. Um, but we amended that to fifty two, a little over fifty two thousand. Um, and my recollection was this was related to women's self defense, <coughs> which was run through the CPVAW. Um, the line item is the end, but now it's going back, or is that? I'm just wondering if you could clarify on that what that's about. Yeah, yeah I appreciate that amendment. question, and I don't. I, I think that was the study that the CPV. Yeah. Oh, the they study just got extra funding. Got for. it. Okay, thank you. One time. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions of? Tough. Okay. Being done. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for being flexible for the time. Sure. As well as our next presentation, which is our library presentation. So I believe we have Susan here to present on the library. Hi, Susan. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Susan Nimitz. I'm the director of the Santa Cruz Public Library. It's a pleasure to be with you um, to talk a little bit about the libraries today. I just want to refer that the libraries are um, governed by a joint powers authority. We have four members, the city administrators for Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley, Capitola, and then the county administrator. And we're operating under a fourth amendment to our JPA. Our original JPA goes back to 1996. Our JPA does not include the city of Watsonville or the Watsonville library system. And um, most, uh, most decisions by the JPA need to be unanimous for things to move forward. So things like the budget and staffing and scope of services require a 4-0 vote. I just wanted to talk a little bit about our accomplishments. And um, we're gonna get into Measure S a little bit later, but um, we've been working hard on buildings. Um, in the last year, we have begun construction of the Felton and Capitola branches. We've created designs for La Selva Beach and Boulder Creek. And we're hoping to have designs for Garfield Park, Branch of Forty, and Live Oak done by July 1st. We've received council endorsement on the downtown plan. I know that's been controversial, but it took a lot of time. We developed <laughs> scope and partnership agreements with County Parks and Recs on the Live Oak Annex, and we've created some criteria documents for the Aptos Library. We last year eliminated kids' fines, and I'm really, really proud of that, honestly. It's hard to do, I know, to take a negative to a, a one's budget, but really looking at the research, children having fines reduces their access to the library. And our board and their good judgment allowed us to eliminate kids' fine fines in year one's gone great. We're developing a brand new summer reading program where the, we're moving to books as prizes. We're proud of that. We've expanded school partnerships uh, extensively, created STEAM programs, and uh, worked on programs for kids that we haven't been serving as well as we'd like, particularly Spanish-speaking children in our community. We've replaced all our voice over IP hardware throughout the library system. We've run our our, all of our staff through a digital skills refresh program and 75 of our employees have completed that. We're in the process of completing a whole new service model so that as the branches come online, um, we have a new way of providing the services. Um, we've completed round two of an employee innovation program. This is also something we worked with the JPA on um, where we allow employees to write grants for improvements within the library. I think we provided 17 grants, 17 grants this year, and it's really allowing our staff to do things um, sometimes potentially outside the the daily confines of their jobs, but we've just had incredible success, and it really is building uh, morale for change in the library system. Um, and we've worked with the Friends on their infrastructure. If you look over the last 18 months, the Friends have raised over $3 million across the 10 libraries, which is remarkable. Like all departments, we've kind of taken it hard in the Great Recession. Our staffing peaked in 2009 at 120 FTE, and right now we have 92 FTE running the same 10 libraries. 
As a result, we've moved in the last three years from a highly centralized structure to a regional structure. The West region consider, it includes downtown Garfield Park and Branza 40, the city libraries. We also have an East region and a North region. And then we do extensive outreach through the jail system and through our bookmobiles. Um, our bookmobile is primarily hitting place-bound adults, primarily seniors. Um, we do go to um, agricultural workers, housing, and some of the affordable housing units where people just don't have physical access to the library. So, you know, we do the traditional things. We do print and digital collections. We do reference services. We do computers and Wi-Fi and printing. You'd be shocked at how many people in our community use those services. Um, it's, it's stunning. And the people using the services aren't necessarily the people you think are using the services. A typical user is a 50-year-old male. Um, and then we provide study and learning spaces so you can come in and check out a program room or a study spot, um, tutor someone in the library. I think the place that libraries are really changing is they're moving from reading organizations to learning organizations. And we're really focusing on five areas of learning. Early literacy, pretty traditional for us. Student success, digital literacy, life skills, we'll talk a little more about that, and creative aging. I just literally did this slide this morning, so none of this was planned. I just thought, I'm gonna look at what's going on in the city's libraries today. So downtown, we have the outreach workers' office hours, per, um, serving primarily our um, patrons experiencing homelessness. We have office hours in our Vet, Vet Connect Center, which is interesting because I know the Vet Center is a block away, but we do a remarkable amount of business in the library, connecting veterans to resources in our communities. And the Genealogical Society has their monthly meeting and they actually staff the library five hours a day, seven days a week. And all three of those services are volunteers or partnerships with other entities where we're embedding them in the library and expanding what the library can do. Today we also have a genealogical workshop on your Polish ancestors, if you have them. I think there's still time. Um, we have a do-it-yourself craft for children that happened this morning. Tonight we have a conservation for conser conversation for change. We're trying to do sort of um, community interactive groups. Um, this is a group that comes in and gets the community to talk about its issues. And tonight's topic is tribalism. So I, I think that's a very interesting and timely topic. And then we also provide technical assistance at the downtown library for each hour that we're open. It's the only library where we've been able to do so. B40 had a totter, toddler time, a literacy program this morning, Lego fun this afternoon after school. They're doing a homework help tutoring session. Garfield Park has a lecture tonight on how galaxies die. So you can see the kind of spectrum of educational program that we're providing in a single day in just three of our 10 libraries. If you carry this over a week, over a month, over a year, it's an incredible place where the community learns together, where they connect with one another, where we partner with the resources in our community to bring in the skills and knowledges that our com community has and provide an opportunity for people to share that. Our funding um, comes from primarily sales tax, which is the blue, blue pie. The red is the city's general fund, and the other three jurisdictions um, provide property tax. We also get a small amount from fines and fees. Unfortunately, we're still charging adults and gifts. The city pays money directly out of its general fund for the public library system, in addition to sales taxes from the city area. Right now, um, it's about 1.67 million annually. There's an agreement between the four entities that the city's share will go up $70,000 a year over a five-year period, which ends in 2022. To offset, though, that cost, 
the library purchases its overhead services from the city. So the library employees are city employees and the library uses the city's HR offices, financial offices, risk management, a whole series of that infrastructure. For the privilege of doing so, we pay the city $462,000. And that's been going up about 5% annually. We are asking in our 2020 budget of the JPA for an additional five FTE. Because our staff is run through the city, you will see this five FTE showing up in um, your accounting. And the five FTE really are to help us manage um, this growth in library space that's gonna happen in the upcoming year when the Capitola Library and the Felton Library open up. We're also working with the JPA to add $50,000 a year to our capital maintenance budget we're hoping to do it over eight years so that we have enough funds to maintain the buildings we have. Our work plan is gonna be the hardest work year of my professional career. I need to say this out loud. I keep saying to the staff, no vacations after January 1st. Um, we have to open Felton, which I think is five times bigger than the current library. We have to open Capitola, which is three times bigger. We're going to close La Selva Beach, Boulder Creek. Our hope is to close Garfield Park for a nine month renovation and Branza 40 for a 12 month renovation. So it's kind of gonna be fruit basket upset, ups, upset with staff and programs. You're probably gonna see us doing more programming out in the community while facilities are down. We're gonna add hours to the remaining libraries that are open to try to cover the service. Um, but it should be an intense year. We're also going to um, complete renovations at Scotts Valley and Live Oak. We believe we can stay open at those two branches. We're still working on the Live Oak Annex, Aptos, and the Downtown Library. We're gonna implement this new service model that we've been working on all year. We're developing a new community-led programming model, which is gonna allow more and more of the community to lead programming, where we just facilitate their leadership. And we've got a whole bunch of infrastructure to do like approve JPA leases with each jurisdiction, create a scope policy, figure out how we allow people to use the buildings after hours when we're not there. And I just wanted to show you hours, you can see that as of July 1st, it'll be the first set. Um, both Branza 40 and Garfield Park are planned to be open 36 hours a week with downtown at 58. In November 1st, uh, La Selva Beach uh, and Felton will go down. On February 1st, Felton will open and Branza 40 and Garfield Park will close. And then on April 1st, Capitola will open. <laughs> Measure S, thank you. I need to thank my um, public representatives because there's a lot of people in this community who worked really, really hard to ensure that Measure S passed. This is not the sales tax measure. This is the measure that brought $67 million in capital funding for the 10 branches of the Santa Cruz Public Library System. And I know some of the people sitting at this table worked tirelessly for this to occur. Many of our buildings hadn't been touched in 30 years, some as long as 50 years. It was really important that for our future that we invest in the buildings. It passed in 2016. The interesting piece is the money didn't go to the JPA. It actually went to the four jurisdictions. So each city and the county are responsible for the physical facilities that are being remodeled or built, and the ownership remains local, though the obligation to maintain it will be an obligation of the Joint Powers Board. Um, it provided 10 million to Capitola, Santa Cruz got 31.25 million, Scotts Valley 3.75 million, and the county 32.5 million. I will say that many of the other ju jurisdictions are bringing additional resources to um, these projects because there's not enough money uh, 
Um, not only construction costs have uh, been growing monumentally, um, but my understanding of Measure S is they really went out and asked what, what would the taxpayer be willing to fund. They didn't necessarily base it on the individual needs of the individual branches. So I just wanted to say that we have um, public meetings coming up in Garfield and Branza 40. I think Garfield's at seven at night, Branza 40's at six at night. I would love for you all to come. We're gonna show people a concept and get their reaction to it. With Garfield Park, it's one of the original Carnegie libraries. It's a beautiful building. Um, it actually hasn't had an upgrade and is um, predominantly ADA accessible. There's some still some ADA work we need to do, but the infrastructure of the building's really <coughs> solid. But I think it's been overloved. The interiors haven't been done. There's things like bookcases in front of all the windows. And so I think um, we can do some really amazing things bringing it back to almost the original style of when it was created 100 years ago. Branch of 40 is another actual gem. Um, the bones on that building are gorgeous. If you've never been inside, please go. It's a mid-century modern with this beautiful vaulted wood ceiling. And again, I think we wanna bring that building a little bit back to its era and um, remodel it so that it has a programming space because it really doesn't have that kind of learning space and it's big enough to have it, um, but maintain that beautiful character of um, that, that mid-century modern building. It's really fun now because all the furniture is mid-century modern. So I think we could do some really great things with it. And then I just wanna say, you know, the downtown branch is still under discussion. Um, the city council last September endorsed the DLAC recommendation for a mixed use project and made some changes to the parking structure, but we have not yet moved forward with the community outreach or um, hiring someone to help us with design. And so that remains an issue for this council to work on. And that's all I have to say today. <laughs> Thank you, Susan, and to the team throughout our entire county providing these incredible services to so many different people, and I really appreciated the snapshot, so thank you for thank doing you. that. Um, before we go to questions from the council, are there any members of the community who wanted to address us on the library presentation? Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and return back. Are there any council members who have questions for Susan at this time? I just wanted to get that. What was the overall? I see the um, city contributes 1.212 million. What's the overall budget for the library? 14.3 4 million. I don't want to undersell the city's share though because the city is participating in the sales tax. And it's a quarter of a cent. Any other questions? Okay. Come, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. Thank you for that presentation. I had one question. You mentioned that um, you all offer services for veterans and also for some homeless services. Do you all have any funding coming in to help support those services at all? Or is there an opportunity to apply for grants to help support the library around the services that are provided there? Um, yeah, yes, we have. Uh, we started our Veterans Connect program from a grant from the state. Um, and it was the state library that provided the grant. We are now running um, totally on volunteer support, but the truth of the matter is they gave us the startup funds to create the space. They gave us the computer and some materials. Um, and then it gave us time to develop the partnerships we needed. So I actually think it's a sustainable model for us into our future. Um, Homeless services has been more difficult. I think our strategy has been to partner with entities in the community who in some ways are um, better equipped to handle some of the, the, the research questions, people experiencing homelessness experience in the library. So the ability to embed the downtown uh, uh, workers in the library has actually helped us so incredibly. And I, I think it's really essential that the library become part of the network of people that are working on these issues. Um, in communities where there aren't services for the homeless, the public library often becomes the day center. And so I think it's just really essential that we work 
together as part of that team to make sure that the uh, people experiencing homelessness in our community have access to the resources they need. I do think there are some people that are willing to, the library comes from a position of high trust. Um, we don't ask people for their name, we don't ask things of them. So we find that our, our partners and, and even our reference desk sometimes make progress on difficult issues just because there's a, a trust and openness within the library. Um, our hope is in the long run to inbred all sorts of programs and services within the library, almost to have a, a service center where an agency could come for two hours a week. You know, it could be healthcare navigation, it could be someone helping people with financial aid forms or Medicare Part B. But I think um, if we don't have those resources in the library, they come to the desk and ask the librarian for them. And we're not always as well equipped. And I think we can partner because we are an information resource for so many people in this community. And I think we ha right now we're working with about five or six agencies in the library. Um, tomorrow I know there's a, a housing navigator that's coming in for a few hours. Um, I also have to just say the variety of people experiencing homelessness that we see in the library is vast. And um, I think sometimes the community has an image of a single type of person, but we have parents with children, we have teenagers, we have a lot of college students who are living out of their cars. So um, I think we uh, play a really important role and we are not trying to be the day center, but we are trying to maintain our role as an information center for everyone in our community. Thank you. Oh, Councilmember Myers, and then did you? Okay, and then Councilmember Brown. Um, real quick, I just want to clarify: the five um, personnel, the five FTEs, are those um, across all branches, or are those where? Where are those <laughs> positions? I know it's hard with all your branches sort of doing lots of different things in the next few years, closing um, and opening. Uh, uh, Councilmember Myers, it's a really good question. Um, there are days that. Um, the JPA is a federation of four library systems and there are days it's a system. <laughs> and I prefer to con think of it as a system so that the five will be across all and help all. Um, the truth of the matter is that the justification for the five is the opening and growth of the Capitola and the Felton Libraries. I will say because of the five year commitment that was made three years ago, um, they would not affect the city's payment at, for the next two years at least. Um, all of the, we're actually recommending to the JPA deficit spending using some of our um, balances to pay for it over the next two years. The other issue, and this gets really complicated, is the county has held back some resources. So we're asking the county to commit those resources to the library in two years when this commitment is done, when this agreement is done. Okay, great, thank you. And um, I just am curious if you can just speak briefly about what the, the sort of the impact of library closures um, as you're either you know, remodeling or whatever it may be. Um, and I'm, you know, curious to just about our branch here. Um, so maybe just speak a little bit about how you get ready for that. What are the kinds of things that basically sort of get lost to the public during those processes? Um, and just, you know, if you could speak a little bit to that. It's hard to give you a short answer. Um, I did seven libraries in Minnesota, one at a time. So I really do not know what this is going to be like. Mm -hmm. um, there's a tremendous amount of work that has to go into shutting the library down. We go through the entire collection. We weed aggressively books that aren't going out. We send our best volumes to other libraries and overstock them so they can continue to be used. We store some. Um, we go, we do extensive planning about when you open, what the new collection's gonna look like. Um, we do a big furniture sale. Um, right now we're, we're buying furniture, fixtures, technology. Um, all of that needs to be set up to open. I don't 
know what it's gonna be like if we are forced to take down a library of this magnitude. Um, in Minnesota, when we took down our largest library, we ended up paying for a temporary warehousey thing for 18 months because it would have had such a huge impact on our programs and services. And the truth of the matter is most people, when they're getting um, a book from the library, they're often asking for it and it's coming from this location and getting sent to La Selva Beach. So it serves as our base warehouse for every library. Um, so we're gonna to have to have a long conversation. I'm not recommending temporary libraries in every other case because they're costly. And then you end up spending your bond money on a temporary facility and not on the building. And the building lasts for 30 years. Um, but if we have to close this, I'm not sure we can without real disruptions to services at all 10 branches. Um, and we think minimally a temporary facility would cost about three quarters of a million of dollars. Okay, thank you. And thanks for your presentation and everything you guys do. Librarians are heroes. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, my question was pretty much answered through Donna's question framed <laughs> a little differently, so thank you. But I did just wanna take a moment to say thank you. Librarians are heroes. Um, and I, anybody who doesn't visit the, the downtown library and the other branches, just I recommend checking books out, <laughs> going there. Even if it's not a book you need, you will find amazing collections. You will find uh, uh, librarians who are resources. I mean, every time I've checked out a book, I've had a recommendation for something else, um, alerting me to you know things, other things I might be interested in. It's uh, they're amazing resources, and you know, so proactively providing that um, information to us in such a you know um, aged, energetic way. It's like really fun. And so. when we get through Measure S, we're gonna knock your socks off. <laughs> <laughs> just you wait. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And I'll just echo, you know, having gone to reading time for some of the students and the services that you provide in partnership with the schools. It's, it's Will fantastic. you indulge me one thing? Yeah. Um, Janice O'Driscoll, who's my deputy director, um, is retiring at the end of June. Oh, um, and I just wanted to acknowledge her. Janice um, served as the interim library director through a really difficult time. And she's trained me in. And honestly, I, I, don't, I don't think I could have done it without her. And I just wanted to recognize Janice and all her hard work. Okay. Congratulations on your retirement, Janice. And thank you for your years of service. Yes. Okay, so that concludes our library presentation. Thank you very much for you and your team being here and, and conducting that presentation. So we'll go ahead and move on to our next presentation, which is our police department presentation. And we have Chief Mills here, amongst many others, um, to present. Good afternoon. Well, good afternoon, Council. While we're spinning up this uh, presentation, I think, um, I'll start off with a few comments. Um, we have several staff members here to help present uh, this information today, and uh, we're certainly proud of all that's been accomplished uh, this past year. It's been a very busy year for us after starting out with going through the process of trying to get what the community expects of the police department and going to a lot of community meetings. Uh, we now uh, have put that in place and, uh, and have marched forward. Uh, there's been an enormous workload uh, that's been done by the police department in spite of some significant staffing challenges. Uh, we've had up to 19 people at one point injured uh, or on light duty for various reasons, and most of that comes out of patrol. And as well as we've hired 22 people for uh, this year, including putting most of those people through the academy, which is an enormous expense, but you take that 40 people right out of the line staffing and it's, it hurts. And, uh, but we've managed it, we're on the upside now, a lot of these folks are getting out of the academy and uh, men and women are taking the field and that's uh, gonna hopefully bring a great deal of relief uh, to a uh, department that has really uh, stepped up to the plate in a big way. Um, 
We've also accelerated change. In the last year and a half, we have gone through an enormous amount of change. And just let me bring a couple of highlights for you. We've enhanced our de-escalation policies and procedures so that uh, we have the opportunity to resolve uh, some of these conflicts that we find ourselves in without heavy uses of force. Uh, we now make it mandatory that uh, 40 millimeters, for instance, are carried in the field. Those are sponge rounds that can um, stop people who might be armed with less than lethal weapons, such as a knife or a rake or a bat or a glass bottle. So those, that's a very important thing for us. So now those are now in the field. Uh, we've also put everybody through extensive de-escalation training uh, in our department, as well as we spread that to the community uh, for community members to also uh, figure out how to de-escalate and to um, bring some of these conflicts uh, down. Uh, as you well know, we've done a lot with neighborhood policing, and uh, neighborhood policing has become a uh, significant priority for us. We've had to reshape it uh, because of the staffing issues, but we've still carried it forward, and I'm really happy to say that Carter Jones and John Bush and Danny Forbes have just been stalwarts and, uh, and with how they've gotten to the community, worked with the community priorities, and now we have a very good system and plan in place. As part of that, um, this fall, we will be hosting the 29th annual uh, POP conference, Problem-Oriented Policing Conference right here in town. And that'll be exciting to continue to help push that agenda forward. One of the things that uh, the community uh, led us to and their officers, as we discussed, is creating our mission statement, which is safety through vigilance. That uh, being focused and understanding what the priorities of our community are and staying on top of those uh, those things to create a safe environment for everybody. And, um, and uh, as we do that, um, we are uh, continuing to move forward. Uh, what you have now is the, my technology guru here. She's a former um, geek squad, right? Yeah, former geek squad. So we're happy to have her most of the time. Uh, most of the time, I mean, all the time. <laughs> Uh, what you have in front of you is the organizational chart of the police department. And uh, I am really blessed because they have two very senior, very capable leaders in uh, Dan Filippo and Rick Martinez. Uh, both are just uh, bright, capable, experienced, understand the history of our city and the culture of our city and are able to help guide me as we make decisions jointly together to uh, push the department forward. Rick has all of operations, so everybody you see in uniform, which is about 70% of the department, is under Deputy Chief Martinez, uh, including neighborhood policing, patrol operations, community service officers, the rangers, and then our crime analysts. And then uh, Dan has um, all the plain clothes and civilian staff members, including our records section, our investigators, our professional standards unit, which is uh, internal affairs, and uh, in our property and evidence. And then of course we have Joyce and, uh, and our volunteer program, which has just been an enormous um, uh, boon for our department as they continue to pick up duties that uh, we just can't get to as police officers and are helping make our community safe. We just couldn't be more proud of that, of that program. So next up is um, our police expenditures by type, and I think that is going to be our wonderful PMA, Patricia Dodge. Uh, Deputy Chief Flippo sends his regrets. He had really hoped to present this to you today, but he is sick with a bad flu, so I hope he gets well soon. So this is, as you can see, a very high-level picture of how our budget is built. Um, we're all about our people, and I know you keep hearing that today. Um, but in our case, both when it comes to the work we do and the money we spend, it's, it's really going towards the people who are doing the work. So, 84% of our department's budget is going towards personnel costs. That includes our uh, liability payments towards the pension as well. So that's one slice. When it comes to that other 16%, uh, we wanted to give you a little bit of a close up of what that looks like and not to overwhelm you with too many numbers. But um, the 16% of the budget that's not personnel, the majority of that goes to our NETCOM joint power agreement. So that comes out of the police department budget. So overall, that's about 7% of the budget, but in terms of non-personnel, it's about 43%. 
Everything else is pretty small, vehicles, utilities. In terms of our major service contracts, uh, I won't go into a lot of detail about these, but for the most part, you can see that they're relatively modest in size with the exception of our 911 contract, which is super important for all of us. Um, and the second largest would be our private security contract with First Alarm. So those are our neighborhood site-specific uh, security contracts. This is how we spend our money. Um, a huge portion of our money is spent on police patrol, staff and patrol, followed by investigations. We've got our records department, administration, police community services, police traffic, and park services. <clears throat> so instead of going into a lot of detail about what each of these teams does, um, we're going to give you a little sense of what it's like to spend a day with the folks that work for these teams. So we'd like to invite you to do a little ride along with us here, um, beginning with the patrol officer. And just as an aside, we wanna invite all of you to do this in real life, anytime you're interested. It's a great way to learn about the job. So I'm going to talk about Officer Taylor Trueblood, who's here with us today. He was born and raised in Santa Cruz, went to Happy Valley Elementary School, went to Cabrillo and got a BA in communications from San Jose State. While he was in school, he worked at the Safeway on Morrissey, which gave him a good slice of life in Santa Cruz and all of the issues that we have here. He also worked at Best Buy and was on the Geek Squad as well, so we have a lot of techies. And he was a security guard at the boardwalk. He's been with us for three years now. Uh, we asked him to tell us a little bit about his average day. He let me know that he responds to calls for service through most of the day, averaging about 34 calls per shift. He addresses a lot of nuisance crimes, public urination, theft, trespassing, as well as some serious crimes, such as domestic violence, traffic accidents, burglary, and assault. When not on a call, he's proactively patrolling by car or foot. Uh, during an average shift, he drives 30 miles and walks three and a half miles throughout the city. Not a lot of downtime. He spends his day making arrests, taking suspects to county jail, sobering center, or the hospital. He writes three to four reports a day and collects and books evidence, data, and video. When I asked him what the best part of his job was, he said he loves to retrieve stolen cars and see the look on somebody's face when they get it back. Um, you know, it's a really tough job, and I asked him, what, what are the skills that you need to do this job well and for a long time? And he told me it really takes creativity, quick thinking, empathy, a thick skin, a good sense of humor, and an ability to maintain a work-life balance. So that's Officer Trueblood, and we'll hear a little bit from him later. Let's do a ride along with the ranger. Um, as I learned, it's more accurate to say a walk along with the ranger. He's on his feet a lot. So this is Ranger Gonzalez, also from Santa Cruz, born and raised, but went to Brant Safordi Elementary School, Santa Cruz High School, uh, studied criminal justice at Cabrillo. When he was in school, he worked um, at a retirement home in Scotts Valley. He's a middle child, which means he's really good at making the peace, which is really perfect for his role out on the streets. And he's worked as a ranger for three years, first with the Parks and Rec Department and then with the police when the team moved over. So he's assigned the downtown area, so you may have seen him around. I see him all the time downtown as a downtown resident myself. Um, he patrols mostly by foot, walking an average of six and a half miles per shift. I wasn't sure I believed him, and he showed me his step counter, so I can verify that. He responds to requests from downtown merchants and neighbors, patrols the area downtown, answers questions from visitors, provides information. Uh, he does issue citations for muni codes, and when things get more serious, he requests officer support. He said he really enjoys the appreciation he gets from downtown visitors and residents. And next, I'll invite my colleague, Joyce Splashkey, to give us a ride along with the investigations detective. Council. Okay, so I have the pleasure of talking about a ride along with investigator, detec investigation detective, Howard Gibbon. 
First off, this is her first year in investigations, but I wanna read to you something. She had been in patrol before her promotion into investigation as a detective, and really the, this sums up everything about um, Elizabeth. Uh, in January, she was officer of the month, and here's, here's just a quote that just encapsulates who she is, and this is when she was on patrol, before her promotion into investigations. She's a good cop doing a difficult job with grace and relentless effort. And this both came from the command staff and the feelings from her peers in the, in the department. Elizabeth um, is now in her first year in investigations. She typically has 20 to 30 cases to manage. And it's a good thing uh, she's a real rocket scientist. Let me back up. Elizabeth is from the Bay Area. She went to Oakland, California. She's from Oakland, California. Uh, she has a BA in anthropology from UCSC, so I think that's how we got her at Santa Cruz Police Department. Um, and then she has associate degrees, so she is one smart cookie. She has uh, associate degrees in social and behavioral sciences, arts and humanities. She also shared with us, with us that she's a cancer survivor. Uh, she has a previous, uh, previous employment uh, with the Geek Squad, which I was really surprised that we have multiple staff who come from the Geek Squad. Um, and more interesting, she also worked at NASA. Uh, she's five years in the department, and we're really excited to see what she's going to do in investigations. So um, as I mentioned earlier, she typically has 20 to 30 cases to manage. Um, as you see from the long list of duties, um, it's comprehensive and long. The one thing I can say about uh, Detective Howard Gimmon, we also call her HG. Is that okay if I move into that? <laughs> <laughs> HG has a tenacity and the fortitude to do the work and always with an amazing, pleasant demeanor, no matter how tough the demand is. She always re presents respectfully to anyone she works with and she still gets the job done effectively. She is going to bring this kind of energy to our investigations department. And again, I really anticipate making big moves up there. Uh, she's very thorough. Uh, she did not hesitate to take on interviewing uh, victims of sexual abuse crimes. And, uh, and it's a long and arduous process once that happens with a victim who's in, as you can imagine, a uh, crisis. Uh, she does an amazing job of walking them through that process and, um, and then going on to the case and trying to get the best results possible. Uh, she books right away getting in there. Uh, investigators book and collect evidence at crime scenes. They review video footage. They create photo lineups. Actually now investigations has turned into more of an IT job and we're lucky we have somebody with uh, from NASA who has rocket ship experience uh, because you get creative and to solve a problem now or to look at a lot of these IT um, uh, photos, videos, that's the new way we get information. She's able to share that knowledge with her other coworkers. So that's the HG, she's fantastic. Let's move on, oops, am I, I'm the clicker? Let's ride along with our public records technician, Pooja Raika, and I almost wanna say it's a little bit of a sit along and a lot more of a dash along. Uh, Pooja comes all the way from Fiji. Can you believe it? I mean, we really have um, where we uh, can hire a multi-ethnic department. And um, Pooja uh, has uh, come with us from amazing experience. She used to work in the front office as a trainer at a medical field. And um, more interestingly, she interned at the Office of Women's Policy, where she worked on educating young women about their rights worked with them on educating, uh, educating them about opportunities for them. And um, she actually brought that, pa that passion and actually found ways that she could incorporate those ideas in our teen academy to help women feel stronger and more assertive in, in projecting themselves. Um, uh, Pooja's been with us for three years as a record tax, and she starts her day at six o'clock in the morning. She hits the ground running. She is one busy lady. As a record tax, she processes hundreds of documents every day, um, and that could be from multiple systems, from our CAD system. You've heard about the legendary alliance system. Uh, she uh, makes sure the justice files are updated 
officer files come through her. She gets information on anything from as simple as a fax machine, which is still regularly used by law enforcement, uh, to uh, many other high system processing. At, if you have um, a records tech, there's nine in our department, and each of them are processing 30 to 40 officer reports a day, in addition to citations, in addition to Public Records Act. Um, multiple hundreds to thousands of documents are processed through our records department, and Pooja is just one phenomenal busy lady there getting it done. spoiled, I'm thinking someone's gonna turn the slide for me. <laughs> it's me, oh, there you go, it's me. Right, <laughs> right along with your community programs. Really the best aspect of my job absolutely the best after of my job is talking about the good work that our officers uh, do, that wear the badge, and this amazing staff that help support the police department and also the community that we get to work with. Anytime I have an opportunity to talk about them, promote them, find ideas that are going to motivate and support the city and our public safety process, it's a great day. Some of the things we do, I'll outline there are our town hall meetings, that one, um, event was a huge event. It happened five times, five different communities. We took that show on the road. Uh, we spoke to over 2,000 community members from every single community. Uh, 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 Councilman Crone, I think you went to almost all of them. So thank you. Um, and we saw a lot of council members there. And when you were there, you recognized community members, neighbors showed up, and they're fully invested. One thing about the town hall meeting that we did was absolutely different, is we made the officers, our line staff officers, and our command staff accessible to community members. They asked questions, they um, uh, gave input, we did, um, uh, 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 exercise where they shared what they wanted our goals to be, what would make the biggest impact and difference with in their communities. So we got a lot of great feedback from that. We did take all that information and put it back out. It ultimately developed into the rolling out of our neighborhood policing teams. And again, we took this show on the road and did five different community meetings, introducing these neighbors to a uh, community policing team that would support and and help them move their public safety concerns forward. So that was a really big partnership and it was done in an innovative way that hadn't been done before. We also had officers participate in the beach flat cleanup and block party. Uh, biggest takeaway from there is they were very appreciative that we would be invested in their community, um, not just helping clean it up, but actually spent most of the day talking to community members, getting to know who are our people in our neighborhood. There's a song about that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. I'm pleased to talk about our BOSTA and PRIDE program. These are some of our uh, two of our targeted uh, youth programs that we have. Um, PRIDE stands for Personal Responsibility, Individual Development Ethics. I know, it is not a very good acronym. But don't get hung up on that. It is the substance of the programs. The kids' lives that we are working with are changing and it's making a dif uh, difference. This program is put together in conjunction with Santa Cruz uh, City Schools. It's a real collaboration. Uh, we work with both middle school age kids, both at Brenta Forty and Mission Hill. And we meet with them um, Throughout the school years, we educate, mentor, and guide them how to make healthier choices for themselves. Um, this, is, this has been going on for the last eight years, and we're looking at over 250 teens that have been helped by this program. Um, we also have another program called BOSTA. This is a better acronym, are you ready? It goes, Broad-Based Apprehension, Suppression, Treatment, and Alternatives. In Spanish, it means enough. So this one has helped over 500 teens. It's a collaboration that we did with the Santa Cruz County Education, and it has been phenomenal. Uh, they work with teens year round. In addition, we support their BOSTA summer sports program, and that helps teens, again, learn to make better choices for themselves. I think one of the biggest takeaways is it's also, in both of these youth programs, an opportunity to build trust between youth and police officers. We're able to create last 
existing relationships with students. And these interactions are the beginnings to changing uh, positive change for law enforcement and these young individuals in their lifetime. So their first interaction with a police officer isn't one on an arrest or a detention. It is a one where they get to play, engage, we're helping. And that's a very powerful program in our youth program. We do another program open to all teens across the, um, the city. It's our Teen Public Safety Academy. It is one that where uh, we work with teens actually to get a full week of working with police officers in the fire department, learning what it's like to have a job in public safety. They do 911 calls. Uh, they go up to 911 dispatch. Uh, they uh, get to do everything uh, that we do in our Citizens Police uh, Academy. So they, the fire truck is a big deal, but they also like learning how to um, go into a room and do a search and investigation and what it's like to put the tape up and find clues. So that's a very popular one that we do with the youth. Really, our, our, our goal with those is to build trust between um, the police and our community, and we really wanna invest in our kids' future. And part of that is seeing us as a whole with the department and to be healthy. Uh, we also have the Citizen Police Academy. That's something that we hope every council person decides to do. It's uh, come open to um, everyone in our city. You really get to experience the inside and the workings of a police department. It's hands-on uh, lectures, demonstration and training. It goes for 12 weeks. We run this program for both English speakers and Spanish speakers. We've actually doubled the program in years past. There was that many people wanted to get involved. They learn about uh, investigations, culture, narcotics, the use of force, arrest tactics, court system. Actually, the best part of this class is no question is off limits. So everybody in the class, again, has frontline access to our officers. We're telling them exactly how we do our job and why we do our job, why it's important they do different interactions or different um, um, policies are in place. So that's a great one. If you haven't done it, sign up. Uh, one other thing that we do is we serve, support Morsing Housing. There's a big family fair, and it's great because what I like about this program is we're talking about the whole pro the whole neighborhood, all of our neighborhood. Um, through our Mercy Housing partnership, we support residents with resources they need to be good neighbors and, in, and good members of our greater community. So that's one we're really proud of. Uh, Mercy Housing has residents at low-income housing, and uh, we want to support neighborhoods and neighbors, residents in all neighborhoods. So that's another community outreach. That is really a focus that we have that's very important to us. So you'll see that we do a diverse uh, community outreach and, um, and we're not afraid to mobilize to make it happen. So one of the things that, uh, that to do that, we did that in the Martin Luther King March for a Dream uh, that brought hundreds and hundreds of people down to the city of Santa Cruz from all backgrounds. And that was a partnership with the NACP, Santa Cruz branch. Uh, it hadn't been done before at this level. And really, it brought stakeholders from all over the Bay Area. It brought groups from diverse backgrounds here. Again, they were walking with our police officers and to support a very positive cause. Um, another thing is that we supported the Santa Cruz Women's March. Part of that was to um, make sure we create a safe environment. There wasn't, you know, that was a growing march and we weren't sure how many people were gonna show up. So it would best that we support that march to make sure it's a safe environment for everyone. Again, another event that brought hundreds of thousands of people to the city and uh, they could see that the department was supportive of a good cause. And the last thing is our volunteer police program, uh, volunteer police program. I'm especially proud of that. It was an added assignment to me, but this program has taken off in a big way. It is really an auxiliary service for our police department. They don't do, they do non-enforcement action, but they have taken on a lot of roles that help our department and support department. You'll see them walking downtown doing foot patrols. They're training right now to do bike patrols. There really are added eggs and, um, eyes and ears to support the department. It's been a great help to the department. Um, I'm impressed at the number of people who are signing up and they're committed commitment to be a part of this program. Um, there are more things to come with that. All right, thank you very much.
All right, lucky enough that I don't need any introduction. You've already seen my slide, hopefully. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the cost to hire and train a Santa Cruz police officer. The first five steps that you can see on the screen here, there's a psychological exam, a polygraph, a live scan check, a background check, and a medical exam. These five steps actually need to be completed before even being considered for the position. Um, there's also steps that you need to take to become a sworn peace officer, which are the police academy um, and the trainee academy and field training. Um, that an officer has to complete. Um, a, in addition to those costs, you also have to uh, have the costs of having a field training officer that teaches um, a trainee how to become a good police officer. Uh, so all these costs in total are about $116,000. Um, so each officer, whether they're successful in the program or not, these are the costs that uh, can be attributed to that. And next I'll introduce uh, Officer Taylor Trueblood. I'll be quick since you guys are getting the death by PowerPoint today, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so to piggyback on what HG said, that the cost to outfit a police officer is roughly $12,000. Um, a lot of it, uh, our major costs come from the body-worn camera. It's close to $2,000, and we recently implemented that with the idea behind creating transparency for the police department. Um, not only does it keep us honest, it keeps the public honest as well. Uh, they've done multiple studies on body cams and uh, the numbers prove it. Uh, secondly, the, a lot of our bigger purchases come from the non-lethal weapons. So our tasers and our 40 millimeter launchers, uh, they're more hefty purchases, but they're obviously worth the, the money, right? We want to explore those avenues first prior to then, uh, going out of the routes. Um, and also in this photograph, uh, we, we didn't list, but Brad's uh, modeling career, we didn't include the cost for a spray on tan or his uh, <laughs> suavecito hair gel. So. Pass along. <laughs> thank you, Officer Trueblood. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm Lieutenant Vasquez. I uh, just want to talk a little bit about our training program and our professional development. Um, at the police department, we take great pride in our training and developing, uh, development of our officers. Obviously, we want to produce the most advanced and educated officers to be able to, to best serve the community and deliver that highest level of service. Um, so, listed on, this, on the uh, slide here, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there's a number of, of uh, training topics, if you will, there, but um, that's just really a snapshot into what we do, and it's already been alluded to that just to, to get in the door and to get adequately trained to be able to do this, uh, this uh, line of work um, takes a lot of time and training, uh, which includes the police academy, uh, which is about six months, and then followed up with a four-month uh, field training program. Um, so that is an extensive uh, and in-depth, hands-on um, learning environment to get people ready for um, what they'll encounter in this profession. Um, but uh, beyond that, um, following all of that, um, there's a minimum state standard which we must uh, uh, meet, and that's uh, 24, annual, 24 hours of annual training um, that uh, the Commission on Police Officers, uh, Police Officers Standard and Training um, has outlined for us. Um, we have typically gone uh, well uh, above and beyond that. Um, this year alone, we're actually doubling that. Um, in years past, we've done some more, um, but that's really our standard that we operate at. As I mentioned, you know, we wanna try and produce the most highly educated and, and well-trained officers to serve our community. And just to highlight a few of those, and you can see them, some few of them up there. Um, one of them is that we attended just this last year is uh, our Los Angeles, it was a Los Angeles Police Department Less Lethal Force Options Symposium, and you'll see a theme here. And our theme and our training is, is essentially uh, geared toward de-escalation and uh, decision-making abilities in, in what we've encountered over the, over the last few decades in our, in our profession. Um, we've also uh, explored uh, and have gone to child exploitation classes, uh, behavioral threat assessment, um, unconscious bias training, human traffic uh, symposium, uh, our problem oriented policing conference, and as the chief mentioned, we will be hosting that later this year. Um, women's leader in law enforcement, um, on our de-escalation training, which we have also not only done in-house with our officers, but we've actually extended it out to the community as well. Um, and then uh, what's really important as well to mention that is not on this slide is our uh, crisis intervention training, um, which is uh, a collaborative effort with our mental health liaisons that we have um, 
in our in our vehicles every day of the week. And uh, so being able to address those uh, those folks in crisis and be able to de-escalate that situation is, is has been been vital for us. Um, so really, you know, all this training, as I mentioned, uh, we take great pride in that. It's really um, where our profession is going. It's not utilizing the tools on our belt, but all those tools that are accessible to us. So that's a snapshot of our training program. Thank you, Arnold. Rick Martinez, uh, your Deputy Chief of Police Operations Division. So let's talk about some uh, highlights that we've, uh, we've had over the last fiscal year, uh, starting with our crisis intervention training. Uh, for the community. Uh, so besides the internal training that, that we've done, uh, utilizing our in-house trainers, uh, Lieutenant Christian Lamas and Sergeant Carter Jones, uh, we've actually trained uh, 200 plus citizens in, in our community. And the emphasis was really on de-escalation techniques, on encounters that they may have out and about in the community. Each one of those sessions was pretty much uh, sold out. So we had wait lists uh, for every one of those and we're hoping to continue those in the near future. Uh, neighborhood policing, uh, the chief touched on this. Uh, it's continuing, but we had to do a little retooling because of our staffing levels. So uh, we've, we've created more of a, a centralized point of contact, which is Lieutenant Escalani, who's now running that team with uh, Sergeants uh, Carter Jones, uh, Sergeants John Bush, and uh, Danny Forbus, all uh, taking the lead on uh, communicating directly with the community, assessing those needs, and then of course, tailoring our response to meet the needs uh, of the community. Uh, next, we uh, participated and, and received a California DOJ tobacco grant for education and enforcement. Uh, we were a little slow in getting that up and running, um, but along with other communities, we were able to get our team in place. Uh, so far, we've uh, educated over 500 students and gone out and done some education and outreach to over 48 uh, tobacco retail locations. Our team is now up and running and we're hoping to uh, pretty much get all of our city schools uh, youth uh, educated on the ills of uh, tobacco use. Uh, California OTS uh, Office of Traffic Safety uh, Traffic Enforcement Grant. Uh, we've really utilized that for a lot of internal training in relation to drug recognition and, uh, and drunk driving, as well as traffic investigation. We have a lot of pedestrian and bicycle versus vehicle collisions in our community. Uh, so we've utilized uh, this grant in order to uh, up our game a little bit and ensure our traffic investigators are able to adequately investigate those cases, as well as partner with communities around us that are also participating in the grant on directed enforcement efforts throughout our community in order to address uh, traffic safety issues. Uh, officer wellness program. This is something Lieutenant Vasquez uh, put together and uh, it's something we were long overdue in, uh, in putting together and I really applaud him for uh, making this magic happen, if you will. Uh, we partner with uh, Dignity Health to do medical health screenings. Uh, we work with a local vendor, a Torque Fitness, uh, to put together uh, fitness regimens for our staff. I think uh, at least 40 plus officers are participating in that now and they actually have online access uh, to track their progress, which is pretty darn cool. And a unique one that we came up with is a partnership with Cypher's Health Institute uh, for massage therapists. Uh, we've brought in massage therapists in order to get their hours. And, uh, you know, initially, and our officers weren't necessarily, uh, you know, they're rough and tumble officers, but uh, they warmed up to the idea fairly quickly uh, of actually having a massage therapist, you know, get, get some, uh, some time on them. And uh, to visualize it, it's basically just, uh, you know, one of those uh, massage chairs you'd see in an airport. Um, and uh, we have it in our gym and people just sign up and, and come in and get those. So it's, it's actually uh, been very well received. Uh, we integrated rangers into our department as well. I just had a conversation with uh, the Parks Commission last night about uh, further integration. And uh, so far it's really upped the level of training as well as uh, really, I guess, perfected the specialization of the enforcement component that the rangers do. Uh, they were kind of jack of all trades and the enforcement component wasn't necessarily uh, the best fit for parks uh, because that's not necessarily what they do. Uh, so taking that enforcement component, bringing it in house, really uh, improves the equipment that they're given as well as the training and really matches that of our officers. Um, police volunteer program, Joyce touched on this. Uh, she should re really be applauded for putting this together. Uh, we have 30 plus volunteers. Uh, she, she mentioned uh, some of their functions, uh, but they also include vehicle abatement as well as uh, community outreach and uh, the You Are Not Alone program, which I think Chief Mills will touch on later. Talk about some upcoming challenges on the horizon for our department. There's a nationwide hiring crisis uh, in relation to uh, law enforcement. Uh, when I was hired in this uh, profession, I tested with 300 people at the Santa Cruz High Gym. Uh, it was a couple years ago, of course, but um, there were two positions available that I, and you know, I was able to negotiate uh, 
uh, my way through the process and was one of the two uh, that were hired out of 300 candidates. Uh, today, when we hold a test, we have anywhere from 18 to eight candidates that show up. On average, we need probably 200 uh, vetted before we actually get a single candidate or two uh, that's hired. We haven't necessarily lowered our standards, um, so uh, the pool is fairly shallow, to say the least. Um, Post uh, Peace Officer Standards uh, for Training in California estimates that we're gonna need another 10,000 police officers uh, within the next five years. Uh, that number really hasn't changed and uh, we're having a very difficult time recruiting and, and for us even retaining the talent that we have. Um, when, I, when I talk about those numbers and, uh, and what we're up against in terms of uh, recruitment, we also have to look at uh, what our staffing levels look like today. 26% uh, of the current Santa Cruz uh, officers in your, in your department are eligible to retire, and many are uh, immediately upon e eligibility. Um, we have six actually retiring here in June. Uh, Dan uh, Filippo, my counterpart, mentioned that, uh, you know, we, we hired at a record pace. Eight, you know, in the last 18 months, we hired 22 uh, officers. Of those 22, I have a feeling by the end of June, uh, we're gonna be uh, probably uh, in, in the hole by two. So we're gonna lose about 23 within that period of time. I know Dan ch touched on that in the previous meeting, but retention is, is a very difficult uh, uh, thing for us right now because uh, we're, we're competing with uh, neighborhood police departments, uh, not only, in, not only uh, locally, uh, but in the Silicon Valley. Uh, we've always had to compete with the Silicon Valley. Obviously, we're never gonna match that pay, but uh, now we're competing locally. Uh, UCSC uh, has about five to six of our officers uh, currently in, in process. Uh, we're getting some of that second hand. I know we have at least three. Uh, they're looking to hire 11. Uh, it comes down to uh, better benefits, better pay, and uh, a much easier and uh, more conducive working conditions uh, to raising a family uh, in this community. Um, we're also still projecting some losses to Silicon Valley. So, um, you, know, as, you know, as you're hearing these conversations today, uh, really think about the, the hardworking men and women that are committed uh, to the, the public service here uh, in our community. Um, I'm gonna leave you with a quote uh, that I, I came across um, in uh, just in a, in a recent conversation in relation to police oversight. It actually comes from a 1999 Metro Santa Cruz article. And the article you know, simply you know, was related to police oversight in, uh, in the city of Santa Cruz back in 1999. Many of you were around for this conversation and some of you were actually referenced in the article. But uh, the leadership uh, that I'm gonna quote today, I uh, worked with on some initiatives and uh, really found uh, his quote uh, incredibly insightful. And I think it holds true today in relation to accountability. And I think it holds true in relation to um, retention of talent that we currently have. And uh, what Scott Kennedy said in 1999 was that in his view, the police department's accountability to the public is much more powerfully affected, although much more subtly, by salaries, training, and management. That, observed Kennedy, influences the quality of the officer on the street. So, you know, think about that, uh, you know, when you're engaged in this conversation and, you know, and what we truly need in order to have a higher level of accountability and a level of professionalism, and of course, uh, to retain the existing talent that we have. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Lieutenant Escalani to talk about crime trends. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, we'll just jump right into a couple slides here related to crime trends. Um, this will be a comparison for 2017 to 2018. Um, as you can see, we, we've had a decrease in almost uh, all property crimes. We've had a 4% decrease in violent crime between the 2017 and 2018, and a 21% reduction in property crimes. The next slide, I will uh, highlight just a few things related to nuisance crimes. So this is different than our UCR, uh, Uniform Crime Reporting Data. These are nuisance crimes. Uh, we had an overall 17% increase in nuisance crimes between 2017 and 18. Um, the most significant was in the trespassing cita citations. 
and we had a 14% increase in drug abuse violations. Um, we saw a decrease in the vandalisms, uh, solicitations, and obviously, uh, well, most of you probably are aware in about midway through 2018, we, we ceased any uh, illegal camping citations. So that's where you see that huge uh, reduction. Um, and in relation to the downtown, I'd like to highlight that uh, it's not on the slide, but in 2019, so far we've seen a 23% decrease in calls for service in the downtown area. And that's between the months of December and March. So December 2018 to March 2019, and the same time period the previous year were 23% uh, down. So that's a good note. I think that's all I got. And if you haven't met, this is uh, Chief Andy Mills. <laughs> well, that. <coughs> That mostly wraps up our presentation. A couple things that you can expect this year for us to expand. Oh, first one is our You Are Not Alone project where uh, volunteers go and call on elderly members of the public who are shut in and maybe don't have people checking on them regularly to make sure that they're not being becoming the victims of crime. And if they are, then report to the police and to be very honest, just check on them and make sure that they're happy and healthy. And uh, this is, I think, one of the most important things we can do as a police agency. Second one is city strides. Uh, we're going to have our patrol officers and our command staff walking with community members all over the city, do a foot patrol uh, with neighborhoods and let them show us in their neighborhoods what they're concerned about so that we can see it up close and personal. Um, I don't think anybody can understand uh, the intricacies of a neighborhood like the people who live in that neighborhood and uh, driving by at 30 miles an hour, you don't get the same picture you do when you're looking out your front window. And then lastly, uh, we are also exp uh, expanding our body-worn camera program to include the Rangers. So shortly, we will have all the Rangers wearing body-worn cameras as well and recording their interactions with the public, uh, as well as um, uh, all of our police officers and CSOs uh, currently have them. All our staff is still here. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have of our either our budget or our programming. Well, thank you so much for the presentation and for the journey through the ride-alongs and insights into the people behind the titles or the um, uniforms. It was, a, it was a nice insight to the work that you do for our community and thank you for your service to our community. Working in education, I just wanna give a shout out to SCPD. You always show up, you're always there for BASTA or tobacco prevention, youth violence prevention. Uh, it doesn't go unnoticed. So thank you for being active in prevention efforts for our youth as well. Um, so with that, we'll see if there's any member of the community would like to address us um, in public comment. And I don't see anybody, so I'm gonna say that's probably not <laughs> happening. And we'll go ahead and return back to the council and see if any council members have any questions for you at this time. Councilmember Brown, uh, Councilmember Mackey. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for including, integrating, including with so many of your uh, personnel uh, to, to help make that presentation. It's really great to see the faces and hear from lots of voices. Um, so, and yeah, I mean, ride-alongs, highly recommended. I'm about to go on another one. Um, so for those of you, if you have, I'm, I'm assuming everybody's done it or wants to do it, it's really a great experience. Um, quick question and a comment related to this question. Uh, the, it's interesting to see the, reduc the crime reduction statistics because when we hear from constituents, um, in virtually all neighborhoods, everybody seems to be reporting increased crime. So <laughs> I'm not sure where the reductions are happening to get us to this overall, but it's great to know that that, to put it in perspective. Um, and um, just a, a quick question on trespassing uh, citations, seeing that go up significantly. I mean, I imagine that's related to the decline in camping citations. And just ask, I would ask if you could clarify um, why the significant increase is that related to increased you know, trespass areas? Um, it's a pretty significant jump. Yes, yeah, so it is a significant jump and I think it's primarily two things. One is when a community member calls and says there's somebody in my property that I don't want here, uh, we go and we issue a citation. And uh, whether it's a, uh, uh, a person's property in the outer skirts of our town or a person sleeping in the doorway, 
of a downtown business that has a letter of agency on file where we can uh, go and issue those citations. The second major piece of that is people who are trespassing on railroad property. Um, when people are trespassing on railroad property, that is against the law and that can receive a citation. And uh, so I think primarily it's those two uh, pieces of why you're seeing an increase. I had just a few quick ones. Um, I appreciate all your presentations about the challenges of hiring, recruiting, and succession, and we can continue that conversation. That's profound. Um, I could just comment on succession sure. uh, planning. Yeah. Uh, it is a difficult issue for us as a police department. Mm -hmm. How do we prepare the next generation for leadership? And I think some of the nuances in the presentation are, for instance, uh, we, we recognize that we lack women in, higher, in, our, in our higher ranks and leadership positions, and we're really trying to remedy that uh, by you know, moving people into positions where they can get experience, and once they get that experience, you know, really push them to try to promote. Uh, one of the ways we do that, for instance, is the Willie Conference, the Women in Law Enforcement Conference that we send um, almost every woman in our department to every year. Uh, to give them, get them exposed to other chiefs of police mm. who are women, and as well as other command staff from all over the nation. And so that is a huge effort on our department's uh, behalf, and I'm proud to say that uh, many of the women are taking this seriously and understanding uh, that how important it is to have that voice. Great. Um, and just a couple other questions, uh, mostly relating to your volunteer programs. Um, uh, when we met with um, representatives of the police department, POA, and um, management, they mentioned that some of the um, really high benefit but optional programs were having to be curtailed right now, just staffing levels. And I assume that's true, so what you're telling us is your desired goal. Right. <laughs> is that a correct understanding? Or, or not. <laughs> yeah, well, last year we had to take a temporary pause on a couple of the programs, and uh, we fully intend to make sure that those are re-implemented as soon as staffing levels get to a point where we, we obviously have we to can. staff the field first. And um, But those do have a, a high benefit. The response of community members who participate in those is, is really great. Oh, it's enormous. Um, and then just questions on the You Are Not Alone program. Is that up and running or about to? launch it, or? Very good question. They have received the training. Uh, they are now uh, going and t beginning to speak with people and marketing for that. So they went to Meals on Wheels, they went to Loudon Nelson Center, as well as some uh, senior um, <coughs> places where I guess people my age hang out and, uh, <laughs> and are able to uh, you know, recruit people for that. So yes, that, that has begun. Um, and my thought there was there's, there's so many really great senior programs that it should be more than checking in, obviously, referral and a two-way two -way street there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then on the city strides, is that up and running yet? Can, will you, let, you'll, you will let us know when neighborhood representatives can sign up for the walk along? Yes, uh, Joyce Blotchke will be putting that out uh, within the next month <laughs> as to where we'll initially be. Uh, so our thought process is to get it going by saying we'll be in these neighborhoods over the next month and then let neighborhoods contact us to say we want to walk in our neighborhood and then we'll follow up with that. I know some people I know be chomping at the bit for that. So, um, And then do those, um, do your volunteers, uh, are they counted as part of CityServe or is that an independent? Because it, it occurs to me, and maybe this is a question for other city staff. We have volunteers in the master recycler. So I think we have a heavy volunteer community and I think the potential is enormous. Are they? Okay. Yeah. They sign up there and then, yeah. Thank you. you sign up through city serve. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Glover, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Councilmember. <coughs> Excellent. Um, thank you for the presentation and for all the different voices. That was nice. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, get your input on the private security listed here under the major service contract because by far the biggest one besides the JPA contract. So just how, you know, essential, crucial, um, you know, imperative are the private security uh, 
contracts in the different areas? And are there areas, are there areas uh, that are more needed than others? Are there some where they almost never go with reports or stuff like that? Yes, uh, Councilman Glover. Um, I think we would divide it into two areas. Um, one is the effectiveness in terms of crime control reduction, and the other is effectiveness in terms of comfort for the community. I think in terms of comfort for the community, there is a benefit uh, in each of these areas. In terms of crime control, we're pushing first alarm and having discussions with them to, be, to help us understand what exactly they're doing as opposed to just being present. And, and so as we try to get better data from them to understand the effectiveness of that guard rather than just the presence, like we get a report um, annually that tells us they make this many contacts with the public. Well, what do those contacts mean? Are they shooing people off property? Are they talking to people, providing services? There's a variety of, of things that uh, we take a look at. Uh, as far as where uh, it is effective, which I think was part of your question. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the wharf and upper ocean seem to be the two locations that we hear most about from the community mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, you know, that people want to see that, uh, that security guard there. Um, but uh, it is a, uh, it's helpful, certainly. And, uh, and I think that it could be effective, but we, you know, I really believe in data, so we have yeah. to figure out how to measure it a little, bit, a little bit better than we have in the past. And we've had that discussion with First Alarm once, and now we're gonna try to actually apply metrics uh, and then look at those neighborhoods compared to neighborhoods that don't have it, so we have a control uh, group and to, to measure it that way. And do you know how many, how many years consecutively we've had the private security contract and has it maintained at about 230,000 or? I think Deputy Chief Martinez would probably be better um, situated to answer that part of the question. Thank you. Well, it's actually greatly increased. Uh, it's, it was actually much uh, smaller. Uh, a portion of that is prisoner watch as well as special event coverage. So Halloween, New Year's, uh, Fourth of July, a lot of uh, closures or special events that require uh, private security uh, come out of that contract but prisoner watch is, is a good lion's share of it as well. Uh, the neighborhood uh, presence or patrols, uh, that has, has probably increased that budget exponentially for us. Mm. Okay, thank you for that. Just jump on the prisoner watch thing just so the public you may understand what that is. When we have a prisoner that has to go to the hospital because let's say their blood pressure is high or they're under the influence of methamphetamine, rather than having an officer sit there for three, four, five hours, first alarm will come and take over that for us and when they're ready to be booked, then an officer will go and pick up that person and take them to jail. So it gets that officer free to be back in the field. And so that's the purpose of it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so there's, um, it was great to hear from Officer Trueblood uh, and also the background. I also went to Harbor High, wherever he is. Um, so uh, work. yeah, totally. Uh, the Question is that it's come up with some different people in the community, um, some that have come to speak at city council, some others that have just approached me, but about wanting officers to get out of their cars and be more engaged with the community. So um, the, ra the ranger uh, walks 6.5 miles, but offers a true blood 3.5 miles. Is that because of the distance he needs to travel and the speed, or uh, is there possibilities of getting officers out of their cars more frequently? Well, we would love nothing more than for our officers to be able to get out and do more <coughs> time on foot in neighborhoods and downtown area and the beach area and the wharf and mm -hmm. uh, you know the main corridors. The simple fact is that 80% of their day, especially during day watch and second watch, is spent responding to emergency calls, uh, driving all over town. That's why you see them zipping back and forth. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose, uh, one of the purposes of us doing the City Strides program because I really want the officers uh, to be, be able to be able to get out and meet the public and also for the public to meet the police right. and to build that relationship so that they're more comfortable doing foot patrols when they have the time. And as our staffing increases, and we are getting there rapidly, um, our hope would be that we create different programs that allow the officers to have greater touch with the community. Okay, great. Um, Two more questions. Um, the cost associated with hiring and training a police officer, we've had a chance to talk about this a few times. Um, one of the issues that uh, came back were when we were talking was the issue of credit checks. I'm not sure, is that still something that are on our books with regards to the limiting ability of people to get 
um, into the role of police officer and then um, other barriers are that were in place that were stopping both the ability for people to apply and also the diverse representation of officers that are doing the applying. So um, has there been any motion on that to make it more accessible for people? Well, thank you for that question. Yes, there are, we have had movement on that and we take a very close look at and use judgment as opposed to just a hard line on stuff. So if somebody has credit that's not too strong, uh, we take a look at why. Now, if they're running up credit cards at Nordstrom, that's a different, very different thing than school debt. Right. Um, or it, it maybe they're from a family that just didn't have the means like we would all did with our children to pay off those credit cards and have them pay us back. Uh, so we, we have moved on that and we do take a look at those individually and, to, and do use a little bit more judgment on, on those folks so that we can say, is this, what's the purpose of this debt? Uh, the second piece is, yeah, we are looking at other things as well. For instance, I uh, talked to a person yesterday who was disqualified and he came in to, sp to sit down with me and say, I don't understand why I'm disqualified. So I looked at his background packet and he had been terminated from two jobs. That's an automatic dis permanent disqualification from our department. But then we need to take a look at why right. and how old was it? Was, was it he a paper boy and he got terminated from a job for throwing it through somebody's window? Or was it, you know, something substantial like theft or you know malfeasance, very different uh, subjects. And so those are the kind of standards that we're trying to pick apart and make sure that uh, we're viewing things very broadly and using greater judgment on who we hire to become uh, Santa Cruz police officers. Great, um, thank you for that. And then the last question, um, just on the cost to outfit a police officer, what is our um, policy currently on the M4 carbon rifle? Uh, they're issued to all of our officers. And um, the body cams, because that was mentioned that that's the highest one, I'm, I love that we have them. Are those able to be turned off? Yes. And is there a reason why you decided to go with the turned off version as opposed to the not being able to turn off version? Well, I don't know that there's any version that can be turned on permanently. Rick, are you aware? But uh, just as part of that though, those batteries only last so long and uh, and at the end of 12, 14, 15 hours, there's no battery life left, even with them turning them off and turning them on. Uh. Uh, and then the second thing for me personally, um, there comes a time during the shift, during a 12 hour shift, where I'm, I have to go to the bathroom a lot and I don't want that recorded. Right. Um, or if we're talking to a victim of a sexual assault, it's probably not the best thing to record at that point. Um, as well as many other things we might be talking to informants or talking to people giving us information in the community who really don't want their identity known. I mean, there's a whole host of reasons. So the officers do have the ability to turn them on and turn them off. Mm -hmm. But as part of that, we also have our internal affairs sergeant randomly check. So we'll pull up a traffic stop, make sure that that traffic stop was recorded. Uh, so that we're, there's a quality control mechanism in place uh, for us to make sure that we're inspecting that and, and ensuring that those are, that, that our officers are recording. And if they don't record, then it becomes a disciplinary matter. We have to figure out what happened, why, do you just forget? How many times have you forgotten? Um, are you forgetting all your traffic stops or is it just one ab abnormality? Uh, so there's a variety of- That's of great, no, it's oversight, thank you. Complexities to it. That in addition to yeah, sure. Um, any enforcement uh, contact by policy has got to be audio recorded or activated on the body cam. Uh, storage, besides battery life and everything else that uh, Chief Mills had mentioned, but uh, storage uh, was a huge issue mm -hmm. in terms of the amount of storage needed for constant video. Uh, mm -hmm. These cameras are a uh, nice uh, uh, gap or, or a, I guess a, a stop gap for that. They have a built-in buffer uh, that you can actually set uh, they also have the capability, if somebody walks up and the, and the conversation's going sideways and they activate it, it'll fire cameras all around them. Mm. Um, so uh, I think that, that module's still pending, but that's the reason we went with that, that system is because it had those capabilities. Uh, but those policy violations, if they, if they do come up, are uh, quickly addressed. Thank you. Sure. Appreciate that clarity. Thanks, may I come in? Just had a quick question for public clarification. Um, I know that you all have mentioned and brought up 
how um, retention and recruitment of police officers has gone down. At the same time, we've added the Rangers, and so for some folks, they see, um, well, we don't have that many more police, but we have more of that police presence with having increased um, Rangers and added to the police force. And so could you just clarify like the difference in the roles between police officers and Rangers and the importance of needing more police officers? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, all, all our enforcement positions, Rangers, community service officers, and police officers are critically important to the, um, to the efficacy of our, of our police department. The Rangers mostly enforce um, in the parks, in downtown area, around the city, municipal code violations. Uh, again, they do an amazing job uh, in doing that. The community service officers, specific positions are to offload uh, many of the duties incumbent on the police officers. Uh, so for instance, they'll do investigations for burglaries, cold burglaries. They'll do investigations of somebody breaking into a vehicle or a, uh, or a shed, as well as doing some enforcement for municipal code violations. Only police officers have the powers of arrest uh, that are needed to do that high level enforcement. And their training is obviously a lot different in terms of the length and the context of the training. So um, just very different positions. We are expanding the duties of the uh, community service officers. Uh, for instance, this, last year we sent uh, Regina Romero and another uh, CSO to uh, cr crime prevention through environmental, environmental design school so that they can go, as we had a guy from a synagogue come and ask us, hey, could you help us with security? Well, we'll send them over and to take a look at their facilities and really design a smart security function based on academics. And so uh, we're very vastly expanding their duties, but there are certain things only a person with a badge, uh, a sworn position can do. Council Member Bynes? Uh, just a couple quick questions. Um, on the, uh, the total FTEs, it looks like you're gonna just stay flat this year with regards to 136, and that includes Rangers and CSOs, the whole? The whole, the whole gamut. Okay, good. Um, I had a note on the workload indicators. It looks like a lot of things have sort of either balanced or not grown substantially, um, even gone down in some cases. Number of reports written, um, it's gone up by about almost 3,000, is that due to new state law or wh where's that increase just based on some of the other indicators? I'm just curious. Yes, I think overall uh, calls for service are actually down 4%, yeah, yeah. but uh, reports have gone up and there's a reason for that. We started categorizing the reports differently. Okay. So um, it used to be that uh, every incident would have multiple reports attached to it. So for instance, if there was a robbery, mm -hmm. five people could go and write those reports and it all attached to that incident. Now we count those as separate reports. Okay. And so uh, that would actually force the number of reports up even though that, that's still re responding to that particular crime. That one incident, okay. And so that's that that's the difference between what, what previous procedure was. That's correct. Okay, it's I was just, just curious if if there was some law that you know was causing that, it, it's a significant amount. So I just wanted to understand a little bit more on that. Yeah, well, you, yeah it's 10 reports a day almost. Yeah, that's, yeah. It's which a is lot. a lot of paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the last thing was um, one thing I hear a lot about is um, uh, the impression from our community that bike um, bike theft is just rampant. Um, does that show up? I know your statistics. I don't know where that falls in in terms of um, if it's you consider that nuisance or where that might fall and. I'm just curious if um, any there's any sort of focus on that by a particular group of neighborhood policing teams or just if you could just comment on that. that. Sure, uh, bike theft is far too high in our city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a couple of things working in the backgrounds uh, that are trying to get launched, mm -hmm. uh, which will be important for that. Uh, that would be categorized in the theft reports. Okay. Uh, which are down overall, but depending on the price of the bike, so it could either be a grand theft or a petty theft, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the value of the bike. So if the bike's, you know, five thousand dollar carbon fiber bike, um, obviously a grand theft. If it's you know two hundred dollar bike, then that's going to be a petty theft. Okay. So it, it would just depend. We do categorize bike thefts, and do we have a? I'm looking at my crime analyst. Do you have off the top of your head? We don't have. Okay. 
uh, not with us, I, I know we do capture it, but just so you know, we've got a uh, patrol officer and a volunteer working on a project to try to figure out how we can track bikes better. Okay. Uh, like um, with technology, as well as Joyce has been working on a project um, that's uh, liquid DNA, mm -hmm. um, where you can basically spray the bike with mm. this invisible stuff and then look at it under ultraviolet and then get figure out whose bike it you know, belongs to. Because one, one of the difficulties we have is that the bikes get all chopped up quickly. And uh, so you got you know random pieces and it, it becomes very difficult to track. And we run multiple bikes, serial numbers every single day. Okay. And for the most part, they come back record not on file. Okay. And so that's, okay. that's difficult. Uh, so we are working a variety of projects to try to get that and we do offer a, a bike, uh, a bait bike program mm -hmm. uh, where we'll put a bike out there with uh, technology on board that allows us to track that bike and we wind up arresting those folks on a regular basis. Neighbor policing normally does that. And all of those kinds of things would be covered in the budget and capabilities for this coming year, it sounds yes. like. Okay, yes. great. And then um, just, I just wanted to thank your staff and you and um, you guys do a lot in the community and I especially am really impressed with the work you're doing with the youth and bringing volunteers from our neighborhoods and our um, community to understand what you guys do and how they can be involved in also making our city safe. And so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Council Member Crown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Really, really fine presentations. Thank you. Those, those were really, you know, took some time to put together. Uh, and what Joyce mentioned about going to the uh, community meetings too. Like those were also well done. And um, you, you're, you're a good teacher. You involved uh, the community in those presentations. My background's in education. And I've taken a lot of classes. Um, I, I want to un underline the collection of data about first alarm. I think that's a great idea, and I just hope we, we could see some of that. That that would be wonderful. Um, and c picking up on Councilmember um, Myers um, about bike thefts and stuff, um, it's a really troubling thing in our community. I'm wondering if we ever thought about just having uh, taking a 90 days or something, having a specific group within the police department focused on that, on just bike theft, and get to sort of the bottom of it. Oh, you know. Who's doing it? Where is it? Is there chop shops going on? I kept hearing these reports from East Siders saying, "Oh yeah, these these people are you know dismantling these bikes in these garages." I mean, why can't the police you know focus on that for a while so it stops? Yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly a tough. Not that you're not, but yeah, I just, no, no, I, in, in a more concerted, a sort of you know, you know, academic way almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a project we certainly uh, would need to work on. And, I, and it's certainly a priority for us because it's such a, an immense problem for the greater community, uh, bike theft, actually all theft. People are tired of getting their cars broken into and, and, uh, and they're, you know, even all the way down to hoses stolen, stolen out of their front yard to bicycles. And, uh, I, you know, we have, I think, different levels here. Uh, one is you, when you have these races come to town and all of a sudden six $10,000 bikes wind up missing that's a very different problem than what we have almost every day here, which is a person just swiping a bike out of her front yard. Yeah. And, um, and we certainly would want to be able to, to get to work on that. As staffing comes up, these problems allow us to actually approach some of those problems and try to solve them from an analytical perspective um, a lot more easily. Uh, right now, we're just, to be honest, keeping our nose above water. And, um, but. We're actually learning how to swim now, and so I think hopefully we'll be able to get in the race. Yeah, I just and I, and I think that the department's taking bike theft seriously because it is a serious issue for Santa Cruzans because we are so reliant on on our bikes. Um, Claire will tell you, 13% of commuters are riding their bikes in Santa Cruz, um, and I love to hear those statistics um, about the trespassing and versus the camping citations. You know, there's a, a conversation in the community that, okay, you're not giving out camping, you're giving out trespassing. And in my sense of, of the camping citations was always that, you know, using the term blood from a stone, I mean, you're, you can give so many to people, but you're really, you know, they're not gonna pay it. I mean, say, wouldn't you say the same thing's going on with the trespassing citations too, if you're having multiple citations to, to certain individuals? Yes, in, in short. Um, I mean, you know, we there's a, 
high percentage in the 90 percentile of failure to appears on site on citations and that is a problem in fact one of the you know questions i just posed to our entire department is how do we hold people accountable uh, when you know it's a 90 percent plus failure rate to appear on citations uh, for uh, you know for camping and we're not writing those anyway, but uh, so that is a, a substantial problem and there has to be a, a better solution. So I reached out to our department and I'm actually gonna reach out to the community as well and say, hey, give us your thoughts um, of how do we hold people accountable? How do we encourage people to comply with the law uh, in, a, in a thoughtful, legal, moral uh, way? Uh, but at the same time, there has to be some level of social order. Yeah. And, um, and so it's, it's a substantial problem. <sighs> yeah. Well, my, my last thing really is um, a comment, and I feel, um, as a council member and as somebody who lives in Santa Cruz, I feel like uh, you've really worked hard to build a level of trust, and I think that you hopefully receive that from this council. Um, I certainly feel it from, from you, and I've, we've had some candid conversations over the last two and a half, three years. Um, I remember the first month you got here and uh, I picked you up at the police station in my Nissan Leaf. Um, and I'm not gonna bother you about, you know, why we don't have uh, Nissan Leafs as police cars, because I saw how it was difficult to get in the car, but you, you, you still made it. And, Barely. <laughs> and we went over to where I used to live in a neighborhood that I have a lot of fondness for and uh, a certain marsh, Jesse Street Marsh. And I said, you wanna walk? And he said, sure. And we jumped out of the car and we walked all over the Jesse Street Marsh. We walked up to Ocean View Park. You had a whole perspective in the lay of the land and you were, you were making some, I thought, really insightful comments just having gotten to Santa Cruz. Um, and, I, and so I'm really excited about this City Strides um, project that you're undertaking because I think it's a great, because that is a huge, one of the first things it's like, Let's, let's talk about it, but if you're in the car behind glasses, sunglasses, whatever, that's a lot of times people look at police officers. And it's sad that there's not that relationship building. Um, and I know it takes time and money. <laughs> and, and, but I'm really happy that you're on this City Strides program. The, only, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll ask or put plant is I'd li love to see more uh, police officers on bicycles. Again, I'm going back to my original thing about bicycles. It, it, it just sets a model and um, I think it could, we could get it to where it's a cool thing to do. I don't know how the officers feel, but I think within the community, I think people would think it could be cool um, to be on bicycle. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because there's one more initiative that uh, we just went through. We actually just trained our volunteers, our CSOs, our rangers, and a lot of police officers on, we have to actually have a post certified bike course, which we sent somebody through. And now we've got uh, probably 30 people in our department trained uh, to ride bicycles. Nice. Um, we took the wheels off, the train wheels, and now we're ready to go. And, uh, but I'm actually excited about it because um, I actually want to go through the courses. I love riding a bicycle also. And, uh, and so we can get out and ride and, and uh, get into the communities. And it's amazing what you can see where you're, when you're either on foot or on a bicycle at a much slower speed. And so yeah, we're looking forward to that. And I think hopefully you'll see a lot more of that this year. Thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Well, on that note, thank you very much for your presentation this afternoon, and thank you to the staff who was able to make it as well. I've got a stellar staff, don't I? Yes, you do. You indeed do. Yes, thank you for your service and your thank entire you. team. All right. So last but certainly not least, we have our water presentation, and we have Rosemary Menard here from um, our uh, water department. I'm going to set up, so if you the bio break now is the oh, <laughs> good time. I need Hey, good afternoon. I don't have a cast of thousands with me today. <laughs> Doesn't mean I don't have a great staff, and that, but they're all uh, sort of working hard in the, back at the salt mine, so to speak. Um, just go. Uh, 
There we go. Oh. Um, so I've handed around a, a, a one-page sort of water department at a glance uh, handout. Um, what we did was we tried to sort of cover some of the details about our organization and what we do and um, kind of some of our metrics, if you will, uh, in a sort of a brief, accessible, at a glance kind of way. And then to provide you with a map of our service area on the back. Um, I think on the, of the things here uh, that were, that probably is maybe a little bit of a surprise. Um, we have a pretty active school program where we talk to, we have kids come to our watershed, um, on a, both from the Live Oak and the Santa Cruz and the San Lorenzo Valley schools. Uh, we serve about 100,000 population inside the city and outside the city. Um, we answer, our customer service group answers about 45,000 calls and, um, and also deals with tens of thousands of um, walk-in customers at our office over on Locust Street every year. We have about 114 employees, about 60% are in the operations division, which includes distribution, um, production, um, water quality, and our, um, our watershed management group, which includes Loch Lomond and water resources. We have a lot of infrastructure, and I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. Um, and we are heavily regulated, both from the state and federal level on um, drinking water um, quality, and we have a solid record of producing a quality product and deliver about 2.6, 2.7 billion gallons of water to our customers a year. Um, what I've done with this presentation is really to talk a little bit more about um, the key things that are driving our organization. And so I'm, you're not gonna see the same level of, you know, this, this aggregation of our budget. You're gonna um, hopefully have an opportunity to learn about what are the key drivers? And for those of you who um, haven't been on the council long, I would be delighted now that it's sort of stopped raining to um, plan a day to give you a system tour because I think those, are, those who've taken it over the years have found it to be really interesting and a useful way to really get a context about how, how diverse and large and sort of scattered around our water system is and um, what it takes to make water and have it, have it um, be delivered. So, um, we talked about the at a glance. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about um, our view of our department stewardship roles and goals. And that's a really a key word for us. And then I wanna to talk to you about key drivers for planning and action, which have to do with climate change, water supply reliability, infrastructure rehabilitation replacement, natural resources stewardship, financial stewardship, and affordability. Um, these, are, these are the key issues that are really driving what we're doing in the organization, apart from the 24, 7, 365 job of delivering um, you know, millions of gallons of water a day to our customers. So that's the nature of this presentation. Um, for us, the definition of stewardship and the role that we play is that we really have been charged with supervising, managing um, something that, especially something considered worth caring for and preserving. The water system is a tremendous community asset. It um, probably has a billion dollar um, replacement value if we were to replace it over again at this stage. Uh, it's been in place and has grown incrementally over many, many years. Uh, we had our 100th anniversary of uh, being a city water system in 2016. So uh, stewardship is a big deal for us. And we have a set of stewardship goals that um, have a lot to do with supporting, enhancing the long-term sustainability of our natural and water resources that we're responsible for. We, we are the stewards of tremendous uh, water resources that you know, make water available to us and that we have to plan for under a whole range of circumstances. And then we also have a lot of natural resources because probably apart from the Parks Department, one of, one of the largest landowners, much of, much of the land that we own or that we're stewards of on behalf of the city and its um, citizens it are outside the city <laughs> limits. So we have uh, thousands of acres of lands in the Loch Lomond wash, watershed in the um, Laguna and some North Coast lands. We have rights of way. We have a whole set of issues that are, um, that have us sort of working outside of the city in a number of, you know, different, very different environments from what's in the city. 
Um, we need to address uncertainty associated with climate change by taking the opportunity that we're um, working on now in uh, infrastructure rehabilitation and replacement to design in greater resili resiliency and adaptive flexibility in all of the things that we're doing. And so that is a really big part of um, what we're thinking about is we're making some very large investments in water infrastructure over the next decade or more. Um, that's a, a key outcome that is a result that is really important. And then in order to really deliver all of that, we have to invest in and be stewards of our organization's resources in terms of people. And so we've been doing a lot of work over the last few years to develop a organizational culture that supports a uh, participatory and uh, engaged workforce. And I think we're seeing some good results from that. Um, so. We, one of the things that you might not know is we operate out of about five or six different physical locations because of the nature of our work. And so that does create big challenges for an organization trying to do organization, sort of making a cohesive organization. Um, so I wanna start with sort of planning, talking about planning it for and adapting to climate change. We've been working uh, over the last five years really on a number of different climate change, uh, using a number of different climate change scenarios to look at uh, the possible future implications of climate change on our water resources. And the ones that you see here, the, this bottom one here is, it's called GFDL 2.1 A2. That's a downscaled global climate model from the um, about was developed in 2014. We used this climate model with uh, the Water Supply Advisory Committee. You can see that the little blue dots up here, it's typically more warm and uh, dry than some of the other models that have been developed. This uh, four model ensemble is a more recently developed uh, climate model that um, comes from, also it's a global downscaled uh, climate model. And this one is a little bit more neutral in terms of warm and dry. It, it tends to be perhaps a little bit wetter and um, slightly less uh, you know, dry than some of the other options. And then finally, this historical catalog model is, it's a model that's been developed for the, um, the Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Basin groundwater planning work. And this one comes out of taking the whole historical um, data set and picking out the more typically warmer and drier years and randomizing those into a series of uh, sort of a, a forecast that is a created forecast. And so this one is, um, you can see has some very dry and uh, warm kinds of characteristics about it, but it's not quite as dry or warm as the GFDL5. So we've, we've been looking at all of these models and we've done quite a bit of analysis, uh, putting them side by side and trying to understand their implications. And here's one, uh, here's a good example of them. In the, um, these climate models help us look at the number, the length of the worst year shortages, the sort of drought, the worst drought, and um, the degree to which uh, that would affect our available supply. And so you can see in historical, the worst year drought was about 1.2 billion gallons off of a, 3.2 roughly billion gallon demand. That, uh, it, it's a two year drought, the second year is worse. This is the sort of 76, 77, that's the two years of that one. And you can see that the total is about 1.9 billion gallon shortage of the, of the worst case. And in the, the first climate model, the GFDL 2.1, you can see it's about a little bit bigger, 2.1. In the four model ensemble, it's a three year worst case drought. And it's about 2.5 billion gallons. And then in the climate catalog, it's about 2.4 billion gallons. These are all looking at basically surface water hydrology. It's, it's looking at the implications of climate, changing climate on surface water hydrology. And so these things are helping us really focus on um, what kinds of projects we should be doing, what kinds of, um, how big the gap is under various kinds of changing circumstances. Uh, we're not saying one of these is right. We're really trying to, you know, sort of understand the space, if you will. And so we've got a lot of really good work that's been looking at these, uh, this climate work. And I think we're feeling pretty solid that, uh, that there's more to do on this and that we've got, a, a, um, particularly as it relates to the vulnerability of surface water, which is 95% of our supply, to climate change uh, in a ways that could really undermine the reliability of our supply. So that's one of the things that we're working on. Um, 
so i've sort of basically said this before the long term vulnerability of surface water to climate change and the design and climate resiliency to all the infrastructure projects so this is just an example where we have a lot of raw water pipelines which are the big pipelines that bring water down from the north coast sources into town and also down from newell creek uh, one of the things we experienced in 2017 you're going to see more about in a minute is we had a lot of pipeline breaks due to landslide hazards um, in the particularly in the Newell Creek Basin uh, during the 2017 uh, very wet year. And so really trying to understand the um, alignments of those pipelines and to the extent that we're going to be replacing them because of their condition, moving them to out of those landslide hazard areas so that you have more climate resiliency. It's a big message that's going on really in the water industry statewide. Um, so improving water supply reliability, one of our challenges is we have a tremendous variability. Um, since I've been here, which started in 2014, which is this year right here, uh, we've had a critically dry and a wet that have been at the extreme end of the spectrum. We've had one normal, two dries, and a second wet one's going on this year. So. I don't know, normal might not be normal anymore. It's one of the things we're sort of concluding out, out of this. But when you have the kind of uh, water system that we have, this is a very challenging situation. And it's, it's uh, the system is vulnerable to water supply issues in both wet conditions. This is a, uh, I love this picture right here. It's, this is the atmospheric rivers that hit the West Coast in 2017. Is you know, one after another, we were in emergency operations most of uh, January and February that year. Water was still coming out. Most people probably didn't know it, but we had a tremendous number of issues that year. So we have problems in the wet years and in the dry years. This is uh, specific information about the three year lead up to the 2014 drought where you can see that runoff in the first year in 2012, rainfall was about 70% of normal, runoff was about 50% of normal. The second year, about 60, 60. And then in the last year we had uh, rainfall was, uh, this was apparently a year to date, so that was, it was way low, but the runoff was only 11%. So with the size of our storage and the dependence on um, surface water, we can get into a big problem pretty darn fast, but once it starts to rain, as it did in 16, 2016, over that 15, 16 winter, we got out of the problem sort of equally fast. So um, for us, the vulnerability to dry uh, situations really associated with limited storage, um, fish flow requirements, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more, high, vari high variability of supply, and then the seawater intrusion issues that we're dealing with in the Santa Cruz Mid-County groundwater basin and climate change. Um, of these, limited storage is the most significant and conservation alone cannot solve this problem. So water conservation alone cannot solve it. So from the uh, Water Supply Advisory Committee recommendations in 2015, there was a series of actions that we've uh, been working on. We've got um, progress on every single one of these items. We've increased um, water conservation programs. We've explored the feasibility of uh, winter water harvest, including testing out, pilot testing, and in-lieu water transfer with Soquel Creek Water District this last winter, um, and also pilot testing off for storage and recovery in the Belts Well system over in Live Oak uh, this winter. And we've uh, completed preliminary work on exploring the alternatives, including having the Council Act last November to put desalinization and the back burner because of the permitting and challenging permitting issues associated with that. We didn't feel like it was a viable project. So the alternative that the Water Supply Advisory Committee recommended was recycled water in the event that some of these others don't pan out. And um, so we've been, we've done a good study of arranging, uh, identifying a whole range of options on recycled water. Um, we'll be coming to you a little bit later in the year talking about kind of where we're going with this project and I think that's a, that'll be good, something good for maybe the um, fall time frame. Another thing that's going on there was from the Water Supply Advisory Committee, there was a very strong emphasis on working with um, regional uh, providers. You can see this is the, this blue dotted line here is the boundary of the Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Basin and the red one is the 
boundary of the Santa Margarita Basin. The city has been very actively engaged in groundwater sustainability planning, a plan development. The, the Mid-County one is coming out in July because it's due to the state at the end of um, January next year. The, um, the Mar Santa Margarita one is a couple of years behind because it's a medium priority base instead of a uh, high priority. But we've been very actively engaged in the groundwater planning work associated <coughs> with this. And a lot of our um, the work that we're doing is looking at various kinds of collaborative projects and conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater to improve everyone's reliability. Um, okay, addressing the water system infrastructure. This is kind of a pretty high level inventory of the infrastructure we have. We have an earth build dam and reservoir. 35 miles of raw water, a large diameter raw water pipelines, surface water treatment plant uh, built in 1960. And I, there was a thing in the Sentinel sometime in the last few weeks that, or months that said, it came online in 1959 and it was cost $1.6 million. I would love to have that again, but I'm afraid that's not what a, a big project up there will cost. Um, hundreds of large and medium and small valves uh, everywhere throughout our system. Distribution storage, numerous pump stations, uh, 264 miles of distribution mains, and uh, 3,000 fire hydrants and about 26,000 water meters. So it's it's a big, complicated system. Uh, it's analogous more to the systems, for example, of the San Francisco PUC or the East Bay Municipal Water uh, Utility or the um, Contra Costa Water di District in the sense of all of the range of activities because of the, the having reservoirs and dams and what have you. It's so, uh, that's quite different from our neighboring agencies who are mostly groundwater utilities and are therefore don't have, for example, the raw water uh, transmission lines or the dam fill, the dam reservoir and reservoir or the surface water treatment plant. So it's a big complicated system and kind of in a compact environment here um, in Santa Cruz County. In the winter of 2017, the chickens came home to roost with respect to infrastructure reliability. The Newell Creek, Creek pipeline had four, five breaks on it between sort of January and um, uh, March. Um, Majors and Lydell, both the, which are North Coast sources, had uh, water main, uh, major sort of transmission line breaks. Um, I see there Paradise Park was flooded from a water main break. Um, a number of culverts and um, road washouts happening in Henry Cal, which are uh, Newell Creek pipeline crosses. The coast pump station flooded. This is the building that's immediately next door to the 20, 1220 River Street uh, camp. This is a, one of our major facilities that operates to bring water from the uh, coastal sources and the diversion on the San Lorenzo River and pumps it up to the Graham Hill water treatment plant. Uh, that was flooded. Uh, that's the Lydell Springs. That's another North Coast source that had a water main break on that. N additional leaks on the North Coast pipeline, culvert failures, um, and then two more North Coast pipeline leaks. So um, this is uh, sort of behind, although not entirely behind, as we've been talking about the state of the water system since 2015. But we have developed a, what's called the Santa Cruz Water Program that's working on renewing the diversions, pipelines and pumps, improved treatment reliability and water supply augmentation. And this is a program that we are in partnership with a, a program management um, company, which is HDR, it's an engineering firm, where we have an integrated team and we're working together to um, plan for and implement the, the capital program, the very large capital program that is um, required to address the issues that we have. Um, so again, we're, we're looking at uh, climate resiliency and we're looking specifically at more robust treatment process at the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant it increases our ability to treat water at either the very wet end of the spectrum or the very dry end of the spectrum. And um, that flexibility will be really valuable in the, in the coming, with the coming uncertainty about climate change. Um, moving now to natural resources stewardship. We're focused very heavily, although we have a number of habitat conservation plans, one for the Mount Hermon June beetle and another one that we've been working on for um, some sort of red-legged frogs and other kinds of species. Um, we're very heavily focused right now on 
salmonid conservation in the San Lorenzo Laguna majors in our source waters. Um, but as you can see, the San Lorenzo is really the priority area associated with what the opportunities are for both um, habitat restoration and then access for um, the, these fish. The fish, if you're not a fish person, the, these particular fish have life cycles that include both freshwater life cycles and ocean life cycles. Most of the um, fish that we're dealing with are, they come into the river systems to spawn, typically usually in the spring or the fall, and then they their eggs are laid down, they need to be protected during the incubation period, then they hatch out. These are, these are um, rearing, so these juveniles that need to have summer flows to rear, and this is a big change in the kinds of things that we've developed to make sure that there are flows in the river, particularly in the summertime. So we're sharing our resources with our, um, with the, the salmonid populations, and this is a, the dark blue is the in-stream flow requirement that we developed and worked with the, um, the federal and state fish agencies, National Marine Fishery Service and the um, California Fish and Wildlife. And the blue is the total mon monthly production of water from all sources. So you can see in the spring, the flows are pretty high because it's an in-migration, out-migration timeframe. And then in the summer, things kind of stabilize and come down a little. That's the time for rearing. That the the fish and um, particularly as it relates to the, the lower river between sort of Tate Street and the lagoon. Um, this is a really important habitat for those species and flows are uh, being bypassed really for the first time and you know, it's been doing it somewhat re frequently in the last uh, say decade. But before that the river was sort of, we took the water out of the river and kind of dried the river up below our project. Um, pretty common, but we don't do that anymore. So we're sharing our, water resources with uh, really important uh, threatened um, steelhead and endangered coho salmon. Um, so the last couple of sections I wanna talk about money. It's the money and I'm not talking specifically about our, um, our budget proposal, but I wanna to want to talk about a little bit about the trends and the financial planning work we've been doing. Since the um, development of, of um, since finishing the Water Supply Advisory Committee work in uh, 2015, I knew that we really needed to work on the financial planning situation. And so we um, developed a, a financial plan and brought that to the council in June of 16. We did a lot of work on rate increases at that point that we've been implementing. But the real place that we were was um, the red line is our sort of fund balance. And so you can kind of see from about 2005 to about 2011, there was a pretty nice increase in the fund balance. And then beginning in about 13, 12, 13, the, a project to replace Bay Street Reservoir with two tanks in Bay Street, it's a $26 million project was implemented and cash financed. And um, with the various other challenges that we were dealing with at the time, including in 14 and in 15, uh, implementing water rationing, which obviously big chunks of our revenue are coming from water rates. Uh, we were in a position where uh, it, it looked pretty dire and we are, uh, you know, we have to, we can't go broke because we have to have the money to run the system. So we, um, we did a lot of work to stabilize our financial situation. We have increased rates uh, starting in 2016, and I'll show you a slide in a second. But one of the things that was covered in the financial plan was the development of a series of um, reserves and meeting reserve targets so that we could uh, be credit worthy when it came time to going to borrow money to pay for these big projects, which we've um, we've accomplished quite a bit. And so when you look at our, you know, various kind of account balances, you will see some pretty serious reserves there. And they're based on the analysis that was um, shared with the council during the 2016 development of the long range financial plan. Um, and I'd be happy to revisit those with you at any time. But I think it's really critical for us relative to the things we're facing. Um, one of the other issues that's going on financially is that our, our customers have done a fabulous job of conserving. And in fact, uh, this 2016, 2018 demand curve 
is uh, about half a billion, six billion gallons, 600 million gallons less than what we forecast that they would be using in 2015. Um, and most of our revenue comes from water rates, so the less water we sell, the you know more challenging it is for us to keep our head above water financially. Um, luckily, in the because we were coming out of the drought when we did the long-range financial plan, I made the assumption that we would be using uh, about two. We'd be selling about 2.5 billion gallons because that's what we sold in 2014. I, and everyone said, "Oh, you're crazy. There'll be more use than that." And well, we haven't hit 2.5 billion gallons yet. So just fairly recently, we've kind of looked at the, this result and we've said, well, what is causing that? And interestingly, two things are causing it. A lower than anticipated number of new service connections about 20, it accounts for about 25% of the forecast error. In other words, why is the demand much lower? And then customer response to increasing prices. You can see this is our sort of average single family customer using 500 cubic feet, which is a cubic, 100 cubic feet is 748 gallons. Um, this is what's happening to their, that's been happening to their rates over time. Um, and uh, this is just the water portion. But, but the point of all of this is, is that we don't now think, we think that ultimately demand will creep up a little bit, but we have a very stable demand. We don't see it moving uh, from kind of the level of demand that existed during the drought. The good part about that is, okay, we have some stability now and we can plan for that. The bad part of that is um, if, you, uh, if you have this kind of demand where we have a 48 gallons per person per day average uh, residential consumption, if you have the same kind of drought we had in 20. 14 and 2015, and you have a goal of reducing consumption by 20 or 30 percent, there's hardly any place to go. Um, our, our consumption on irrigation has really been reduced, and so this is one of the things that I think is, it's kind of an interesting uh, opportunity for us to acknowledge that demand is lower, but it means that our reliability, the, the needs that we have to meet our reliability goals are, um, are even stronger than they were before because the, the community has can reduced its consumption and stabilized it to such a very conservative level. So, um, so this, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of you are looking at this sort of uh, uptick in, uh, in the cost of water and asking yourself, well, where does this end? And I will tell you that water affordability is definitely on my radar as a, as a key issue as we go forward. Um, this is our uh, 2019 to 2028 CIP. You can see that um, there are some years in the very near future where the annual spending is in the neighborhood of 60 million. We have three really big projects and three more that are 194 million between the three of them. You'll be seeing one of those projects next week at the council meeting, um, the Newell Creek Dam Inlet Outlet Project. Most of it is on rehabilitation and replacement of uh, existing infrastructure, that things that are needed to be done in order to assure that we have infrastructure reliability. There's some money in here for water supply augmentation, but frankly, we've kind of found some new strategies that we're sharing, that we'll share with you a little bit later on in the fall about um, how we can use existing infrastructure, particularly um, what the groundwater system and the belt system to add more storage to the system without necessarily having to build a lot of infrastructure. It's pretty darn expensive. And also when we do the Graham Hill treatment plant to get some benefits, some water supply reliability benefits by the changes that we're proposing um, in that project that we're thinking about anyway. So this is a big deal for me. And I understand that, uh, you know, even though we're sort of going here, that that what's coming is um, is going to be a challenge for our community. And so I've started over the last probably year or so to really look at the water affordability issues and think about where these go. And so that I think one of the biggest challenges is that um, the utility business model is we're an enterprise funded organization. We, all of our rate revenue, all of our revenues come from water rates. We don't have other sources of revenues. 
Um, we are expected to be entirely self-supported in most cases. Um, and we're highly regulated both from the source of water quality, but also the sort of general management point of view. Proposition 218, I think you've probably heard some things about, is a 1996 proposition amendment to the state constitution that, that um, got extended to uh, water utilities, wastewater utilities, basically everybody who's uh, kind of a publicly uh, owned municipal utilities, not to PUC related utilities like PG&E, but, or investor owned, owned um, water utilities. But it expressly prohibits charging one group of customers more than the cost of providing <coughs> service as a means of generating revenue to sub subsidize the cost of providing service to another group of customers. And um, that's, that's a big issue. It's kind of got our hind, hands tied behind our back. So, uh, but at the state level, there's a lot going on uh, with respect to water affordability. There's, um, there was a recent uh, January 2019, a framework and tool for evaluating California's progress in achieving human rights to water. There's quite a bit of work that's been going on at uh, a group called the um, Community Water Center out of Fresno. There's a, now a, a, a group that this, this group has opened an office in Watsonville. Um, there's a whole set of, um, there was a, a water conservation, low income water rate assistance program. A draft was put out in January by the um, California Department of EPA the, uh, that that was a response to AB 401, which is a piece of legislation passed in um, 2015, I think, that asked to look at water affordability and potential statewide program for low income water rate assistance. And this individual here that I met last week when I was in Sacramento, her name is Laurel Firestone. She's one of the co-founders of the Community Water Center out of, um, out of Fresno and the governor has po appointed her to the State Water Resources Control Board, board. So I think that it's a pretty big signal that this is, a, this is going to, it's a big issue already and it's gonna get to be a bigger issue. And I think that it's, that's appropriate because clearly um, water rates are being driven by, in our case and in many other cases like ours, by the need to reinvest in capital. Most of our capital facilities are more than 30, 40, 50, 60 years old and they don't last forever. Um, so the unfortunate thing is maybe everything is kind of coming together and due at one time, but the bottom line is, it's a, it's a valuable and necessary piece of community infrastructure and we really do need to invest in it. So I've started a campaign to, this is a little bit of information about the, what's in the human rights to water framework, water quality, accessibility, which means reliability and then affordability. And this is a, a really interesting framework to think about what, what, we're, what we should be trying to accomplish and how we should balance these things. But one of the things I've tried to do is that um, I've been sort of reaching out to people at the state level over the last six to eight months about um, are we headed for a train wreck between water affordability and the need for us as entities to in reinvest in our water system both for aging infrastructure issues and also because of the need to address the climate change um, challenges that we're having. And so I've been taking the opportunity to meet with legislative staff and to start really talking with folks about what do we need to do to avoid this train wreck that's coming. And part of it might be some kind of um, 218 reform that would open things up for people to do things locally. Maybe it's a recognition that instead of all water bonds or state programs funding whiz bang new things that they ought to, we ought to be investing in some you know, existing things and reinvesting in existing things because of their importance. When I was in Sacramento last week on Monday, the, um, the governor had just issued a new executive order on wanting to improve the resilience of, uh, the really resiliency of water uh, utilities and also the water infrastructure around the state. And I think that could potentially provide an opportunity. But recognizing that, uh, you know, it's water, having water, having water service is protects public health and it's an important value. I'm really um, embracing this issue as something that I need to be working on personally to try to see how we can um, take on this challenge and achieve what we need to achieve to improve the water system's reliability at the same time protecting uh, customers' access to this important resource. 
And my final slide is, um, oh, I need to, sorry, this is, uh, oops. So even with the rate increases we've had, if you compare, you know, a 12 ounce serving of bottled water or a cup of coffee or 12 ounce glass of water from your kitchen tap, water service is still an extremely good value, two tenths of one cent for uh, a, gla a 12 ounce glass of water from your tap. Um, it's, it's a service that's available to you 24 hours a day, every day of the year. I have, you know, I have a hundred and some people who work every day to make, it, make the water come out and um, they do a darn good job. I think that we have water system uh, accessibility that's good now and the investments we need to make in part are to um, make sure that we have we continue to have that in our community. It, it's not free and it won't happen unless we make the investments we need to make. So with that, I will take your questions. Thank you, Rosemary. And to your entire team that I know uh, puts in the work every day. And we're lucky to have you in Santa Cruz and for your advocacy at the state level and in terms of the value I think we all really share. And I um, trust you'll let us know if, the, if and when the time comes for us I, I to definitely will. support the work. Um, before we jump into questions, we'll see if there's any member of the community who wanted to address us uh, in public comment on our water presentation. You'll have up to two minutes. Uh, my name is Nicholas Whitehead. Um, I agree with the statement that bonds are not the best way to go anymore. Uh, would it be possible, Mr. Condotti might know this, the um, possible to make a special assessment on all major users of um, the water supply? The assessment purely, uh, it's a levy really, to uh, enable the city to replenish and renew the infrastructure. Is that the sort of thing that could happen? We'll go ahead and pause the time. So we'll go ahead and take your take note of your questions during your time for public comment, and then if we'll uh, go ahead and yeah. after your time's up, we'll go I, ahead. And I have, have another conversation. question. Okay. It may be a little extraneous, but um, I was one of the people who was urging the city manager to find a water supply for the um, the campers at the Gateway Camp. Uh, I approached the water department. I, I didn't see the head of the department. I saw some engineers and I approached the planning department and I approached the city manager. And he assured me, the city manager assured me, yeah, all the departments would work together and it would be resolved within a week, he said. Well, nothing ever happened on the city providing water, which is disappointing. We, this city is a signatory to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We're not under that law, but we did sign the declaration about 25 years ago. So I'm, I'm disappointed in the, in the actions of the city in not looking after those human needs. Was that a judgment on the people who were there or was it an inability? It was probably just an inability, but I think that ought to be uh, looked at. Thank you, and I enjoyed your presentation very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll see if maybe Mr. Condotti does have a response to the question that was raised by the community member. Yes, um, <clears throat> uh, the city can uh, establish uh, an assessment to fund the cost of capital infrastructure, um, but it's constrained in its ability to do so by the same uh, body of law that um, the director referred to, um, Proposition 218. The requirements for an assessment are different than um, the requirements for uh, ordinary rate setting, um, generally what's required to occur is that a detailed engineering uh, analysis is done that um, looks at both the cost of creating or constructing a facility and the relative benefit that each individual or property owner will derive the unique special benefit that each individual property that is assessed will derive from the project and the costs are split proportionately. Um, and then there has to be a vote on the assessment and it has to be approved by the individuals or property owners that will be subject to the assessment. And the voting is weighted in accordance with the relative 
special benefit that's received. So it is a viable mechanism for funding capital infrastructure. In my experience, it's typically used to support a bond issue when an assessment is gonna be paid off over a number of years and the funds for a capital uh, project you know, are, are necessary when the project is built. So, so it's, a, it's a, an option, um, but um, it has its limitation. Just I, could I just add one thing? I, I mean, I, I, I think we all think, oh, somebody else must be using a lot of water, but the reality is in our system, residential is using about two thirds of all the water commercials use. So it's, you know, we have met the enemy, it is us, so to speak, in terms of who, who would have to be assessed. We don't have one or two, you know, big water uh, users, the, I think the, as an individual user, the, the um, university is the largest, I think 6% of the total. But our top 10 customers are not, are not the, you know, don't represent a huge portion of the total water use. <coughs> Thank you for the clarification. Any council members questions? Councilmember Brown, yeah. Councilmember Meyer. I feel like I can start all the time. <laughs> I actually don't have questions right now, um, primarily because um, the our water director, um, Ms. Menard, has been so incredibly helpful, and other members of the water department staff, in helping us understand this really complex system and how to talk about it with the general public as well as just ourselves understanding that. I mean, it's a. It really is an incredible asset um, that, that we need to be good stewards of. And in order to do that, we need to understand how it, at least to some extent, how it works. So I just wanted to make the comment that right after we met yesterday, I said, well, no, people haven't really been asking about increased water rates, which I think is a great thing. I was in line at the credit union um, <laughs> just earlier today right. on my way in, and I mentioned to my neighbor was in line, um, and, he, and I said, well, we're working on the budget, and he mentioned the water rates, and how they had not stopped watering their lawn, which I think actually looks just fine uh, regardless. But it was great to just be able to give, it was like in the, not the elevator speech, yeah. but the, in the credit union line um, uh, overview. And he was like, well, thank you so much for explaining that, you know, and really, um, not that he was really griping, but just to actually be able to respond and feel like I knew what I was talking about was a pretty good feeling. Um, so. Uh, just a, an, an attest to all the work that you do to make us um, more knowledgeable. And yeah, thank you. Echo those comments. Um, Meyer. I just um, have a couple of questions. So, um, uh, Director Menard, it uh, looks like, are you adding some FTEs this year? Um, we have asked for in the budget, we've asked for four additional FTEs. Um, one, two, uh, Two are positions that are in our production. One is a uh, new treatment operator, and the second one is a um, facilities mechanical maintenance tech. What we're doing with the capital program is we are engaging the production distribution staff who are, will be the ultimate owners, operators, maintainers of these facilities in the processes of um, planning for and designing these facilities. And what that means is that operating staff, senior treatment operators who have a lot of experience and knowledge about the variability of the, um, of the source water and the treatment processes and the mechanical people, maintenance people who take care of them, the electronics and instrumentation people who manage those pieces are coming to the table along with our engineers and our consultant teams and going through the projects and participating and giving their input as equal stakeholders to everyone else. So that means that those operating people aren't as available to do the operations. And so the two positions we've asked for are um, proposed to backfill some of those needs. We're asking for a management analyst in our operations division, division because that kind of resource has not been available to the deputy director up there historically. And we do think there are great opportunities to 
um, use that kind of skill set to help support improvements of efficiencies, uh, you know, looking at effectiveness kinds of things, helping to support the staff in their various hiring processes. Like a lot of, um, maybe you heard this from Public Works uh, uh, when they spoke a few weeks ago, but you know, we have a lot of um, turnover in some of our key positions. We can't keep a senior electrician um, position filled. We have uh, people who take those jobs and we train them and then they go someplace else, right? Um, so we have a lot of that kind of support that's necessary to help to facilitate um, working with the staff up there. That's our largest group of employees. It's almost 70 employees in that group. And then lastly, we've, um, we've worked with the information technology um, department to look at how we can meet our business systems needs. Uh, we have major um, business systems. Eden is, uh, we, you guys were talking about Eden this morning, I heard when t um, Marcus was here. Eden is our billing system um, because of state legislation, including SB 998 that was passed at the end of the last session of the legislature. The billing system is really under a lot of stress to do a lot more things than it might have ever been really, you know, intended to do. Um, so the billing system, we need to be looking at and replacing our laboratory information management system. We're looking at file sharing and document management across the organization, particularly as we're going through this major infrastructure replacement cycle. Um, we obviously, uh, we have a computerized maintenance management system that's not meeting our needs. For one thing, it does not talk to GIS. Most of our data is GIS in the GIS system, and so we've been looking at the possibility of a new um, a maintenance management system of some sort, and we've just acquired and will be implementing a construction management set of software. So the our needs for some of that sort of staff support, particularly someone who really can understand our business needs and support that is, uh, we worked with the IT department to um, make a position request that they would fund and um, or that we would fund and would live with their group just like um, our SCADA coordinator does. And so I think that's a, it's really a strong business need for our organization. And I was just curious, um, is there any creative thinking in Sacramento around this asset management issue in terms of, is there any role for the insurance companies or I mean avoided costs to having water systems burned down or disrupted I, I or haven't, anything else? I haven't heard anything. Um, what I've heard about the insurance companies is that mm -hmm. if you happen to have a piece of property in the urban wildland interface, forget about having fire insurance. insurance. <laughs> They're going the wrong way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't heard that. I know there's a SB 45 is a, is a sort of a draft of a wildfire recovery um, flood and I think climate adaptation um, bond, piece of bond measure that has been being floated around out there. But I'm not seeing anything sort of in the creative side of how we would solve the sort of fundamental uh, disconnect problem. That's, of the, that's the Allen bill, right? Is that I think so, yeah. Allen? Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I just wanna echo you guys um, are amazing uh, in terms of what you do for all of our customers. And uh, also just wanna recognize the deep commitment that you guys have med made to the environment as well. Um, thank you. I don't think I know of any water district barely any water districts that are actually um, committing their their fish flows in the water rights. So it's um, leading and cutting edge for Santa Cruz to be doing that and really sets a, sets an example for other water districts to really look at statewide. So they like you. us in Sacramento. They I think we're a poster <laughs> child. <laughs> okay, Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilmember Matthews. Kind of following up on that, I was just curious um, whether there's current monitoring happening with the salmonid population yes. and is there gonna be a report that comes out to kind of show the before and after pictures? Yeah, so a couple of things about that. One is uh, steelhead, which is, uh, there's been a steelhead monitoring program in the San Lorenzo and actually in a whole series of um, surface water uh, supplies from, um, for, I think from the late 90s, so maybe more than 20 years now. And the, the county has been working on kind of pulling all that data together and sort of doing some analysis of that. So we should have 
Um, we should have a report on that sometime this year, I think. A couple of years ago in 17, I think, we, uh, my staff, the water resources staff who work up out of the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant, they do annual snorkel surveys and, and seining. So, um, you know, sometime a little bit later on this spring, they'll be doing seining and pit tagging for some of the populations. And I know that a couple of years ago, they, the steelhead were so numerous that there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of celebration about the fact that, particularly in the light of the fact that during the drought, things were so strained, we had been providing flows there and we saw good results. Um, from coho perspective, uh, we've seen coho in uh, Laguna um, Creek, which is a, a really nice intact watershed. So that's been a really positive thing. We saw some coho in um, coho juveniles in Lydell this last year, which is also a, a new thing. And we've seen coho spawning and, and you know in the San Lorenzo. Um, one of the other strategies we've been working on sort of collaboratively for a number of years is a the city is making the commitment of the flows, but flows aren't enough. We need a, a functioning watershed that has, you know, a healthy functioning watershed in terms of habitat diversity and large woody debris and, you know, riparian areas and what have you. So we've been working collaboratively with the Resource Conservation District and the um, and the county and the um, Coastal Watershed Council and then the city to create a kind of a long range plan for implementing watershed restoration. The work, part of the work that is gonna, you're gonna hear about next week in terms of this grant for the lagoon is, is embedded in that, those strategies for trying to make the lagoon more functional as rearing habitat for steelhead. So there's a lot of work going on and I think that as I mentioned, if you're available at some point in the next few months to come and do a watershed tour, we'll take you up to and show you all the things that are going on and it's, it's pretty good and the, the group of folks who are involved in it are really, um, they're very dedicated and they've got some pretty cool results to show. Better than pretty good. <laughs> it's great, yeah, I, I thank you for the offer and I appreciated the opportunity. Councilmember Matthews? And it's the result of so much work over so many years by so many people. Yeah. My question, is our uh, agreement with Fish and Wildlife or whoever at the state level, is that a done deal now? I remember we were just arm wrestling for years on that. The fish flows, we have agreement on the fish flows um, and we are in the process of finalizing the Salmonid Habitat Conservation Plan. Um, we have initiated water rights changes that would Im improve our flexibility for the water rights that we have. We um, include changes the place of use so that we can collaboratively, uh, or we can conjunctively use water, you know, especially in the Santa Margarita and the, and the Mid-County Basin and the, the EIR for the water rights changes will be coming out in the um, in the fall, and we're hoping to have the HCP, the administrative draft of the HCP, coming out before that. It includes a number of things besides the flows, so it includes the financial assurances, and will ultimately result in a 30-year permit from National Marine Fisheries Service for us to operate our facilities, both the water system and then the lower uh, river parts of the system as well, so public works and some other areas. So a tremendous amount of progress has been ma being made and I think in part after the Water Supply Advisory Committee acknowledged the sort of the flows and built that into their work, there was a really good opportunity for us to cut to the chase and get to agreement and we've done that. Sounds like it's almost on a near horizon now. Almost, yeah. We're we're close. It's really it's really a a big a big deal. Okay, Councilman. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's kind of dire. I, yeah. When you said the train wreck is coming, <clears throat> and um, I'm really happy that you're you're going to Sacramento because I do think that's where a lot of what we need to do is gonna come from, especially with reforming 218, that, that's, yeah. a, that's a train wreck too. Yep. Um, I'm really happy that uh, our friend John Laird is running. He is someone who's been, did his <laughs> senior thesis when he was at Cowell College on, on water in this area. So he will be somebody who, you know, I hope. Already working with him. Yeah, no, I, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. And if, well, and he's, but he's, and he doesn't even have any elected power yet. So hopefully if that happens. Um, 
What did you mean when you said we can't, just refresh my memory, can't conserve our way out of, of this? So the, the work of the Water Supply Advisory Committee looked at uh, the existing conservation, level of conservation and the performance of conservation from really all sources, but price elasticity of demand, sort of the regulatory um, drivers from uh, building code and plumbing cho code changes, and then additional sort of increment of, um, of uh, sort of programmatic conservation. And those three things together represented about a billion gallons of demand reduction. And that was built into our demand forecast for the next 20 years, and that demand forecast was flat. So the additional sort of uh, ability to reduce that by 1.2 billion gallons in order to close the gap, the, the committee basically said, can't get there from here. So I think that the, at that point, there was clarity about sort of what the problem was in terms of limited storage. Uh, as I mentioned, we can, we, we can get into a problem really quickly because the storage isn't adequate to carry us over multiple years. And yet when it starts to rain this year, for example, you get out of it fast also. So it's really not feasible to continue to cut demand in a way that would clo fully close the gap. Even with the lower demand, it's not feasible to do it. Uh, and with respect to um, if you had the power to change water rates and charge other people more, other users, larger users, wh where do the hotels fit into this? And who would you tax if we got, if we received Proposition 218 relief? You know, I, I think that uh, one of the things that's happened as a result of the uh, rate changes we put in in 2016, you may recall that we, we moved, we're only collecting about 8% of the total revenue in the fixed charge, which is very unusual. And we're collecting about 92% in the variable charge. That structure of rate sent a pretty darn strong signal to our um, particular residential customers. So the multifamily and single family all got that price signal. And there was a lot of um, desire in the community to have that kind of clear price signal and lowering the fixed charge in particular. So it's it shoved most of the consumption into the lowest tier. And I think that if we were going to look around for how to um, break that apart, not only looking at the commercial rates, which is currently a fixed, uh, a, a uniform rate it's called. I mean, we might do a summer, winter, maybe rate on that, that might help some. Our peaking, as you notice from those two graphs, is also sort of flattening out. So that's another issue in terms of uh, differentiating the summer rate from the winter rate in, in terms of 218 and the requirement to demonstrate cost of service. Um, but, you know, there are some things we can do, but candidly, the, the um, the toolbox is not very full. And I think that's one of the reasons why looking for some significant resource, not in the form of low interest loans, which we are definitely pursuing, but in the form of a grant for something big, like the water treatment plant upgrade that needs to be done, uh, would, is really what I'm trying to figure out how to, how to go and get. You know, I, I really appreciate you bringing in the, the whole notion of, of climate change today and planning for that because it, it is, is overwhelming for even people who study it. You know, it, it's just some, not something we can easily talk about and readily talk about. And I wanted to bring the, the notion of uncertainty, what you said about uncertainty. I was looking at the, um, the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists has something on their website that says, decision makers in our society use scientific input all the time, but they could not make a critically wrong choice if the unknowns aren't taken into account. For instance, city planners could build a levee that were too low to evacuate enough coastal communities along an unexpected landfall zone or a hurricane if uncertainty is unstated. For these reasons, uncertainty plays a key role in informing yeah. policy. Um, but then it, it, it goes on to talk about, you know, the high level of, con of confidence that scientists, most scientists have in um, climate change. Um, as some people call it disruption, which I, I tend to call it dis climate disruption. What do you mean exactly when you said the uncertainty about climate change? Well, so if you, if you just look, we have these three options, which is often much more than many people have. We have three different approaches that we've been looking at and trying to see what the differences are. Now, interestingly, um, 
in one of those options, if you have the higher demand, the 3.2 billion uh, gallon demand, and you wanna do an aquifer storage and recovery project where you're taking quote unquote winter flows and you're putting them into the ground, uh, in the climate catalog uh, uh, scenario that was developed by Andy Fisher and Bruce Daniels, serendipitously, I think, most of the most of the precip in every one of the years in that climate catalog happens in a single month. So what happens is that you have the situation where uh, you can't run a program of putting water in the ground day after day over the whole winter if all of the precip is only coming in a single month. Uh, you can do it if you wanna build infrastructure you know, upsize the capacity of your pipes and have the number of wells so that you can shove it all on the ground when you have it, but it's not very efficient. So that's one thing that, you know, we're looking at and trying to understand, well, how likely is that? You know, that thing was, that climate catalog was created using historical exact, you know, real data, but it turned out to have this kind of a little bit of a quirky outcome. Some of our other options, uh, you know, we, we've looked at the, the four climate ensemble came from the most recent, what's called CMET5, which is out of the CalADAPT data set. Um, you know, the way that one was done maybe is not the full range of what the options are too. So we're sort of like a little bit like blind men, you know, trying to find our way, feeling out the edges. And the one thing that's happening is as we're going through and looking at multiple ones of these scenarios, you get a sense of, well, this is kind of one of the things that will be pretty consistent, right? So you saw those numbers in that chart I showed you that, you know, nothing was going to three billion gallons of the size of the shortage. So the, the size of the gap was becoming kind of, you know, multiple places kind of giving you the same kind of thing. So even if that thing doesn't happen, maybe you're still in the right ballpark, right? There's one other thing that we've been talking about doing and that's a, um, uh, a sort of a, a different version. There's a, a, a gentleman at Amherst, uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst who does, his name is Casey Brown, and he does mm. this sort of stress testing. And he comes at you and he says, okay, I'm gonna look at your infrastructure and your facilities and your sources and whatever, and I'm gonna, we're not gonna ask what the climate is gonna do. We're gonna ask what would happen, what would be your vulnerability if X, Y, or Z happen, and it you know, just takes a number and says, oh, you've got a really big vulnerability to earthquakes or to uh, floods or whatever it is, and he looks at it may, sort of from the bottom up, and I think it's really a bottom up, top down kind of a strategy where you just keep pushing the envelope and understanding how consistent is the story we get, get back under different scenarios. It's a scenario planning um, kind of strategy. Thank you, thank you for your time here too today. Um, I, I would be, remiss to my cl climate activists and also activist friends if I didn't just say that I don't think it's the permitting cost that sunk desal. I think that it was an active aware community that, that you know, put it on hold at least. I, I don't disagree with what, what happened. And we were asked to look at the, um, particularly the changes from 13, 2013, and it was the change in the ocean plan amendment that looked at the requirement for subsurface intakes. And frankly, when we had a meeting with the Coastal Commission staff and the Regional Water Quality Control Board and the State Board staff, they looked at us and they said, yeah, the, the Ocean Plan Amendment is very vague. It doesn't say what's feasible and not feasible. It says you have to prove it's not feasible, but it doesn't tell you how. And they said to us, don't do this, do recycling if you have to do something. So. I just have one quick question, uh, Rosemary. We, I think a, a couple years ago, talked about the potential of being able to round up your water bill and have that be a sort of a donation right. account. Is that related to the Eden constraints of our system and inabilities, or would it be factored into a newer system? Um, you know, I, I think that, that probably Eden could do that. Um, I would have to t check more with uh, the folks who work on that to see how you know, realistic that is. But you know, we've talked a lot about a lot of different options, and certainly, if people wanted to um, wanted to, you know, pursue that, we could see how it could be done. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, in terms of a potential relief for community, can step up to help other community members. Might be an option to think about. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for your presentation and um, for closing out our day today with. Uh, 
exceptional uh, presentations all day and, and actually at prior meetings in terms of the work that's happening on behalf of the city. So we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting till tomorrow morning and we'll uh, re-engage with our budget discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.